Solace James Van Pelt Here's a vivid study of a man, snowbound in an old mill, in the grip of a savage winter, who must try not only to survive, but somehow to keep the mill running, in the face of all that nature can throw at him. And the courage and determination his example gives to a young woman in a colony ship, hundreds of years later, who is making the long journey between the stars. James Van Pelt's stories have appeared in sci-fiction, Asimov science fiction, Analog, Realms of Fantasy, The Third Alternative, Weird Tales, Tailbones, Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine, Pulp House, Altair, Transversions, Adventures in Sword and Sorcery, On Spec, Future Orbits, and elsewhere. His first book, appropriately enough, was a collection, Strangers and Beggars, although he subsequently published his first novel, Summer of the Apocalypse. His most recent book is a new collection, The Radio Magicians and Other Stories. He lives with his family in Grand Junction, Colorado, where he teaches high school and college English. The wall display didn't last two sleep cycles. When Megan woke the first time, one hundred years into the four thousand years long journey to Zeta Reticula, she waved her hand at the censor, and the steel wall morphed into a long view of the Crystal River. On the left side, aspen leaves trembled in a breeze she couldn't feel. The river itself cut across the image, appearing between trees, tumbling over rocks, chuckling and hissing through the speakers, before draining onto the floor at the bottom of the image. On the river's right bank, the generator house, a remnant of nineteenth-century mining, clung to a gray granite outcrop, a tall water chute dropped from the building's bottom, down the short cliff to a pool below. She'd taken the picture on her last hike, before reporting for flight training. Every crew member's room had a display. Only hers showed the same scene continuously. She joined the crew for their fourteen-day work period, and then returned to the long sleep bed. But when she awoke the second time, Two hundred years after they left Earth orbit, the metal wall remained grimly blank. She sat on her bunk's edge, empty, knowing the lead in her limbs was the result of a hundred years of sleep, but believing that sadness caused it. No mountain, no river, no rustic generator house standing against the aspen. She called for crew chief Teague. While she waited, she opened the box under her bed where she kept a souvenir from Earth, a miner's iron candlestick holder, a long spike at one end, a brass handle on the other, and a metal loop in the middle to hold the candle. She'd found it in a pit beside the generator house, after she'd taken the picture. It had a nice heft to it, balanced in her hand. She had cleaned the rust off so the metal shined. But pits marred what must have at one time been a smooth surface. She liked the roughness under her fingers. After checking the circuits, Crew Chief Teague said, Everything about this expedition is an experiment. He punched at the manual overrides for the display, behind a cover plate in Megan's room. There is no way to test the effects of time on technology except to watch it over time. And that's what we're doing. He clicked the plate shut. All that matters is keeping life support, guidance, and propulsion running for the whole trip. You make sure hydroponics continue to function. I work in mechanical repair. Teams service the power plant. One of the four crews is awake every 25 years. But we don't have time to repair a luxury like your display wall. We're janitors. He ran his hand down the blank surface. It's already an old ship and we have a long, long way to go. We have to keep running, too. The people? Yes, there is that. He rubbed his chin while looking at the candlestick holder in her lap. Interesting piece. Does the handle unscrew? She twisted it. Seems stuck. We get open in the machine shop. She shook her head. After Teague left, Megan tried to remember how the river looked and sounded. With the wall display working, she could imagine an aspen breeze on her face, 
the rushing water's pebbly smell. She could remember uneven ground, slickness of spray-splashed rocks, stirred leaves' sweetness. With eyes closed, she tried to evoke the memory. Hadn't the ground been a little slippery with gravel? Hadn't there been a crow circling overhead? When she was a little girl, her mother died. A month later, Megan could not remember Mom's face. Only after digging into a scrapbook did the sense of her mother come back to her. Now it was just as bad, but what she couldn't remember was Earth. The metal walls, the synthetic cushioning on the floor, the ventilation's constant hiss seemed like they had been a part of her forever. And the Earth slipped away, piece by piece. She placed the flat of her hand on the blank wall. It's only two years, she thought. In two years, I'll be out of the ship. If the planet around Zeta Reticula is habitable. But she shivered. Only two subjective years. She'd spent most of the trip in the long sleep cocoon. If the technology worked, she would leave the ship in 4,000 real years. Teague was right, though, about untested technology. Nearly every element of the expedition was a prototype. Could a human-manufactured device continue to function after 4,000 years, even with constant maintenance? The Egyptian pyramids were 4,500 years old, and they still stood. But they were merely rocks in a pile, not a sophisticated space vehicle. After 4,000 years, the pyramids weren't expected to enter an orbit around a distant planet while maintaining a sustainable environment against the deadliness of space. And what of the people on board? The only test of the technology that kept a person alive for 4,000 years and preserved the seeds and fertilized ova would take 4,000 years. Dr. Arnold, who knew all their medical charts by heart, told her that what she felt was homesickness. Like Megan and the rest of the crew, he was in his twenties, but he spoke with maturity. Megan trusted him. Look for these symptoms, he said. Episodic or constant crying. Nausea, difficulty sleeping, disrupted menstrual cycle. He consulted his notes. Of course those symptoms may also be induced by long sleep. His assistant, Dr. Singh, nodded in agreement. Dr. Arnold, I'm 200 years late on my last period. Already she felt old. Already, with the sun no more than a bright star in their wake, she felt creaky and removed, a part of the dead. I shouldn't be able to sense Earth's pull from here, she thought. I shouldn't have come. They should have known that a hydroponics officer wouldn't do well away from Earth, away from forests and long stretches of mountain grass. Even when we arrive, if everything works, if the planet is hospitable, it will take years and years to grow Earth trees to sit beneath. I'll never see an aspen again. I won't make it. Isaac scooted his stool closer to the tiny wood stove. If he sat close enough, long enough, the warmth crept through his mittens in the arms of his coat. His knees, only a few inches from the stove, nearly blistered, but the cold pressed against his back. It slipped around the sides of his hood. He eyed the tiny pile of wood by the stove, the remains of the table he'd broken into pieces the day before. All the cabin's good sat on the floor since he'd burned the shelves earlier. Beside the remains of the table, the only other wood was a small box of kindling, in case the fire went out, and the chair he sat on. Outside, snow covered the ground so deeply that there was no hope of finding deadfall. Besides, every tree within a mile had either been cut down for mine timbers or had its low branches cut off for firewood. He'd hauled the wood he'd been burning for the last ten days, from a site four miles upstream. But that was long before the storm moved in, cutting visibility to a few feet. In the room below, 
Machinery thumped steadily. Water poured through a sluice to turn a wheel connected to a squat generator. Cables ran up the mountain to the mine's compressors, clearing dead air from the tunnels and powering the drills. But Isaac couldn't tell if the miners were still working. They probably were hunkered down like he was, in their bunkhouses near the digging, or they were stuck in the town of Crystal. If they were working, the compressors needed to run. He looked out the window. Thick frost coated the inside of the glass, and snow piled halfway up outside, dimmed what light the dark afternoon offered. The window in his tiny second-story maintenance room was at least 15 feet above the ground. Two weeks of nonstop snow had nearly buried the building. Ten days ago, when the supplies clerk dropped off a bag full of dried meat and two loaves of bread, he'd said, First winter in the mountains, boy? It'll get so cold, your piss will freeze before it splashes your boots. Isaac hadn't been able to open the outside door for the last three days. Heavy snow blocked it. He rubbed his mittens together, trying to distribute the heat. A steady wind moaned outside. Trees creaked. Something snapped sharply overhead. He glanced at the thick timbers supporting the roof. How much weight could they hold? How much crushing snow lay above him? Beside, unwilling to leave the stove's meager heat. But he had a job to do. Checking for candles in his coat pocket, he walked down to the darkness of the generator room. A tummy sticker in hand to hold the light. It was a fancy one, with a brass match holder and a screw-on cap to keep the matches dry, serving as the handle. Ice covered the stairs and the air smelled wet and cold. He jammed the spike end of the tommy sticker into the plank wall, then carefully lit the candle, using both hands to hold the match steady against his shivering. Oil for the lamp had run out two days ago. The wavering candle revealed water pounding through the sluice against the horizontal wheel, turning it ponderously counterclockwise. Isaac used a two-pond hammer and chisel to clear ice from the water's entrance and exit points. If the machinery stopped, miners would be without ventilation or power. Ice blocks as big as his head broke free from the structure and clattered to the unlevel floor, where they slid to the far wall. Despite the cold, he soon built up a sweat. He pulled his hood back and unfastened the coat's top. When he finished, he would strip his coat and layers of shirts, replacing the damp undershirt with a dry one. If he didn't, he'd be too cold to sleep later. The work wasn't unlike living in the monastery, he thought, complete with a vow of silence and constant labor to keep his hands busy. He thought about God and God's plan. He never felt as close to heaven as he did when he worked alone cut off from human conversation and the daily distractions. In a way, he hoped the storm would hold. As long as the weather cut him off, he could replicate life in the monastery. He had loved his room there, the rough-hewn bed and the blanket thrown over a thin mattress. He'd read by candlelight there, too. Yes, the generator house reminded him of the monastery. The wooden building felt like a cradle of the miraculous a miracle that never occurred when he had been an initiate. It hadn't been this cold, though. No, not nearly so cold at all. Megan came awake slowly and in pain. Dr. Arnold had decided four cycles ago that the powerful painkillers they used to soften the shift from the long sleeps near death to full wakefulness were damaging, so they didn't flood her system with them before they woke her. Lying as still as she could in the cocoon, her elbows and knees ached, as did her ankles and wrists. Even her knuckles hurt. A tear squeezed out of each eye and raced into her ears as she thought about clenching her fists for the first time on her own in a hundred years. Every move would hurt, at first, even though the mechanical manipulators flexed her joints daily. When she'd gone to sleep last, Crew Chief Teague had refused. She'd shaken his hand before heading to her cocoon. I'll be okay, he said, 
I'll have a rich and long life working in the ship. In twenty-five years, I'll greet the next work crew. I'll never see you again, said Megan. Maybe you will. I'll be old, though. He didn't meet her eyes. I can't face the dark. Megan could say nothing to that because she understood. Each time, climbing into the cocoon seemed like entering death. A one hundred year long instant later, she woke to pain. Even her skin hurt, the now active cells firing neurons back and forth, renewing contacts that had laid moribund for so long. But as she lay in the cocoon this time, she thought about Teague wandering through the ship, all the crews sleeping. And he would wander for years and years and years, twenty-five of them completely alone, until the next crew woke. And what could he say to them? He'd have a quarter of a century of experience that none of them could share. For them, Earth was only a couple months in their wake. They were still young in all ways, except years. Teague would greet them. Hi, he might say. I'm what you will be some day. In him, they'd watch their mortality. Then, he'd wait twenty-five more years, alone, if he lived, and as an elderly man, he would welcome the next crew to their two weeks of busy wakefulness. It was unlikely he would meet a third crew. He would be ninety-seven years old, and despite what he said, he certainly would not be alive when she awoke. She had closed her eyes as the cocoon's lid came down. Her muscles tightened. In a blink, the pain would come. The one hundred year blink. And it did. It took several hours before she could shuffle to the infirmary. Waking was worse this time. Dr. Arnold said, We haven't gone a fifth of the way yet. He massaged her hands, lighting them with a million wincing tingles. Some of the medical staff may stay awake longer than the two weeks for research. Even though he was young, like her, tiny creases that would become worry lines were evident on his forehead. She thought his eyes were kind, though. He flinched when she flinched. Sorry, he said. I'm trying to be gentle. When Megan reached her room, she pulled the protective plastic off her bed and found a fragile note folded on her pillow from Crew Chief Teague, who wrote, Try the wall now. He had signed and dated it twenty years earlier. An old man wrote this, she thought. She waved her hand at the censor, provoking a cascade of pain down her side. The wall flickered. The speakers whispered. Then the crystal river winked into existence. Water burbled over rocks. Leaves rasped against each other. A long cloud in the distance slid slowly across a mountain top. How long had Teague worked on the wall? A present for a young girl he would never see again. The speakers popped twice, like a computer chip crunching somewhere, and the sound turned off. Then the image brightened and washed into a pure white. Megan shaded her eyes before it too vanished. His repair lasted for ten seconds. How long had he worked on it? She tried to open the service panel, but it remained stubbornly closed. Frustrated, she slapped her hand against it, then grabbed the iron candlestick holder from under the bed. Its sharp end pried the small hatch open. Looking at the circuit board underneath revealed nothing, though. Circuit boards were not her area of expertise. The hatch wouldn't reclose. Megan stared at the blank wall for a long time, before seeking out Dr. Arnold and his soft, kind hands. What is that? he asked, pointing to the candle holder. Megan turned the artifact over in her fingers. She hadn't realized that she still carried it. It's all I have from Earth. It's a miner's light. She slept with him for the rest of the two weeks until they returned to the cocoons again. The first time, as she pulled his shirt over his head, he said, You're going to have to quit calling me Dr. Arnold. 
My name's Sean. Once, she woke up, still unfamiliar with Sean's shape, and listened to his breathing in the dark room. If she tried hard, it reminded her of wind through the leaves. Isaac considered the various forms of meditation. He'd learned to plant a question in his mind, then to spend the day or days or weeks contemplating its implications and meaning. While pondering the question, he would read from the Bible or the many studies in the monastery's library. Meditation was best during his vows of silence. At length, the question would glow in his head, like campfire coals. Now, lying on his bed, squeezing his arms close to his body, trying not to shiver, he considered why God allowed cold. Genesis told him that cold was one of the ways God showed man that the earth would continue. It said, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Twice in the night, the roof creaked loudly, the second time dumping a pile of snow onto the floor. Holding the tommy sticker high, he could see where a board had broken. He wondered how he could get outside of the generator house to knock snow off the roof. But the wind roared, and the window showed no outside light at all now. He wasn't sure if it was day or night. Was such a storm normal? He had no mountain experience. The monastery had been challenging, but it didn't teach him how to survive here. If it had snowed for forty days and forty nights for Noah, instead of raining, it could hardly be worse than this. The Bible wasn't clear on snow. Mostly it appeared in the comparison, white as snow, in a dozen passages. He remembered somewhere the prophets linked it to leprosy. By candle, he found the verse in Numbers. Turning the pages with his mittens was impossible, so he shucked them off and put them between his legs to keep them warm. The passage said, And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. In Exodus, he came across Moses turning a rod into a snake and back into a rod again. Then God said to Moses, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Even God didn't like snow. The roof creaked again, sending another icy spill to the growing pile. The door wouldn't move. Forcing the weight that rested against it was impossible. So he tried the window and pushed it up. A solid white wall stood revealed. He jabbed a shovel into it, dumped snow on the floor, dug in again. A half hour later, he'd cleared a tunnel to the surface, about a foot above the window. He pushed the snowshoes out the hole and then climbed after them. The wind slammed into his face when he rolled to the surface, and his arm sank to his armpit when he tried to right himself. Strapping on the broad snowshoes took longer than he wished. Snow worked its way into the top of his shoes, froze into little balls on his gloves, and fell down his collar. He couldn't see even to the trees that stood twenty yards away from the generator house. His eyes watered, and his cheeks stung. The air's gray luminosity revealed that it was day, but he could barely tell. Nor did it matter. He had imagined by the height of the snow on the generator house that the river valley would be twenty feet under, but he could see now that a huge drift covered the house. Standing on the snowshoes, his chest was as high as the roof's eave, but the snow on the roof was piled higher than his head. Isaac realized that knocking the weight off could be dangerous. If it all came off the steep roof at the same time, it could easily bury him so he tentatively dug into the overhang, stretching as far as he could with the shovel. A slab dropped off, revealing the wood shingles beneath. 
Another jab broke free a coffin-sized slab that made a thud he felt through his feet. A crack opened up in the bank of snow that remained on the roof. Isaac backed away as fast as he could as the gap widened, and two-thirds of the mass slid ponderously off, leaving only a thin sliver at the ridge. Snow covered the hole he'd just climbed from, blocking his way back. Crackers, he said the strongest expletive he used. Breath froze on his chin. Before he could get back into the house, though, he needed to sweep the other side, lifting knees high to clear the snowshoes. He moved around the building. As he waded through the drift, he thought about the Book of Amos, which said, And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish. And the great houses shall have an end, saith the Lord. What Isaac needed here was a little smiting. By the time he'd finished, dug his way back into the generator house and closed the window, he was exhausted, but more dangerously. He was freezing. The fire in the stove had gone out, and without a buffering layer of snow on the roof, a draft blew through the room. The water wheel had picked up an ominous screech, so instead of trying to light the fire, he put a candle into the tommy sticker and walked down the stairs. Ice had formed in the trough where the stream entered the generator wheel, and now water poured onto the floor, deflected by the blockage. The wheel turned half as slow as it should. Water poured onto the floor, some of it freezing against the wood, but most flowing down the slant to the far wall. Too tired, even for a well-earned, crackers, he swung the two-pound hammer against the blockage. It barely chipped, and he lost his footing, sprawling beneath the water wheel. Icy water drenched him. Isaac scrambled away, slipping on the slick floor. If he didn't clear the trough soon, the wheel would freeze solid. It could become unusable until spring, and then only after extensive repair. Carefully, this time keeping his weight distributed on both feet. He sidled toward the trough, hammer in hand. He thought of Lamech, Noah's father, who the Bible said of, and he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. The ice was the curse, the hammer the work. So cold he could hardly hold the heavy tool, Isaac swung it against the obstruction. When she woke again, an elderly man leaned over the cocoon. Don't move, Megan. You shouldn't feel pain, but you're likely to be nauseous for a few minutes. She closed her eyes. I'm 520 years old now, she thought. Over 3,500 years to go. When she opened her eyes, the old man still leaned in, looking concerned. His hand reached over the edge to cup her upper arm. Are you okay? Tentatively, she nodded, then waited to see if the movement would bother her. Her stomach twisted, but the discomfort passed. I think so. Her joints didn't ache, but her thinking felt fuzzy. She looked at him closely. Crew Chief Teague? He shook his head. No, he's dead. She squinted. Dr. Arnold? He nodded. I'm still Sean. It took years to figure out what was wrong with the long sleep. How many? Almost forty. She remembered Sean's smooth skin. How he felt when she woke, but he still slept. How he'd held her when she talked about Earth and her fears. I'm dying, she had said, their last night together. We will never get to where we are going, and we will never go back. The night before, a hundred years earlier, Sean had rocked her gently, holding her head to his chest. We're not dead yet. Now, Megan didn't recognize his eyes. 
He held out a hand to help her from the cocoon, but she didn't take it. He was a stranger. She sat up on her own, felt sick again. When it passed and she climbed out, Sean stood back, looking at her sadly. I missed you, he said. It's only been a few minutes for me. That's true. She stood awkwardly for a minute, unsure of what to say. Finally, she offered, I have work to do. Of course. Me too. Lights flickered on the other cocoons, and she realized he'd woken her first. For the first week, she only saw him at meals, but she sat on the other side of the cafeteria. She tried not to think about the blank wall and her candle holder keepsake. With effort, she avoided pulling the box from under the bed. She thought, maybe if I don't look at it, I won't long for it. I won't miss it. Megan concentrated on the hydroponic tanks. Every connection needed to be refitted. She retooled valves, serviced pumps, recalibrated the chemical testing equipment, met with the horticulturists who talked about genetic drift, mutations, and evolution. Over the course of 500 years, the plants adapted to the artificial environment. The most efficient at extracting nutrients from the fluids flourished. The more aggressive that grew faster or taller crowded out their weaker cousins. She couldn't sleep during her rest hours, so she wandered back to the hydroponics rooms. All the plants were low growers, flourishing under lights hanging from the ceiling. Tomatoes, strawberries, cucumbers, ferns of various sorts, beets, peppers, and numerous others. Nothing that grew tall. Tree seeds were held in storage for planet fall when they reached Zeta Reticula although there was a question if they would germinate. No one had ever planted a 4,000-year-old seed before. She walked down the long row, letting the palm of her hand brush the plant tops while imagining the aspen the ship carried. Would there be an aspen grove one day on the planet orbiting Zeta Reticula? Aspen preferred to spread from their roots. If just one seed germinated, she could grow a forest. Would earth trees flourish so far from their native sun? The fear gathered in her chest like a tightness, so she rubbed her fist between her breasts as she walked, trying to work through the tension. At the end of the row of vegetation, she looked up one of the ship's long spokes, a huge hollow chamber that reached the ship's core, the center they revolved around to produce the illusion of gravity. She'd grown used to the effect that had disoriented her at first, moving from the claustrophobic pressure of the growing room to the shocking reach of empty space. She crossed the 50-foot diameter of the spoke to get to the next row of plants. At the end of the final workday before entering the cocoon again, she walked through the plants one last time. They smelled wet and vaguely chemical, but not green, not natural at all. So she kept going until she reached Sean's room and raised her hand to knock. She paused. It seemed that only two weeks ago she had kissed a young man goodbye. She couldn't picture the ship without him. Every day she expected to see him turn a corner, to join her in the hydroponic labs. They never did. Instead, an old man looked at her mournfully when she passed by. He sacrificed 40 years to save her and the rest. She almost left. When he opened the door, Megan said, I missed you too. John let her in. The age spots on his hand were prominent in the harsh hallway light. I have something for you. He opened a drawer and removed the metal candle holder. I know how much it meant. I thought about having them open it for you. We could find out if there's anything inside. She traced her finger along the loop where the candle would have been placed, rubbed the rough brass cap at one end. If she held the wrong way, it looked like a weapon, the five-inch long narrow spike that would hold the antique in a mine wall or stuck into wood could also hurt someone. I'd forgotten about it, she lied. 
As they talked quietly in his room, she started to see the man she used to know. Beneath the thinning hair, behind the wrinkles and tiredness, she recognized him. When they slipped under the sheets later, Sean said, I don't have as much to offer as I did before. I'm not young. Just hold me then, and let's sleep. But after hours of listening to his soft breathing, and thinking that he still sounded a little like wind through aspens, he woke up, and Megan found he had more life in him than he thought. Isaac stood next to the cold stove. His clothes no longer dripped. They crackled when he moved. Next to his skin, though, they were soaked. And he could feel them sucking away the little heat that remained. One ceiling board had broken completely while he'd knocked the snow off the roof. And the supplies directly underneath were covered, including the boxes of matches. He scooped snow off the floor in double handfuls until he found them. But the boxes were squashed and the matches ruined. The match had smeared against the striker when he tried to light them. Dully, his head feeling sluggish and slow, he knelt on the pile of snow for a minute. Flakes came down through the hole in the room, swirling in a breeze that hadn't been there before. Without matches, he'd never light the fire. Maybe he could get the snowshoes back on and make his way to the miners' cabins. But he knew the steep trail, completely hidden in the storm, would be almost impossible to hike, even if his clothes weren't already wet and he wasn't exhausted. He couldn't feel his knees against the snow, and the cold crept up his legs. He thought about just staying still. His chin drifted to his chest. Resting sounded good. In a few minutes he would get up, but for now, a little sleep was all he needed. The vibration and steady thumping of the generator below annoyed him, though. Then, frightened, he stood. If he slept, the generator would surely freeze, and so would he. If he didn't have duties, he could rest. But the others depended on him. Isaac waved his arms to restore circulation, slapping his hands against his arms, then staggered toward the stairs. With renewed vigor, the wind shook the house. No light came from the depths. His candle had gone out. So he swept his hand against the wood, careful to not fall again on the slick floor, until he hit the tommy sticker. Water gurgled against the power wheel behind him. With a yank, he pulled the candle holder from the wood, forced himself to climb the stairs before sitting by the stove. It took a dozen tries to unscrew the brass cap holding the matches. There were only three. Carefully, he lit one. But before he touched the candle, the breeze blew it out. He nearly wept. With the new hole in the roof, there was no place he could guarantee the next match would stay lit long enough to start the fire. He opened the stove door, pushed his hands inside, out of the wind, to light the second match. It flicked to life but the draw up the chimney immediately snuffed it out. Isaac took a deep breath, closed the stove flue to stop the wind, and mumbled a prayer before lighting the last match. The water in his shoes felt like it was freezing. He couldn't feel his feet at all. The match caught, held steady. Carefully, he pushed the candle wick into the flame. It flared into life. He jammed the candle between two charcoal logs in the stove before feeding kindling to the flame. Soon, smoke flowed from the open stove. Isaac coughed and his eyes teared as he kicked the stool apart for bigger pieces of wood, the last fuel in the house. But he didn't open the flue until a healthy flame filled the iron stove. Heat baked off the sides. His gloves steamed on top of the stove as he warmed his hands. Piece by piece, he removed his clothes to hang around the stove before wrapping his blanket around his shivering shoulders. Water dripped from his coat and pants. Heat rolled off the stove, tingling his cheeks, sending stabbing sparks through his toes and feet. He grimaced and moved closer. The wood walls of the house rattled in a torrent of wind, whipping the fire in the little stove into a tiny inferno. At its peak, 
when surely the house would have to shatter. The wind stopped, and for the first time in ten days, the house fell silent, except for the river's heart beating through the generator below. The storm had broken. In the cabin's sudden quiet, Isaac reached for his Bible, opened it randomly to read the first verses I fell upon. Surely the storm's cessation was a miracle. Surely a message would be at hand. He wrote the verse on a slip of paper, rolled it into a tube, then sealed it inside the Tommy sticker. By the time he finished, his face felt warm, and his toes stopped aching. Sean didn't wake up after the seventh long sleep. Dr. Singh said he knew the dangers when he let himself age. The sleep process is hard. I'm sorry. She consulted her notes. Dr. Arnold was a great man. His work on long sleep cellular degradation and preservation was groundbreaking. If we were still on Earth, he surely would receive a Nobel Prize. We should all make it to Zeta Reticula because of him. Singh shook her head sympathetically. I understand you were close. Megan gripped the edge of the examination table. I saw him yesterday, before the last sleep, I mean. I just saw him. She felt every minute of her 722 years. Me too, said Singh. If you need them, I can prescribe antidepressants. But I'd rather not. Drug interaction is difficult to predict. Megan walked the long hall from the infirmary to Sean's apartment. The plastic sheets covered his bed and the desk, coated by a thin layer of dust. Despite automated cleaning mechanisms, dust still fell on surfaces they couldn't reach. She pulled the plastic off his desk and let it fall to the floor. He'd left a notebook and her candle holder in the middle. She turned the cover back carefully. The paper that started the trip 700 years ago, even though it was acid-free and specially milled to last, had become brittle. Any handwritten notes that were expected to be permanent were written on plastic paper. But Sean had enjoyed the feel of real pages better. He had written, To Megan, inside the cover. The rest of the pages were blank. When she sat on the edge of the bed, the plastic crackled. The candle holder rested on her lap. She wondered, did everyone feel so empty? And what could she do about it? Her fingers pressed against the cool metal. Although remembering the aspen shaking in the valley of her wall display escaped her, she felt connected through the hard shape. How often had this candle holder stuck in a mine wall to light a few feet of rock? Who else had held it? Had it ever been more than just a tool to them? Her fingers traveled from the pointed end, past the coil that held the candle, to the burnished brass tube. For the first time, Megan really examined the antique as a practical object instead of art. Was that a cap on the end of what she had thought was the handle? She twisted it hard. Nothing. Maybe the antique did have something in it. Another connection to Earth. Both Teague and Sean had wondered. Now she wanted to know. A few minutes later, she asked the machine shop chief, a stout woman whose name Megan had never known, Do you have a way to open it? The chief turned it over. She said, It's brass, I think. From the 19th century, you say? I can cut it apart, but it will cause damage. Go ahead. The chief handled the cutting tool delicately, sending tiny sparks flurrying as she sliced through the candle holder's end. A coin-sized piece of metal dropped to the floor. Megan leaned over her shoulder as the chief used a pair of tweezers to pull the rolled-up slip of paper from the cavity. Megan shivered. It's almost a thousand years old. There's writing. A message. Megan feared the paper would crumble before she could discover what it said. What does it mean? 
asked the shop chief after they'd carefully unrolled it. It's a Bible verse, I think. I think I know. Megan left the puzzled shop chief behind and headed toward hydroponics. Already planning new pipes and grow lights. She would have to leave explanations and instructions for the next shift's hydroponic officers. Isaac climbed through the window and up to the surface again, the last of the chair burning in the stove behind him. The air bit just as cruelly, but without the wind behind it and the clouds clearing, he didn't feel as cold, although dampness squished in his temporarily warm clothes. If he couldn't find more wood soon, though, the fire would wink out again, and storm or no storm, he would freeze. Holding a short-handled axe, he girded himself for the long hike up the canyon where he might be able to find firewood. For a moment, he tried to orient himself. Snow transformed the valley, hiding all that had been familiar. The hundreds of tree trunks that marked the land before were deeply covered so the vista before him was smooth, clean, and hypnotic. The crystal river had almost entirely vanished, revealed only by a narrow crack in the snow from where the water's glassy voice arose. What surprised him most, though, were the trees that remained. Two weeks earlier, their lowest branches were twenty feet above the ground, the easy-to-reach ones having been chopped off for wood. Now, though, where the snow drifted, their needles brushed the crystalline surface. He would have no trouble finding fuel. He thought, why, that tree there carries enough dead limbs to keep me warm for a month. It felt like a miracle. He thought about the Bible verse he'd written on the slip of paper. He wasn't sure what it meant, but it had filled him with hope. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. He is gone a long journey. A bit from Proverbs. When spring came, he would take the tummy sticker with its message and bury it by the pump house. Somewhere, someone might read it, and it would help. He was sure of it. Megan kept her eyes closed for a long time after she awoke, until, finally, Dr. Singh's familiar voice said, I know you can hear me. Your vitals don't lie. I'm 822 years old today. She hadn't moved even a finger yet, but she didn't feel tired like she had the last time. She only felt hopeful. She waded through Dr. Singh's tests impatiently. I have to get to work. Megan said. Rushing through the hallways, she barely acknowledged other crew members' greetings. They, too, had work to do. So much of the trip waited before them. So much more space had to be traversed before they could come to a rest. The first hydroponics lab looked much like she had left it, although she noted the tanks that held the plant steady would need rebuilding on her shift. She passed under one of the spokes, the cathedral-like height earning not a glance. Did her experiment work, she thought. Did the other hydroponics officers follow her direction? She couldn't see far in front of her. The ceiling's downward bulge cut off her view until she was almost there. And then she saw. At the end of the row, where normally the plant stopped, her jury-rigged piping led to the new plant tanks. A thick trunk rose from the tank and as she entered the space below the next spoke, her gaze traveled up the tree's long stretch. Guy wires attached to the vertical space's sides held the tree steady. At the top, new growth fixtures hung suspended from other wires, bathing the aspen in light. Megan held her breath. An aspen, under the right conditions, can grow to 80 feet. This one was easily that tall. She walked around the tree. New piping and tanks connected to her original work. Three other trees grew from them. The closest tank came from her co-worker 25 years down the line. And the tree from that tank nearly matched her own. A smaller tree, only 50 years old,
grew from the next tank, and the last tank held the smallest tree, still over 30 feet to its top. The history attached to it showed it had been built 25 years ago. Each officer had added a tree to the grove. Megan sat on the floor so she could look up with less strain. Each tree's branches touched the next. The room smelled of aspen, a light leafy odor that reminded her of mountains and streams, and an old generator house perched on the edge of a short cliff. After she'd sat for a while, she realized that air currents in the ship flowed up the spoke. What she heard, finally, was not the ubiquitous mechanical hiss from the ventilation vents. What she heard was the gentle rustle of leaves touching leaves, a sound that she thought she'd long left behind and would never hear again. Act One Nancy Cress Nancy Cress began selling her elegant and incisive stories in the mid-1970s and has since become a frequent contributor to Asimov Science Fiction the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Omni, sci-fiction, and elsewhere. Her books include the novel version of her Hugo and Nebula-winning story, Beggars in Spain, and a sequel, Beggars and Choosers, as well as The Prince of Morning Bells, The Golden Grove, The White Pipes, An Alien Light, Brain Rose, Oaths and Miracles, Stinger, Maximum Light, Nothing Human, The Flowers of Owlet Prison, Crossfire, Crucible, Dogs, and the Space Opera Trilogy, Probability Moon, Probability Sun, and Probability Space. Her short work has been collected in Trinity and Other Stories, The Aliens of Earth, Beaker's Dozen, and Nano Comes to Clifford Falls, and other stories. Her most recent book is the novel Steal Across the Sky. In addition to the awards for Beggars in Spain, she has also won Nebula Awards for her stories Out of All Them Bright Stars and The Flowers of Owlet Prison, and won another Hugo this year for The Erdmann Nexus. Here she shows us that you can have too much of a good thing, even compassion. To understand whose movie it is, one needs to look not particularly at the script, but at the deal memo. Joan Didion I eased down the warehouse's basement steps behind the masked boy, one hand on the stair rail, wishing I'd worn gloves. Was this level of grime really necessary? It wasn't. We'd already passed through some very sophisticated electronic surveillance, as well as some very unsophisticated personal surveillance that stopped just short of a body cavity search. Although an unsmiling man did feel around inside my mouth. Soap cost less than surveillance, so probably the grime was intentional. The group was making a statement. That's what we'd been told to call them. The group. Mysterious. Undefined. Pretentious. The stairs were lit only by an old-fashioned 40-watt bulb, somewhere I couldn't see. Behind me, Jane's breath quickened. I'd insisted on going down first, right behind our juvenile guide, from a sense of... What? Masculine protection from me would be laughable, and usually I like to keep Jane where I can see her. It works out better that way. Barry, she breathed. The bottom of the steps was so shrouded in gloom that I had to feel my way with one extended foot. Two more steps, Janie. Thank you. Then we were down, and she took a deep breath, standing closer to me than she usually does. Her breasts were level with my face. Jane is only 5'6", but that's 17 inches taller than I am. The boy said, A little way more. Across the cellar, a door opened, spilling out light. There. 
It had been a laundry area once, perhaps part of an apartment for some long-dead maintenance man. Cracked wash tubs, three of them, sagged in one corner. No windows, but the floor had been covered with a clean, thin rug, and the three waiting people looked clean, too. I scanned them quickly. A tall, hooded man holding an assault rifle, his eyes the expression of bodyguards everywhere. Alert, but non-analytic. An unmasked woman in jeans and baggy sweater, staring at Jane with unconcealed resentment. Potential trouble there. And the leader, who came forward with his hand extended, smiling. Welcome, Miss No. We're honored. I recognized him immediately. He was a type rampant in political life, which used to be my life. Big, handsome, too pleased with himself and his position to accurately evaluate either. He was the only one not wearing jeans, dressed in slacks and a sports coat over a black turtleneck. If he had been a Paul instead of a genoterrorist, he'd have maybe gotten as far as city council executive and then would have run for mayor. Lost, and never understood why. So this was a low-level part of the group's operation, which was probably good. It might lessen the danger of this insane expedition. Thank you, Jane said in that famous voice, low and husky and as thrilling off-screen as on. This is my manager, Barry Tendler. I was more than her manager but the truth was too complicated to explain. The guy didn't even glance at me, and I demoted him from city council executive to ward captain. You always pay attention to the advisors. That's usually where the brains are, if not the charisma. Ms. Resentful, on the other hand, switched her scrutiny from Jane to me. I recognized the nature of that scrutiny. I felt it all my life. Jane said to the handsome leader, What should I call you? Call me Ishmael. Oh, give me a break. Did that make Jane the white whale? He was showing off his intellectual moves, with no idea they were both banal and silly. But Jane gave him her heart-melting smile, and even I, who knew better, would have sworn it was genuine. She might not have made a movie in ten years, but she still had it. Let's sit down, Ishmael said. Three kitchen chairs stood at the far end of the room. Ishmael took one, the bodyguard and the boy standing behind him. Ms. Resentful took another. Jane sank cross-legged to the rug in a graceful puddle of filmy green skirt. That was done for my benefit. My legs and spine hurt if I have to stand for more than a few minutes. And she knows how I hate sitting even lower than I already am. Ishmael, shocked and discerning nothing, said, Miss No. I think better when I'm grounded, she said, again with her irresistible smile. Along with her voice, that smile launched her career 35 years ago. Warm, passionate, but with an underlying wistfulness that bypassed the cerebrum and went straight to the primitive hindbrain. Unearned, she was born with those assets, but not unexploited. Jane was a lot shrewder than her fragile blonde looks suggested. The passion, however, was real. When she wanted something, she wanted it with every sinew, every nerve cell, every drop of her acquisitive blood. Now her graceful sitting bull act left Ishmael looking awkward on his chair. But he didn't do the right thing which would have been to join her on the rug. He stayed on his chair, and I demoted him even further, from ward captain to gopher. I clambered up onto the third chair. Ishmael gazed down at Jane and swelled like a powder pigeon at having her, literally, at his feet. Ms. Resentful scowled. Uneasiness washed through me. The group knew who Jane Snow was. Why would they put this meeting in the hands of an inept narcissist? I could think of several reasons. To indicate contempt for her world. 
to preserve the anonymity of those who actually counted in this most covert of organizations. To pay off a favor that somebody owed to Ishmael, or to Ishmael's keeper. To provide a photogenic foil to Jane, since of course we were being recorded. Any or all of these reasons would be fine with me. But my uneasiness didn't abate. Jane said, Let's begin then, Ishmael, if it's all right with you. It's fine with me, he said. His back was to the harsh light, which fell full on both Jane and Ms. Resentful. The latter had bad skin, small eyes, lanky hair, although her lips were lovely, full and red, and her neck above the windbreaker had the taut firmness of youth. The light was harder on Jane. It showed up the crow's feet, the tired inelasticity of her skin under her flawless makeup. She was, after all, fifty-four, and she'd never gone under the knife. Also, she'd never been really beautiful. Not as Angelina Jolie or Catherine Zeta-Jones had once been beautiful. Jane's features were too irregular, her legs and butt too heavy. But none of that mattered next to the smile, the voice, the green eyes fresh as new grass, and the powerful sexual glow she gave off so effortlessly. It's as if Jane Snow somehow received two sets of female genes at conception, a critic wrote once. Doubling everything we think of as feminine. That makes her either a goddess or a freak. I'm preparing for a role in a new movie, she said to Ishmael, although of course he already knew that. She just wanted to use her voice on him. It's going to be about your... your organization and about the future of the little girls. I've talked to some of them, and... Which ones? Ms. Resentful demanded. Did she really know them all by name? I looked at her more closely. Intelligence in those small, stony eyes. She could be from the group's headquarter cell, wherever it was, and sent to ensure that Ishmael didn't screw up this meeting. Or not. But if she were really intelligent... Would she be so enamored of someone like Ishmael? Stupid question. Three of Jane's four husbands had been gorgeous losers. Jane said, Well, so far I've only talked to Rima Ridley-Jones, but Friday I have the whole afternoon with the Barrington twins. Ishmael, unwilling to have the conversation migrate from him, said, Beautiful children, those twins and very intelligent. As if the entire world didn't already know that. Unlike most of the group's handiwork, the Barrington twins had been posed by their publicity hound parents on every magazine cover in the world. But Jane smiled at Ishmael as if he just explicated Spinoza. Yes, they are beautiful. Please, Ishmael, tell me about your organization. Anything that might help me prepare for my role in Future Perfect. He leaned forward, hands on his knees, handsome face intent. Dramatically, insistently, he intoned, There is one thing you must understand about the group, Jane. A very critical thing. You will never stop us portentous silence. The worst thing was, he might be right. The FBI, CIA, IRS, HPA, and several other alphabets had lopped off a few heads, but still the Hydra grew. It had so many supporters, liberal lawmakers and politicians, who wanted the Anti-Genetic Modification Act revoked and the Human Protection Agency dismantled the rich parents who wanted their embryos enhanced, the offshore banks that coveted the group's dollars, and the Caribbean or Mexican or who-knows-what islands that benefited from sheltering their mobile labs. We are idealists, Ishmael droned on, and we are the future. Through our efforts, mankind will change for the better. Wars will end. Cruelty will disappear. When people can 
Let me interrupt you for just a moment, Ishmael. Jane widened her eyes and overused his name. Her dewy look up at him from the floor could have reversed desertification. She was pulling out all the stops. I need so much to understand, Ishmael. If you gene mod these little girls, one by one, you end up changing such a small percentage of the human race. That... How many children have been engineered with Arlen syndrome? We prefer the term Arlen's advantage. Yes, of course. How many children? I held my breath. The group had never given out that information. Jane put an entreating hand on Ishmael's knee. He said loftily, hungrily, that information is classified. And I saw that he didn't know the answer. Ms. Resentful said, To date, 3,214. Was she lying? My instincts, and I have very good instincts, although to say that in this context is clearly a joke, said no. Resentful knew the number. So she was higher up than Ishmael. And since she sure as hell wasn't responding to Jane's allure, that meant the group now wanted the numbers made public. Yes, that's right, Ishmael said hastily. 3,214 children. Jane said, but that's not a high percentage out of six billion people on Earth, is it? It, five billionth of one percent, I said. A silly, self-indulgent display. But what the hell? My legs ached. She always could, ad lib. Yes, thank you, Barry. But my question was for Ishmael. If only such a tiny percentage of humanity possesses Arlen's advantage, even if the gene mod turns out to be inheritable. It is, Ishmael said. Which was nonsense. The oldest Arlen's kids were only twelve. Wonderful, Jane persisted. But as I say, if only such a tiny percentage of humanity possesses the advantage... How can the group hope to alter the entire human future? Ishmael covered her hand with his. He smiled down at her, and his eyes actually twinkled. Jane, Jane, Jane. Have you ever dropped a pebble into a pond? Yes. And what happened, my dear? A ripple, which spread and spread until the entire pond was affected. Ishmael spread his arms wide. The ass couldn't even put together a decent analogy. Humanity was an ocean, not a pond, and water ripples were always transitory. But Jane, actress that she was, beamed at him and moved the conversation to something he could handle. I see. Tell me, Ishmael, how you personally became involved in the group. He was thrilled to talk about himself. As he did, Jane skillfully extracted information about the group's makeup, its organization, its communications methods. Resentful let her do it. I watched the young woman, who was watching Ishmael, but not in a monitoring sort of way. He couldn't give away really critical information. He didn't have any. Still, he talked too much. He was the kind of man who responded to an audience, who could easily become so expansive that he turned indiscreet. Sooner or later, I suspected, he would say something to somebody that he shouldn't, and the group would dump him. Ms. Resentful wasn't anything near the actress that Jane was. Her hunger for this worthless man was almost palpable. I might have felt sympathy for her pain, if my own wasn't increasing so much in my leg's back neck. I seldom sat this long, and never on a hard chair. My particular brand of dwarfism, a chondroplasia, accounts for 70% of all cases. Malformed bones and cartilage produce not only the short limbs, big head and butt, and pushed-in face that all the media caricaturists so adore, but also, in some of us, Constriction of the spinal canal that causes pain. Especially as Akon's age, and I was only two years younger than Jane. 
multiple excruciating operations have only helped me so much. After an hour and a half, Jane rose, her filmy skirt swirling around her lovely calves. My uneasiness spiked sharply. If anything was going to happen, it would be now. But nothing did happen. The masked boy reappeared, and we were let out of the dingy basement. I could barely walk. Jane knew better than to help me, but she whispered, I'm so sorry, Perry, but this was my only chance. I know. Somehow I made it up the stairs. We navigated the maze of the abandoned warehouse, where the group's unseen soldiers stayed at standoff with our own unseen bodyguards. Blinking in the sunlight, I suddenly collapsed onto the broken concrete. Barry! It's okay. Don't. The rest will be so much easier. I promise. I got myself upright, or what passes for upright. The unmarked van arrived for us. The whole insane interview had gone off without a hitch, without violence, smooth as good chocolate. So why did I still feel so uneasy? An hour later, Jane's image appeared all over the net, the TV, the wall boards. Her words had been edited to appear that she was a supporter, perhaps even a member of the group. But of course we had anticipated this. The moment our van left the warehouse, the first of the preemptory spots I'd prepared, aired everywhere. They featured news avatar Cece Collins, who was glad for the scoop, interviewing Jane about her meeting. Dedicated actress preparing for a role, willing to take any personal risk for art. Not a personal believer in breaking the law, but valuing open discourse on this important issue. And so forth. The spots cost us a huge amount of money. They were worth it. Not only was the criticism diffused, but the publicity for the upcoming movie, which started principal photography in less than a month, was beyond price. I didn't watch my spots play, nor was I there when the FBI, CIA, HPA, etc. paid Jane the expected visit to both debrief her and or threaten her with arrest for meeting with terrorists, but I didn't need to be there. Before our meeting, I'd gotten Jane credentials under the Malvern Murphy Press Immunity Act, plus Everett Murphy as her more-than-capable lawyer. Everett monitored the interviews, and I stayed in bed under a painkiller. The FBI, CIA, HPA, wanted to meet with me, too, of course, once Jane told them I'd been present. They had to wait until I could see them. I didn't mind their cooling their heels as they waited for me. Not at all. Why are you so opposed to gene mods, Jane had asked me once, and only once, not looking at me as she said it. She meant, why you, especially. Usually I answered Jane, trusted Jane. But not on this. I told her the truth. You wouldn't understand. To her credit, she hadn't been offended, Jane was smart enough to know what she didn't know. Now, on my lovely pain patch, I floated in a world where she and I walked hand in hand through a forest the green of her filmy skirt, and she had to crane her neck to smile up at me. The next few days, publicity for the picture exploded. Jane did interview after interview. TV, LinkNet, Robocam, Print, Hollow News. She glowed with the attention, looking ten years younger. Some of the interviewers and avatars needled her, but she stuck to the studio line. This is a movie about people, not polemics. Future Perfect is not really about genetic engineering. It will be an honest examination of eternal verities, of our shared frailty and astonishing shared strength, of what makes us human, of blah, blah, blah that just happens to use Arlen's syndrome as a vehicle. The script was nearly finished, and it would be complex and realistic and blah, blah, blah. Pro or con on gene mods, an exasperated journalist finally shouted from the back of the room. Jane gave him a dazzling smile. Complex and realistic, 
she said. Both the pros and the cons would be swarming into the theater, unstoppable as lemmings. I felt so good about all of this that I decided to call Layla. I needed to be in a good mood to stand these calls. Layla wasn't home, letting me get away with just a message, which made me feel even better. Jane, glowing on camera, was wiping a decade years of cinematic obscurity with Future Perfect. I couldn't wipe out my 15 years of guilt that easily, nor would I do so even if I could. But I was still glad that Layla wasn't home. Jane had promised that Friday's role prep interview would be easier on me. She was wrong. The Barrington twins lived with their parents and teenage sister in San Luis Obispo. Jane's pilot obtained clearance to land on the green velvet Barrington lawn, well behind the estate's heavily secured walls. I wouldn't have to walk far. Welcome, Miss Snow. An honor. Frida Barrington was mutton dressed as lamb, a fifty-ish woman in a brief skirt and peekaboo caped sweater, slim, toned, tanned. But the breast doing the peekabooing would never be twenty again, and her face had the tense lines of those who spent most of their waking time pretending not to be tense. Jane climbed gracefully from the flyer and stood so that her body shielded my awkward descent. I seized the grab bar, sat on the flyer floor, fell heavily onto the grass, and scrambled to my feet. Jane moved aside, her calf-length skirt, butter yellow this time, blowing in the slight breeze. Call me Jane. This is my manager, Barry Tender. Frida Barrington was one of those. Still, she at least tried to conceal her distaste. Hello, Mr. Tendler. Hi. With any luck, this would be the only syllable I had to address to her. We walked across through perfect landscaping, Frida supplying the fund of inane chatter that such women always have at their disposal. The house had been built a hundred years earlier for a silent film star. Huge, pink, gilded at windows and doors, it called to mind an obese lawn flamingo. We entered a huge foyer floored in black and white marble, which managed to look less vermeer than checkerboard. A sulky girl in dirty jeans lounged on a chaise long. She stared at us over the garish cover of a comic book. Suki, get up, Frida snapped. This is Miss Snow and her manager, Mr. Uh, Tangler. My daughter, Suki. The girl got up, made an ostentatious and mocking curtsy, and lay down again. Frida made a noise of outrage and embarrassment. But I felt sorry for Suki. Fifteen. The same age as Ethan. Plain of face, she was caught between a mother who'd appropriated her fashions and twin sisters who appropriated all the attention. Frida would be lucky if Suki's rebellion stopped at mere rudeness. I made her a mock little bow to match a curtsy, and watched as her eyes widened with surprise. I grinned. Frida snapped. Where are the twins? Suki shrugged. Frida rolled her eyes and led us through the house. They were playing on the terrace a sun-shaded sweep of weathered stone with steps that led to more lawn, all backed by a gorgeous view of vineyards below the Sierra Madres. Frida settled us on comfortable padded chairs. A robo-server rolled up, offering lemonade. Bridget and Belinda came over to us before they were called. Hello, Jane said with her melting smile. But neither girl answered. Instead, they gazed steadily, unblinkingly at her for a full thirty seconds, and then did the same with me. I didn't like it, or them. Arlen syndrome, like all genetic tinkering, has side effects. No one knows that better than I. Achondroplasia dwarfism is the result of a single nucleotide substitution in the gene. FGFR3, at codon 380 on chromosome 4. It affects the growth bones and cartilage, which in turn affects air passages, nerves, 
and other people's tolerance. Exactly which genes were involved in Arlen's were a trade secret. But the modifications undoubtedly spread across many genes, with many side effects. But since only females could be gene mod for Arlen's, the X chromosome was one of those altered. That much, at least, was known. The two eleven-year-old girls staring at me so frankly were small for their age, delicately built, fairy children. They had white skin, silky fair hair cut in short caps, and eyes of luminous gray. Other than that, they didn't look much alike, fraternal twins rather than identical. Bridget was shorter, plumper, prettier. From a petri dish full of Frida's fertilized eggs, the Barringtons had chosen the most promising two, had them gene-modded for Arlen syndrome, and implanted them in Frida's aging but still serviceable womb. The loving parents, both exhibitionists, had splashed across the worldwide media every last detail, except where and how the work had been done. Unlike Rima Ridley-Jones, the Arlen's child that Jane had spoken with last week, these two were carefully manufactured celebrities. Jane tried again. I'm Jane Snow, and you're Bridget and Belinda. I'm glad to meet you. Yes, Belinda said. You are. She looked at me. But you're not. There was no point in lying. Not to them. Not particularly, Bridget said, with a gentleness surprising in one so young. That's okay, though. Thank you, I said. I didn't say it was okay, Belinda said. There was no answer to that. The Ridley Jones child hadn't behaved like this. In addition to shielding her from the media, her mother had taught her manners. Frida, on the other hand, leaned back in her chair like a spectator at a play, interested in what her amazing daughters would say next, but with anxiety on overdrive. I had the sense she'd been here before. Eleven-year-olds were no longer adorable, biddable toddlers. You'll never get it, Belinda said to me, at the same moment that Bridget put a hand on her sister's arm. Belinda shook it off. Let me alone, Brid. He should know. They all should know. She smiled at me, and I felt something in my chest recoil from the look in her gray eyes. You'll never get it, Belinda said to me with that horrible smile. No matter what you do, Jane will never love you, and she'll always hate it when you touch her, even by mistake, just like she hates it now. Hates it, hates it, hates it. It started with a dog, Dr. Kenneth Bernard Arlen. A geneticist and chess enthusiast owned a toy poodle. Poodles are a smart breed. Arlen played chess twice a week in his Stanford apartment with Kelson Hughes from Zoology. Usually they played three, four, or five games in a row, depending on how careless Hughes got with his endgame. Cosette lay on the rug, dozing, until checkmate of the last game when she always began barking frantically to protest Hughes's leaving. The odd thing was that Cosette began barking before the men rose, as they replaced the chessmen for what might, after all, have been the start of just another game. How did she know it wasn't? Hughes assumed pheromones. He, or Arlen, or both, probably gave off a different smell as they decided to call it a night. Pheromones were Hughes's field of research. He'd done significant work in mate selection among mice, based on smell. He had a graduate student remove the glomeruli from adult dogs and put them through tests to see how various of their learned responses to humans changed. The responses didn't change. It wasn't pheromones. Now, not only Hughes, but also Arlen was intensely intrigued. The Human Genome Project had just lit into phase two, discovering which genes encoded for what proteins, and how. Arlen was working with Turner's Syndrome, a disorder in which females were born missing all or part of one of their two X chromosomes. 
The girls had not only physical problems, but social ones. They seemed to have trouble with even simple social interactions. What interested Hughes was that Turner Syndrome girls with an intact paternal X gene, the one inherited from the father, managed far better socially than those with the maternal X functioning. Something about picking up social cues was coded for genetically. And on the paternal X. Where else did social facility reside in the genome? What cues of body language, facial expression, or tone of voice was Cosette picking up? Somehow the dog knew that when Hughes and Arlen set the chessmen in place, this wasn't the start of a new game. Something, dictated at least in part by Cosette's genes, was causing processes in her poodle brain. After all, Hughes's dog, a big dumb Samoyed, never seemed to anticipate anything. Snowy was continually surprised by gravity. Arlen found the genes in dogs. It took him ten years, during which he failed to get tenure because he wouldn't publish. After Stanford let him go, he still didn't publish. He found the genes in humans. He still didn't publish. Stone broke. He was well on the way to bitter, and yet with his idealism undimmed. An odd combination, but not unknown among science fanatics. Inevitably, he crossed paths with people even more fanatical. Kenneth Bernard Arlen joined forces with offshore backers to open a fertility clinic that created super-empathic children. Empathy turns up early in some children. A naturally empathic nine-month-old will give her teddy bear to another child who is crying. The toddler senses how bad the other child feels. People who score high in perceiving others' emotions are more popular, more outgoing, better adjusted, more happily married, more successful at their jobs. Arlen Syndrome toddlers understood, not verbally, but in their limbic systems, when Mommy was worried, when Daddy wanted them to go potty, that Grandma loved them, that a stranger was dangerous. If his first illegal offshore experiments with human germlines had resulted in deformities, Arlen would have been crucified. There were no deformities. Prospective clients loved the promise of kids who actually understood how parents felt. By six or seven, Arlen Syndrome kids could, especially if they were bright, read an astonishing array of nonverbal signals. By nine or ten, it was impossible to lie to them. As long as you were honest and genuinely had their best interests in mind, the children were a joy to live with, sensitive, cooperative, grateful, aware. And yet, here was Belinda Barrington, staring at me from her pale eyes, and I didn't need a genetic dose of super-empathy to see her glee at embarrassing me. I couldn't look at Jane. The blood was hot in my face. Frida said, sharply and hopelessly, Belinda, that's not nice. No, it's not, Bridget said. She frowned at her sister, and Belinda actually looked away for a moment. Her twin had some childish control over Belinda, and her mother didn't. Tell him you're sorry. Sorry, Belinda muttered, unconvincingly. So, they could lie, if not be lied to. Frida said to Jane, This is new behavior. I'm sure it's just a phase. Nothing you'd want to include in your project. Belinda shot her mother a look of freezing contempt. Jane took control of the sorry situation. Sparing me any direct glance, she said to Belinda, Did anybody tell you why I want to talk to you girls? No, Belinda said. You're not a reporter. I'm a movie actress. Bridget brightened. Like Kylie Kicker? Apparently, Arlen's advantage did not confer immunity to inane kitty pop culture. Not as young, Jane smiled, or as rich. But I'm making a movie about the lives that girls like you might have when you're grown up. 
That's why I want to get to know you a little bit now. But only if it's okay with you. The twins looked at each other. Neither spoke, but I had the impression that gigabytes passed between them. Frida said, Girls, I hope you'll cooperate with Miss Snow. She... No, you don't, Belinda said, almost absently. You don't like her. She's too pretty. But we like her. Frida's face went a mottled maroon. Bridget, her plump features alarmed, put a hand on her mother's arm. But Frida shook it off, started to say something, then abruptly stood and stalked into the house. Bridget made a move to follow, but checked herself. To me? Why? She said apologetically. She wants to be alone a little while. You should go with her, Belinda said. And I didn't have to be told twice. These kids gave me the creeps. Not that even they, with their overpraised empathy, could ever understand why. In the foyer, Suki still lay on the chaise long with her comic book. There was no sign of her mother. The other chairs were all mammoth leather things, but a low antique bench stood against one wall, and I clambered painfully onto it and called a cab. I would have to walk all the way to the front gate to meet it, but the thought of going back in the flyer with Jane was unbearable. I closed my eyes and leaned my head against the wall. My back and legs ached, but nothing compared to my heart. It wasn't the words Belinda had said. Yes, I love Jane, and yes, that love was hopeless. I already knew that, and so must Jane. How could she not? I was with her nearly every day. She was a woman sensitive to nuance. I knew she hated my accidental touch, and hated herself for that, and could help none of it. Three of Jane's husbands had been among the best-looking men on the planet. Tall, strong, straight-limbed. I had seen Jane's flesh glow rosy just because James or Carl or Duncan was in the same room with her. I had felt her hide her recoil from me. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. How often as a child had I chanted that to myself, after another in the endless string of bullies had taunted me. Short stuff, dopey, munchkin, big butt, mighty midget, Oompa Loompa? Cripple? Belinda hadn't illuminated any new truth for anybody. What she had done was speak it aloud. Give sorrow words. But even Shakespeare could be as wrong as nursery chants. Something unnamed could, just barely, be ignored. Could be kept out of daily interaction. Could almost be pretended away. What had been... Given words could not. And now tomorrow and the next day and the day after that, Jane and I would have to try to work together, would avoid each other's eyes, would each tread the dreary internal treadmill. Is he, she upset? Did I brush too close, stay too far away, give off any hurtful signal? For God's sake, leave me alone. Speech doesn't banish distance. It creates it. And if... Bitches, aren't they? A voice said softly. I opened my eyes. Suki stood close to my bench. She was taller than I thought, with a spectacular figure. No one would ever notice, not next to the wonder and novelty of the twins. In my shamed confusion, I blurted out the first thing that came into my mind. Belinda is, Bridget isn't. That's what you think. Suki laughed, then laid her comic book on the bench. You need this, dwarf. She vanished into some inner corridor. I picked up the comic. It was hollow. Those not inexpensive e-graphics with chips embedded in the paper. Four panels succeeded each other on each page, with every panel dramatizing the plot in ten-second bursts of shifting light. The title was Knife Hack, and the story seemed to concern a mother who carves up her infants with a maximum amount of blood and brain spatter. Arlen Syndrome Kids. A joy to live with. Sensitive and cooperative and grateful and aware. Just one big happy family. 
But sometimes the universe gives you a break. The next day I had a cold. Nothing serious, just a stuffy nose and sore throat. But I sounded like a rusty file scraping on cast iron. So I called in sick to my office at Jane's estate. Her trainer answered. What? Tell Jane I won't be in today. Sick. And remind her to... I'm not your errand boy, Barry, he answered hotly. We stared at each other's comlink images in mutual dislike. Dino Carano was the trainer to the stars of the moment before this one. An arrogant narcissist who three times a week tortured Jane into perfect abs and weeping exhaustion. Like Ishmael, he was without the prescience to realize that his brief vogue had passed, and that Jane kept him on, partly from compassion. He stood now in her deserted exercise room. Why are you answering the phone? Where's Catalina? Her grandmother in Mexico died. Again. And before you ask, Jose is supervising the grounds crew and Jane is in the bathroom throwing up. Now you know everything. Bye, Barry. Wait. If she's throwing up because you pushed her too hard again, you dago bastard. Save your invective, little man. We haven't even started the training session yet. And if we don't train by tomorrow, her ass is going to drop like a duffel bag. For today, she just ate something bad. He cut the link. My stomach didn't feel too steady either. Had it been the Barrington lemonade? I made it to the bathroom just in time. But afterward, I felt better, decided to not call my doctor, and went to bed. If Jane was sick, Catalina would cancel her appointments. No, Catalina was in Mexico. Not my problem. But all Jane's problems were mine. Without her, I had my own problems. Layla, Ethan. But no actual life. Nonetheless, I forced myself to stay in bed. And eventually I fell asleep. When I woke, six hours later, my throat and stomach both felt fine. A quick call discovered that Catalina had returned from Mexico, sounding suspiciously unbereaved. But she was efficient enough when she was actually in the country, and I decided I didn't need to brief Jane on tomorrow's schedule. That would buy me one more day. I would take a relaxing evening. A long bath, a glass of wine, another postponement of talking to Layla. The industry news on Hollywood Watch. The local news came on first. Ishmael's body had been found in a pond in the valley. And weighted with cement blocks. Cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the head. Execution style, said the news avatar. A CGI who looked completely real, except that she had no faulty camera angles whatsoever. I stared at the photo of Ishmael's handsome face on the screen beside her. Apparently, the murderers were unaware that construction work would start today at the pond site, where luxury condos will be built by... Ishmael's name was Harold Sylvester Ehrenreich. Failed actor, minor grifter, petty tax evader, who had dropped out of electronic sight eight months ago. Anyone having any information concerning... I was already on the comm link. Jane, I just called the cops. They're on their way over. She looked tired, drawn, within five years of her actual age. Her voice sounded as raspy as mine had been. I was just about to call you. Barry, if this endangers the picture... It won't, I said. Thirty years a star, and she still didn't understand how the behind-the-scenes worked. It will make the picture. Did you call Everett? He's on his way. Don't say a word until both he and I get there. Not a word, Jane. Not one. Can you send the flyer for me? Yes. Barry, was he killed because of my interview? There's no way to know that, I said and all at once was profoundly grateful that it was true. I didn't care if Ishmael was alive, dead, or fucking himself on Mars. But Jane was built differently. People mattered to her, especially the wounded bird type. 
It was how she'd ended up married to three of her four husbands. And the fourth, the alpha male producer, had been in reaction to the second, the alcoholic failed actor. Catalina, Jane's housekeeper and social secretary, was another of her wounded birds. So, in his own perverse way, was her trainer. Maybe that was why Jane had ended up with me as well. But I could tell that neither me nor Belinda's cruel words were on Jane's mind just now. It was all Ishmael, and that was good. Ishmael would get us safely past our personal crisis. Even murder has its silver lining. As the flyer sat down on Jane's roof, I saw the media already starting to converge. Someone must have tipped them off perhaps a clerk at the precinct. An unmarked car was parked within Jane's gates, with two vans outside and another flyer approaching from L.A. Catalina let me in, her dark eyes wide with excitement. La policia. I know. Is Everett Murphy here? Yes, he... Bring in coffee and cake, and make the maids draw all the curtains in the house, immediately. Even the bedrooms. There'll be robocams. I wanted pictures and information released on my schedule, not that of flying recorders. A man and a woman sat with Jane and Everett at one end of her enormous living room, which the decorator had done in swooping black curves with accents of screaming purple. The room looked nothing like Jane, who used it only for parties. She'd actually defied the decorator, who was a Dino Carano bully type, but not a wounded bird and done her private sitting room in English country house. But she hadn't taken the detectives there. I could guess why. She was protecting her safe haven. Catalina rushed past me like a small Mexican tornado and dramatically pushed the button to opaque the windows. They went deep purple, and lights flickered on in the room. Catalina raced out. Barry, Jane said. She looked even worse than on Comlink. Red nose and swollen eyes and no makeup. I hoped to hell that neither cop was optic wired. This is Detective Lopez and Detective Miller from the LAPD. Officers, my manager, Barry Tenler. They nodded. Both were too well trained to show curiosity or distaste, but they were there. I always know. In her sitting room, Jane kept a low chair for me, but here I had to scramble up onto a high black sofa that satisfied the decorator desire for an important piece. I said, You can question Miss Snow now, but please be advised that she has already spoken with the FBI and HPA, and that both Mr. Murphy and I reserve the right to advise her to not answer. The cops ignored this meaningless window dressing. But I'd accomplished what I wanted. Dwarfs learn early that straightforward, multisyllabic, take-no-shit talk will sometimes stop average-sizers from treating us like children. Sometimes. Officer Lopez began a thorough interrogation. How had she arranged the meeting with the group? When? What contact had she had between the initial one and the meeting? Who had taken her to the meeting? Who else had accompanied her? When they found out that it had been me, Lopez got the look of a man who knows he screwed up. You were there, Mr. Tendler? I was. You'll have to go with Officer Miller into another room, Lopez said. He stared at me hard. Witnesses were always questioned separately, and even if it hadn't crossed his mind that someone like me was a witness, he suspected it had crossed mine, which it had. If law enforcement agencies weren't given to so many turf wars, the LAPD would already know I'd been in that grimy basement. Or if Lopez hadn't fallen victim to his own macho assumptions. You? She took a lame half-pint like you to protect her? Everett is my lawyer, too, I said. You go with Officer Miller. Mr. Murphy will join you when I'm finished with Miss Snow. Lopez's formality barely restrained his anger. Following Officer Miller to the media room, it occurred to me, pointlessly, 
that Belinda would have known immediately that I'd been withholding something. It seemed obvious to me, as it probably was to the cops, that Ishmael had been killed by the group. Narcissistic, bombastic, unreliable. He must have screwed up royally. Was Ms. Resentful dead, too? The bodyguard with the assault rifle? The boy who'd guided us through the warehouse? The group was trying to combine idealism, profit-making, and iron control. That combination never worked. I would say that to Officer Lopez, except that there was little chance he would take it seriously. Not for me. The media spent a breathless three or four days on the story. Famous actress questioned about Jean Maud murder. What does Jane know? Then a United States senator married a former porn star named Candy Alley, and the press moved on, partly because it was clear that Jane didn't know anything. I'd positioned her as cooperative, concerned, committed to her art, and bewildered by the killing. Opinion polls said the public viewed her favorably. She increased her name recognition 600% among 18- to 24-year-olds, most of whom watched only Hollows and had never seen a Jane Snow picture. Publicity is publicity. She got even more of it by spending so much time with the Barrington twins. Everybody liked this except me. Frida liked the press attention. At least such press as wasn't staking out the senator and his new pork barrel. The twins liked Jane. She liked caring for yet more wounded birds, which was what she considered them. Her thinking on this escaped me. These were two of the most pampered children in the known universe. But Jane was only filling time, anyway, until the script was finished. And to her credit, she turned down the party invitations from the I'm more important than you A-list crowd that had ignored her for a decade. I'd urged her to turn down social invitations in order to create that important aura of non-attainable exclusivity. Jane turned them down because she no longer considered those people to be friends. As for me, I worked at home on the hundreds of pre-photography details. Before I could finally reach Layla, she called me. Hey, Barry. Hey, Layla. She didn't look good. I steeled myself to ask, how is he? Gone again. Exhaustion pulled at her face. I called the LAPD, but they won't do anything. He'll come home again, I said. He always does. Yeah, and one of these days it'll be in a coffin. I said nothing to that, because there was nothing to say. Layla, however, could always find something. Well, if he does come home in a coffin, then you'll be off the hook, won't you? No more risk of embarrassing you or the gorgeous has-been. Layla. Have a good time with your big-shot Hollywood friends. I'll just wait to hear if this time the son you deformed really is dead. She hung up on me. Layla and I met at a Little People of America convention in Denver. She was one of the teenage dwarfs dancing joyously, midriff bared and short skirt flipping, at the annual ball. I thought she was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. Red hair and blue eyes, alive to her fingertips. I was 18 years older than she, and everyone at the convention knew who I was. High-ranking aide to a candidate for the mayor of San Francisco. Smart, successful, sharply dressed. Local dwarf makes good. More mobile then, I asked her to dance. Six months later, we married. Six months after that, while I was running the campaign for a gubernatorial candidate, Layla accidentally got pregnant. Two dwarfs have a 25% chance of conceiving an average-sized child, a 50% chance of a dwarf, and a 25% of a double dominant, which always die shortly after birth. Layla and I had never discussed these odds because, like most dwarfs, we planned on the in vitro fertilization that permits cherry-picking embryos. But Layla got careless with her pills. She knew immediately that she was pregnant, 
and even before the zygote had implanted itself in her uterus wall, testing showed that the fetus had a normal FGFR3 gene. I panicked. I don't want to have an average-sized kid, I told Layla. I just don't. And I don't want to have an abortion, Layla said. It's not that I'm politically opposed to abortion. I'm glad to have the choice, but Barry, I... I just can't. He's already a baby to me. Our baby. Why would having an average be so hard? Why? I'd waved a hand around our house, in which everything, furniture, appliance controls, doorknobs, had been built to our scale. Just look around. Besides, there's a moral question here, Layla. You know that with in vitro, fewer and fewer dwarfs are having dwarf children. That just reinforces the idea that there's something wrong with being a dwarf. I don't want to perpetuate that. I won't perpetuate that. This is a political issue. I want a dwarf child. She believed me. She was 20 to my 39, and I was a big-shot politico. She loved me. Layla lacked the perspicacity to see how terrified I was of an average-sized son, who would be as tall as I was by the time he was seven, who would be impossible to control, who might eventually despise me and his mother both. But Layla really, really didn't want to abort. I talked her into in utero somatic gene therapy in England. In those days, I believed in science— the SOM gene technique was new, but producing spectacular results. The British had gotten behind genetic engineering in a big way, and knowledgeable people from all over the world flocked to Cambridge, where private firms tied to the great university, where turning on and off genes in fetuses still in the womb. This had to be done during the first week or ten days after conception. The FGFR3 gene stops bones from growing. It was turned on in babies with dwarfism. A corrective gene mod retrovirus should be able to turn the gene off in the little mass of cells that was Ethan. The problem was that the Cambridge Biotech Clinic wouldn't do it. We cure disease, not cause it, I was told icily. Dwarfism is not a disease, I said, too angry to be icy, waving high the banner of political righteousness. It wasn't a good idea, in those days, to cross me. I was the high-ranking, infallible campaign guru, the tiny wunderkind, the man who was never wrong. Fear can present itself as arrogance. Nonetheless, the scientist told me in that aloof British accent, we will not do it, nor, I suspect, will any clinic in the United Kingdom. He was right. Time was running out. The next day we went offshore, to a clinic in the Caymans. And something went wrong. The retrovirus that was the delivery vector mutated, or the splicing caused other genes to jump. They will do that. Or maybe God just wanted an evil joke that day. The soma gene correction spawned side effects with one gene turning on another that in turn affected another. A cascade of creation run amok. And we got Ethan. Layla never forgave me, and I never forgave myself. She left me when Ethan was not quite two. I sent money. I tried to stay in touch. I bore Layla's fury and contempt and despair. She sent me pictures of Ethan, but she wouldn't let me see him. I could have pressed visitation through the courts. I didn't. My gubernatorial candidate lost. Barry? Jane Com linked me the night before the first script conference. Would you like to come to dinner tonight? Can't, I lied. I already have dinner plans. Oh, with whom? A friend? I smiled mysteriously. Some inane, back in high school part of my brain, hoped that she'd think I had a date. Then I saw Bridget Barrington scamper across the room behind Jane. Are those kids at your place? Yes, I couldn't go there today because Catalina is sick and I had to... Sick? 
With what? Jane, you can't catch anything now. The first reading is tomorrow, and I won't catch this. I gave it to her. It's that sore throat and stomach thing we both had. Catalina, you're not a goddamn nurse. If Catalina is ill, give me credit. I didn't say actually ill instead of faking the way she fakes relatives' deaths every 15 minutes. Then hire a nurse, or she's not sick enough for a nurse. She just needs coddling and orange juice and company. It's fine, Barry. So butt out. I'm actually glad of the distraction. It keeps me from thinking about tonight. Oh, I meant to tell you. I talked Robert into couriering the script to me tonight. I wanted to read it before tomorrow. He sounded weird about it, but he agreed. My radar turned on. Weird how? I don't know. Just weird. I considered all the possible weirds that the producer could be conveying, but I didn't see what I could do about any of them. I settled for, just don't catch anything from Catalina. I already told you that I won't. Fine. Whatever you say. And it was fine. She was treating me the way she always did, with exasperated affection. And I was grateful. Belinda's poison, flushed out of our working relationship by the flood of feeling about Ishmael's murder, hadn't harmed us. I wouldn't lose the little of Jane that I had. And the picture was going to be a blockbuster. It's a disaster, Jane screamed. I won't do it. Sitting up in bed, I stared blearily at the wall screen. Beneath the image of Jane's ravaged face, the time said 12.56 a.m. I struggled to assemble consciousness. What is... She started to cry. Great gasping sobs that would wreck her face for tomorrow's conference. When had I seen Jane cry like that? When the last husband left. And the one before that. I'm coming right over, I said. I'm leaving immediately. Don't read any more of the script. We'll work this out. I promise. She was sobbing too hard to answer me. Just have a glass of wine and wait for me. Oh, okay. I cut the link and called my chauffeur. I can drive if I have to, but it's painful. Ernie and his wife Sandra, my housekeeper, live in the guest cottage. They're both acons. Mr. Tendler? What is it? Are you okay? Ernie sounded bewildered. They're good people, but I've kept our relationship distant, not given to midnight calls for chauffeur service. I'm fine, but I have to go to Miss Snow's immediately. Can you bring around the car in five minutes? Five minutes? Ernie's face looked exhausted. Yeah, sure. Are you all right? Surprise replaced his exhaustion. I wasn't in the habit of asking after Ernie's health. Yeah, I'm fine. It's just that Sandra and I have both been under the weather. But no big deal. I'll be there in... But if you're sick, maybe you shouldn't. Five minutes, Ernie said. And now suspicion had replaced surprise. What the hell was I doing? I didn't know either. Painfully, I climbed from the bed, tried to flex my aching body, and pulled on clothes. I hobbled out the front door as the Lexus pulled up. Here, I said, handing Ernie a pain patch and a plastic flask of orange juice. He stared at me and shook his head. Jane, in robe and slippers, let me in herself. Her face, red and blotchy and swollen, looked the worst I'd ever seen it. I wanted to take her in my arms. And that turned my voice harsher than I expected. What's wrong with the fucking script? Perversely. My anger seemed to steady her. It's a travesty. Did they reduce your part? That's the least of it. Read it, Barry. I want you to read it for yourself. She led the way to her sitting room. A bottle of wine, half empty, sat on the table. Jane poured herself a third glass as I read. But I wasn't worried about that. Despite her fragile looks, Jane could outdrink a Russian stevedore. 
I began to read. Future Perfect was based on a short story by an obscure writer, which means the studio got the rights cheap. Like much fiction set in the future, it extrapolated from the present, portraying a Mississippi city in which the mayor was an Arlen Syndrome young woman named Kate Bradshaw. Kate, empathetic but inexperienced, was guided by Jane's character, an ex-DA who was tough, funny, and not above using her mature sexuality for political ends. The story arc brought in prejudice, female friendship, and the choices that politics must make to accommodate radically different points of view. There was a lot of lush, deep South atmosphere. The ending, deliberately ambiguous, featured a knockout closing speech for Jane's DA. The script had moved the story to L.A. The mayor was an evil Delilah who could read minds. She seduced and destroyed men, subverted democracy, had her enemies tortured. Clones were created. Buildings blew up. Many buildings. Jane's character was also blown up, a third of the way into the movie. The mayor is eventually shot through the heart by a noble young HPA agent. The body bleeds viscous yellow blood. Jane. I said, and stopped. I had to be careful, had to choose just the right words. She had finished off the bottle of wine. I brought her a box of tissues, even though she had stopped crying. I know it's bad, but I won't do it. Her flexible voice held the kind of despair that's gone past raging, gone straight into hopelessness. This is only the first pass at the script, we can ask for, you know we won't get it. I did know. I went to the main point. Janie, sweetheart, this is the only project you've been offered in. I won't do it. Jane, you're not. I should think you would understand, she said, looking at me directly with a very un-Jane look. No softness, no flirtation, nothing but quiet, unvarnished truth. This piece of shit encourages hatred. Not just portrays it, but actively encourages it. Arlen's kids are different. Therefore, they must be bad, evil. More than that, they're the result of a genetic difference. So they must be really bad, really evil. And we should clean them out of our society. I should think you, of all people, Barry, would object to that. We had never... Not once in five years, discussed my dwarfism. She didn't know about Layla, about Ethan. This was uncharted territory for us, and with every cell of my being, I did not want to go there. She had no right to bring this home to me. It was her decision. Anger hijacked my brain. You have no idea what I should or should not object to, do you think that two weeks spent with a few genetically privileged kids gives you insight into what genetics can do? You know nothing. You're as ignorant and stupid as most of the rest of the so-called normal population. You have no idea the anguish that fucking gene mods can cause. You think they're all uplifting improvements to mankind. You think that you can just... Go ahead! Commit career suicide! The script is all you've been offered in three years, and it's all you're going to get offered. You're an aging actress who belongs to another era. A Norma Desmond who will never... Go ahead. Tell yourself you're taking the moral high ground. You're standing on quicksand, and I'll be fucked if I let you take me down with you. Silence. She said wearily, I won't do the script. Fine. Get yourself another manager. I hobbled out to the waiting car, and Ernie drove me home. Jane withdrew from the picture. The studio cast Suri Cruz in the part. She was young enough to be Jane's daughter. Layla called to say tersely that Ethan had crawled home from his latest bout of homelessness. He had a broken nose, a black eye 
and a mangled hand. She wouldn't let me come to see him. How would he even know who the fuck you are? I didn't insist. The LAPD announced periodically that there were no new developments in the Harold Ehrenreich murder case, and over the next few months, Ishmael's handsome face disappeared from the news grids. Ernie recovered from his bout of flu in a few days, but Sandra's turned into pneumonia, and she had to go to the hospital. I visited her every day, to her bewilderment. This was new behavior, but I knew the cause. I had nothing else to do, or at least nothing I could make myself do, and hospital visiting was a distraction. Sandra was only there for four days, but her roommate developed complications and had to go into ICU. She was a frightened old woman with no family. I brought her flowers and chocolate, and, when she was a little better, played mahjong with her. The game attracted a few other invalids, including a young man dying of one of the few cancers that medicine still couldn't cure. I began visiting him, too. Martin never seemed to even notice that I was a dwarf. Perhaps, as someone once remarked, dying does concentrate the mind, squeezing out everything else. Every once in a while, I reflected wryly that I seemed to have taken on Jane's penchant for wounded birds. But I didn't reflect too hard. Hospital visiting was a long way from Hollywood management, which in turn was a long way from the nails-tough political world. I didn't want to look at how far I'd fallen. Jane, too, seemed to be in wounded bird mode. Sometimes, not too often, a picture of her would turn up on some fourth-rate celebrity watch link site, the hollow supplied by a desperate paparazzo who couldn't do better. In those shots, she was helping some homeless drunk or paying the bills for a child who owned one ragged dress. Or so it was claimed. The hollows of Jane with the Barrington twins, on the other hand, turned up regularly on all the news vectors. Frida Barrington probably saw to that. In July, Ernie and Sandra quit. I'm sorry, Mr. Tendler, but we're not comfortable here anymore. Not comfortable? I had just spent $20,000 remodeling the guest cottage. No. He shifted from one foot to the other. Ernie has a smaller head and butt than a lot of acons, but he's far from being a proportional, and another job that paid this well for this little work was not going to be easy to find. Not for him, not for Sandra. Where would they go? Where will you go? That's our business. It was such a rude answer that I frowned. Something in the frown broke his reserve. Look, Mr. Tendler, it's not that we aren't grateful. You've done a lot for us. But lately you're so... We didn't want the cottage remodeled, and I said as much to you. You keep giving us things we don't want, and, and hanging around a lot. I'm sorry, but it's a huge pain in the ass. And I had just wanted to help. But now Ernie was wound up. It's like you're trying to control us. I know, I know, you think you're being a good guy, but we... And those calls, they're creeping out Sandra. It's best that we go. I gave them a generous severance payout and hired a Mexican couple, undocumented, who desperately needed jobs. It felt good to help them along. The comlink calls. I started taking myself. They came once or twice a week, no visual, and the audio came through a voice changer. Routing was via a private, encrypted satellite system, so there was no chance whatsoever of tracing the calls. I thought at first that they might be from Jane, but this emphatically was not her style. Each call was exactly the same. Barry Tendler. I'm Barry Tendler. Heavy breathing. Finally... I know how you feel. Feel about what? And now the mechanical voice. This isn't supposed to be possible, but I swear I heard it. Hinted at pain. I just want you to know that someone understands. 
Someone in the same position. Look, let me help. And the link ended. What position? Another dwarf? Another unemployed PR flat come manager? Another parent of a kid with major genetic problems? Then I had another mystery because the feds showed up. They proved to be just as elusive as my unknown caller. We'd like to ask you some questions, Mr. Tendler. What about? Do I need my lawyer? No, not at all. These are just general questions, in the public interest. You'd really help us out. I blinked. The HPA usually commands help rather than requests it. And these were not the erection-jawed types who'd interviewed me after Jane's and my visit to the group. These two, a man and a woman, were both short, slightly built, mild in manner, deliberately unthreatening. Why? I was curious. Also bored. So I asked them in. Or maybe it was just to see them both perch uncomfortably on my dwarf-sized living room chairs, their knees rising above the cocktail table like cliff faces from a Himalayan valley. Have you been ill lately, Mr. Tendler? Ill? No. I'm fine. I knew they weren't referring to chronic pain, nor to chronic self-pity, either. No flu-like symptoms? I did have the flu a few months ago, but... Nothing since. I could sense the two of them not looking at each other. What is this about? I asked. I think I'd like to know before I answer any more questions. I wish we could accommodate you, sir, the woman said apologetically. She was maybe five one, pretty, and when she smiled at me, I felt anger swell in my chest. A cheap tactic, if there ever was one. Maybe he'll talk to a woman on his own level. Just one more question, please. It would really help us out. Since March, has anyone from the group tried to contact you? No. If the encrypted calls were from the group, I didn't know it. And the feds weren't going to either. Thank you, Mr. Tendler, she said winningly, and handed me her card. Agent Elaine Brown, Human Protection Agency. Once again... What is this about? Please contact us if anything occurs to you, or if you're contacted by the group, the mail agent said. There's been chatter among our informants. I knew better than to ask what kind of chatter. He'd probably said too much anyway. After they left, I stared at Elaine Brown's card, wondering what the hell that had all been about. Two weeks later, I found out. The whole world found out, but I was first. Another post-midnight phone call, and this time I was not in the mood for it. I'd spent the day at the hospital. Martin, my mahjong-playing cancer patient, died at 4.43 p.m. The only other person there was his elderly mother, who then fell apart. I had done for her what I could which wasn't much, arriving home late at night. Three whiskey and sodas hadn't dulled my sense that the world made no sense. The bedside clock said 2.14 a.m. I snarled at the screen. What? Perry Tendler. It wasn't a question. The screen stayed dark. Look, I'm not in the mood for games tonight, so you can just... Then it hit me that the voice was not mechanical, not masked, a woman's voice. Then somewhere I'd heard it before. Listen to me. This is a matter of life and death for someone you love. Get Jane Snow away to someplace safe and hidden, and do it now, tonight. What the? Who are you? It doesn't matter who I am. Get her away tonight. Why? What's going to? No, don't hang up. You're... Where had I heard that voice? Just go. Goodbye. I had it. You're the woman from the group. In the warehouse basement. To date, 3,214. The only sentence I'd heard her utter. And not even a whole sentence. A fragment. Silence. And, I said, as it all came together in my sleep-deprived brain, 
You're the woman who's been making those masked calls to me. I know how you feel. I just want you to know that someone understands. Someone in the same position. You loved Ishmael. They murdered him! A second later, she'd regained control of herself. That a woman like this lost control at all was a measure of her pain. Grief can drive even the toughest person to acts of insanity. Maybe especially the toughest person. She said, I underestimated you. I didn't say, people usually do, because now fear had my chest gripped tight. She was credible, at least to me. How is Jane in danger? Please tell me. A long pause. And then she said, Why the fuck not? But no one thing, Barry Tendler. You will never find me, and neither will the group. And tomorrow morning it will all be public anyway. Tell me, have you ever heard of oxytorin? No. Did you get ill a few days after your little visit in March to that warehouse? The fear gripped harder. Flu likes him. It wasn't flu. Tell me, have you noticed yourself engaged in unusual behaviors lately? Has Jane? Has anyone else with whom you've exchanged bodily fluids? Especially saliva? I hadn't exchanged bodily fluids, including saliva, with anyone. But all at once, I remembered the pre-meeting searches in the warehouse. A man had checked me over, including opening my mouth and moving aside my tongue. His hands had felt unpleasantly slimy. I was having trouble breathing. What? What is oxytorin? Nothing that will kill you. The group is made up of idealists, remember? Idealists who murder anyone who wanders two inches off the reservation. She laughed, a horrible sound. I know he was dumb and vain, but I loved him. Sneer at that, if you will. Only you won't, will you? Not you. You're just as enslaved by another beautiful moron. And you can't help it any more than I could, can you? Please. What is oxytorin? Her tone lost its anguished cynicism. Relaying factual information steadied her. It's a neuropeptide. A close relative to oxytocin, secreted in the brain and the pituitary gland. Like oxytocin, it has effects on social behavior. Specifically, it promotes nurturing behavior. If you give it to virgin female rats, within 48 hours they're building nests and trying to nurse any baby rats you hand to them. If you remove it from mother rats' brains, they ignore their babies and let them die. The same with monkeys. It nurturing behavior bringing Ernie and Sandra orange juice and remodeling their cottage, visiting hospital patients whom I met by accident, Jane, childless, spending hours and hours with the Barrington twins, has been synthesized synthetically for a long time. But the synthetic version has to be injected directly into the brain. That's not practical when you want to permanently influence a large fraction of the population— so instead, you bastards, it came out a whisper, strangled by rage. The group went with a compound that switches on the genes that create oxytorin receptors. You don't have more oxytorin. You just have more receptors for it. So more of it is actually affecting your brain. Although susceptibility to the gene mod will vary among people. Like, say, susceptibility to cholera depends on blood type. The delivery vector is a retrovirus, capable of penetrating the blood-brain barrier, but which first colonizes mouth and nose secretions. The... You used us. Me and Jane. You. Desired end here is a kinder, gentler populace. Isn't that what we all want? The combination of cynicism and idealism in her words stunned me, because I knew it was absolutely genuine. 
Again, a whisper. You can't. We did. And if the motherfucking leadership had ever taken it themselves, before they decided Harold was a liability. She was sobbing. I didn't care. My throat opened up. I screamed. You can't just fuck around with people's genes without their consent. The sobbing stopped. She said coldly, Why not? You did. She knew. They knew. About Ethan. I'm telling you this because tomorrow morning, the group is putting the story on the link. You and your aging Aphrodite are carriers, and when the press gets hold of that, you'll be inundated, if not lynched. Especially since the group is saying that Jane Snow cooperated, that this is part of her Hollywood liberal left politics. Plenty will believe it, and even if they don't, sensationalism always works best when pegged to a few identifiable people. You should know that. Why are you telling? You don't listen, do you? I already told you why. You're just as fucked as I am. We're alike, you and I, and neither of us ever stood a fucking chance of getting who we wanted. Damn them to hell, all of them. It always comes down to bodies, Munchkin, and yours has been damned twice. So get yourself and her out of town. Now! The link broke. I stood staring at nothing for a full minute. For a lifetime. I wasn't even aware of the body she had just mocked. Only my mind raced. Bodily fluids. Blood. Semen. Saliva. Jane wiping snot from the noses of the Barrington twins. Kissing them. Kissing half of the Hollywood press corps in their touch-touch social rituals. And sleeping with someone? I never asked her. And undoubtedly, we weren't the only two that had been infected. That wouldn't be widespread enough. We were just the two that were going to be publicly named. The weakness of the group's expensive, individually created gene mods for Arlen syndrome had always been the very small number of empathic kids it could create. When Jane had pointed this out, Ishmael had gone into his grandiose ripple analogy, which explained nothing. But somewhere above Ishmael were people far more knowledgeable, more committed, more dangerous. People with a plan, a revolution for society. The group had been waging war with the genomes of children as bullets. Now they had moved up to soma gene engineering, a saturation bombing. Anger is a great heartener. I dressed quickly, put a few things in a bag, and went down to the car. The kind of encryption that my caller had used was not available to me, and so the comlink was too big a risk. The pedal extenders that Ernie had used in the Lexus, and which Carlos didn't need, were still in the trunk. I installed them and drove to Jane's. I have e-codes to the gate and the house. Within an hour, I was at her bedroom door. What if she wasn't alone? Deep breath. I went in. Jane? Don't scream. It's Barry. What? It's Barry. I'm turning on the light. She sat up in bed, wild-eyed. And she wasn't alone. The Barrington twins curled up on the other side of the huge bed, lost in the heavy sleep of childhood, their hair in tangles and drool on their pillows. What the fuck? All at once, my legs gave way. I grasped the edge of the mattress, lowered myself to the floor and so once again had to look up at her. Listen, Janie, this is life and death. We have to leave here. Now. No, don't say anything. Just listen to me for once. Something in my voice, or my ridiculous position, got through to her. She didn't say a word as I told her everything that I'd been told. Her feathery light hair drifted in some air current from the open window, and above the modest blue pajamas she wore for this grandmotherly sleepover, her neck and face turned mottled red, and then dead white. When I finished, I heaved myself to my feet. Pack a bag. Five minutes. And then she spoke. I can't leave the twins. I stared at her. I can't, Barry. Frida and John are in Europe, so the kids are staying with me this week. And anyway, won't they be in danger, too? 
I must have infected them by now. Saliva. Catalina will look after them. She's in Mexico. Her aunt died. I closed my eyes. I knew that look of Jane's. No, I said. I have to. And Frida would want me to. God, they already get death threats every day. When it's public that they can infect others. Nurturing behavior. Virgin rats trying to nurse any baby rats you hand to them. I said, it's kidnapping. It's not. I'll email Frida. One of the girls woke up. She gazed at us from wide, frightened eyes. It was Bridget, the Glinda of the witchy pair. She said in a quavery voice, Don't leave us, Jane. I won't, darling. I wouldn't. Bridget looked so small and so frightened. Then I caught myself. Oxytorin. I barked. No electronics that can be traced. Not phones, not mobiles, not games, not anything. Do those kids have subdermal ID chips? No, Jane said. I could see that she wanted to say more, much more, but not in front of Bridget. Fifteen minutes later, after Jane sent a hasty email to Frida and John Barrington, we drove out the estate gates, heading toward the mountains. When Layla was one month pregnant, the ultrasound looked like any other baby. The same at two, five, and nine months. All fetuses have oversized heads, spindly little arms and legs. When Ethan was born, there was no way to tell he was a dwarf, except by another gene scan. Eighty-five percent of dwarfs are born to average-sized parents, the result not of carrying the dominant gene, but of a mutation during conception. Usually, the parents don't even realize the child will be a dwarf until the baby fails to grow like other children. But we, of course, knew. Ethan would be a dwarf. We engineered him to be a dwarf. Then he was born and scanned. A 20th century religious writer once said that humanity needs the disabled to remind us of the fragility of health and of the power of life and its brokenness. The 19th century mother of the famous Colonel Tom Thumb attributed her son's dwarfism to her grief over the death of the family dog during her pregnancy. Layla and I had no such spiritual consolations, no such explanations for Ethan's lack of dwarfism. The ones that science could offer were vague. Engineering fails. Genes jump. Chromosomes mutate. Accidents happen. Nature asserts herself. I bought the mountain cabin just after Layla left me. I think now that I wasn't quite sane during that awful time. I'd retired from politics and hadn't yet entered show business management. I had nothing to do. There are notebooks I wrote then, in which I talk about suicide, but I have no memory of doing the writing or thinking the thoughts. Eventually, that time passed. I left the cabin and never went back. Years later, I deeded it over to Layla, who would go there sometimes with Ethan when he was small. She told me once, in a rare lapse into civility, that Ethan was happy at the cabin. He chased butterflies, hunted rocks, picked wildflowers. He calmed down up there, and he slept well in the sweet mountain air. Now the twins did the same, falling asleep on the back seat of the Lexus. Still, Jane and I didn't talk. But once she put her hand on the back of my neck, that was a gesture I dreamed about, longed for, would have given ten years of my life for. But not like this. Her touch wasn't sexual, wasn't romantic. It was motherly. We pulled up to the cabin just as the sun rose over the mountains, an hour before the group was scheduled to break its story. Jane's skin goose-fleshed as she opened the car door and the cold dawn air rushed in. I'm going to carry them inside, she said. The first word she's spoken in an hour. They need their sleep. Is the door locked? I have the key. Mundane words. 
normal words, while below us the human race was about to be altered at its core. The cabin, too, was cold. I started the generator, quicker than building a fire, while Jane, puffing a little, carried the girls one at a time into the bedroom. The cabin is small, but it's not primitive or austere. I'm not a fan of either. It has a main room with running water from a deep well, a comfortable bedroom, and a bathroom with full septic system. The original furniture had been sized for me, but evidently Layla had replaced it all. The sofa was hard to climb onto. My legs hurt. Jane emerged from the bedroom after depositing the last twin, closed the door, and sat down on a wing chair across from me. She said quietly, You could have let me drive. I didn't answer. Is there a radio here? There was. A satellite radio. The mountains don't permit much other reception. Where is it? I don't know. I haven't been here for a long time. She got up and began opening cupboards in the kitchenette. The counters and appliances, like the furniture, had been replaced, but no new cabinets built above them. Jane had to squat to peer into shelves. She searched the two closets, one of which had not existed when I owned the cabin, then sat down again. No radio, but a lot of food and equipment. Who uses this place? Again, I didn't answer. Barry, what's our plan? I looked at her then. No makeup, barely combed hair, huddled inside jeans and a green sweater that matched her eyes. She had never looked more beautiful to me. My only plan was to get you away before some angry mob came after you. People aren't going to like that their brains have been fucked with. And you're a natural target, Jane. I know. She smiled wanly. I always have been, for anybody with a grudge. Why do you suppose that is? Because the perception is that you have it all. I meant beauty, talent, success, riches. I meant my heart. She snorted. Oh, right. I have a burnt-out career, four bad marriages, and wrinkles that Botox can't touch. Barry, dear, you look tired. Why don't you lie on the sofa, and I'll make you some warm milk? Don't mother me! It came out a snarl. She looked startled, then angry, then compassionate. Compassionate was the worst. I only meant. That's not you talking. It's the gene mod that the group infected you with. She turned thoughtful, considering this. Contrary to Ms. Resentful's perception, Jane was not stupid. Finally, she said, No, I don't think so because I think I would have reacted the same way, even before all this started. If I saw you tired and discouraged, I'd have offered some comfort anyway. This was true. All at once I saw that this was going to be more complicated than I thought. How could anybody determine which behavior was caused by increased oxytorin receptors, and which was innate? It was the old argument, genes versus free will. Only now it was about to turn incendiary. Jane said, I'm making you that warm milk. But I was asleep before she could bring it to me. I woke to Belinda standing beside the sofa, staring at me flatly. I want to go home. Groggily, I sat up. Everything hurt. Where's Jane? Her and Bridget went for a stupid walk. Take me home. I can't. Not yet. I want to go home. Painfully, I climbed off the sofa and headed to the kitchenette. There was fresh coffee in a brawn on the counter, but I couldn't reach it. Hating every second that Belinda watched me, I dragged a footstool from the fireplace to the counter and hoisted myself onto it. A part of my brain noticed dispassionately that I felt no nurturing impulses toward Belinda when she didn't look more helpless than I felt. The coffee was hot and rich. Good coffee had always been important to Layla. I gulped it down and said, How long ago did they leave on this walk? I don't know. 
She probably did know and wasn't telling me. The brat. I really don't know. So stop thinking I'm a liar. How did she do it? I'd read the literature on Arlen Syndrome. Subconscious processes in Belinda's malevolent little brain were hypersensitive to six non-word signals. Gesture and facial expression. Even very tiny movements in either. Rhythm of movement. Bodily use of space. Objectics such as dress and hairstyle. And what was called paralanguage. Tone of voice. Rate of verbal delivery. Emphasis and inflection. Taken together, they let her read my emotions like a teleprompter, but she was not reading my mind. I had to remind myself of that. Nonetheless, for the first time, I saw the rationale for burning witches at the stake. She said, I don't care if you hate me. I don't hate you, Belinda, said hopelessly. I couldn't hide from her. I hate you, too. I took my coffee outside. Layla hadn't removed the low bench in front of the cabin, from which there was a breathtaking panorama of mountains and valleys, a pristine Eden that, when I'd lived here those nine months, had filled me with despair. Eden is no longer Eden if you've been exiled from it. The ghost of those bad feelings seemed to linger around the bench, but I didn't go back inside. Presently, Jane and Bridget came puffing up the dirt road. Bridget clutching a mess of buttercups and daisies. Hi, Barry, the child said unhappily. She'd been crying. Immediately, I braced myself. And there it was, the soft desire to reassure her, help her, kiss the boo-boo and make it all better. God damn it, to hell. Jane sat on the bench beside me. Go put the flowers in water, Bridget. When she'd gone, I said, we need to know what's happening in L.A. There's a library in Dunhill, at the base of the mountain. If you wrap up your hair and wear sunglasses and, oh, I don't know, act. Do you think you can go in there unnoticed and use the link? I know I can't. She looked at the mountain road, which has no guardrails and, in places, pretty steep fall-offs. Jane doesn't like heights. She said, yes, I can do it. Don't stay long, and don't talk to anybody. Not one word. Your voice is memorable. Only if you'd heard it more recently than ten years ago, and in a better picture than my last one. Should I go now? Again she looked at the road. Before I could answer, the twins started shouting inside the cabin. Jane rose to her feet as the girls raced outside. Bridget cried, Belinda, don't, Belinda said, if you don't take us home this very minute, I'm going to tell everybody that you touched me in my private place, and you'll go to jail forever and ever and ever. No, you will not, young lady, Jane said severely. You just come inside with me this very minute. Belinda looked astonished. Probably, Frida had never spoken to her daughter that way. I reflected that maternal behavior could include discipline. Belinda followed Jane inside. Had Frida felt too intimidated by her daughters to reprimand them? Too proud? Too guilty? Had she been too terrified of what they might in turn say to her? I could imagine any of those scenarios, with a child so different from you, so strange, so eerily knowing. What kind of discipline had Layla given, or not given, to Ethan? Jane returned from Dunhill in a state of restrained anxiety. Nobody, she said, had recognized her at the library. She'd accessed the link, watched the news, hard-copied the headlines. It was all even worse than I'd expected. Bioweapon released in California. Arlen's was only the first step. Now they're spreading mutations. Actress a part of bioconspiracy spreading epidemic. Run on gas masks, riots, cause deaths of four mutants now among us. You could be one. Jane Snow and manager missing since last night. They're calling it treason, Jane said. It is treason, or something. Bioweapon terrorism, invasion of bodily privacy, 
violations of the 14th Amendment, medical malpractice. What next, Barry? I'm not sure. I need to think. But all I could think about was what might have happened if I hadn't gotten Jane away, if Ms. Resentful hadn't called me. Riots caused death of four. And that was without the rioters zeroing in on a specific target. What did the twins do while I was gone? Nothing. They'd played inside and I'd sat outside, pretending they weren't there. Jane went into the cabin. A minute later, she was back. They're making cookies. Fine. Just so long as they don't burn down the cabin. We won't, Bridget said. And there they were beside us, having silently followed Jane. Belinda had a picturesque smudge of chocolate on her nose. I did not think that she looked adorable. Bridget added, Why are you scared, Jane? Jane knew better than to deny. I went down to a town where I could get the news. And some people in L.A. are very angry at another group of people there. It could get violent. Belinda said, But why does that mean we can't go home? Bridget said, they're mad at us, too, aren't they? You're scared for us. Why? We didn't do anything. Belinda said, Don't be stupid, Brid. People get mad at us all the time when we didn't do anything. She looked at me. Like Barry is mad at us. Bridget scowled, making her suddenly look more like her sister. Yeah, why are you mad at us, Barry? Because I didn't want to have to bring you here. But if I hadn't... You might both have been attacked by a mob now. Bridget looked scared, but Belinda said, No, nah, we got really good security at home. Nobody can get through. I want to go home. And I want you to, I said, which was nothing less than total truth. Even as I felt a treacherous desire to comfort little frightened Bridget. Oxytorin. Belinda did not look frightened. She was working up to a towering tantrum. Then take us home! Take us home now! Jane said soothingly, We can't, Belinda. It's not safe. The... It is safe! Daddy's estate is safe! I want to go home! Bridget said with heartbreaking hopelessness, Belinda! Belinda kicked her sister, who screamed and fell to the ground. Then she kicked Jane, who made a grab for her. Belinda was quicker, squirming away. Tears of rage on her grimy face. Don't touch me. Don't you ever touch me. I hate you. You go around feeling sorry for everybody who isn't you. You feel sorry for Barry because he's all twisted and short. And you feel sorry for Brid and me because you think we're so different. Just like you feel sorry for Catalina and the pilot and everybody who's not pretty like you. Well, you're not so pretty anymore either, because you're old, and you know it, and you're scared nobody's going to like you anymore if you're not pretty, and if you don't do that fucking movie about us. And you know what? You're right. Nobody will like you, just like I hate you, because you're old and not pretty anymore, and you'll be alone all the rest of your life, and... Jane stood still, looking dazed, looking stripped naked, but now Bridget was up off the ground and barreling into her sister head first, a battering ram to the belly. Don't you kick me! Belinda screamed, and the two girls went down, rolling in the scrub grass in front of the cabin, punching and pulling hair and scratching. Jane sprang forward, trying to pull them off each other. The sound of a motor made her and me freeze. And Layla's car roared into sight and jerked to a stop, with her and Ethan inside. Empathy means you understand another's feelings. It doesn't mean you sympathize with them or respect them. Hitler's brilliant propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, understood perfectly what the German people were feeling in the 1920s and 30s. Insecurity, rage, fear, resentment at the punishments for World War I. He used that knowledge to manipulate their emotions, creating the brilliant PR campaigns that put Hitler in power and kept him there. The group must have realized too late that Arlen Syndrome was not, after all, a guarantee that the world would change for the better. 
So they created the virus that increases oxytorin receptors, correcting a genetic engineering change with another genetic engineering change. I could have told them that does not work. Ethan got out of the car first, from the passenger side. Both Bridget and Belinda stopped fighting, got up off the ground and stared. Ethan's right eye was blackened, and his left arm was in a sling. He scowled ferociously at them, at me, at the world. He was utterly beautiful. Auburn hair falling over his forehead, blue eyes, a body that Michelangelo could have used as the model for his David. More than that, Ethan had the same quality that Jane did, an innate and unconscious sexuality so blatant that it was like a slap in the face. A challenge. Come and get me, if you can. His photos had not captured that quality. Bridget and Belinda were eleven years old, and yet I saw that they felt it. Bridget blushing and looking confused. Belinda scowling back, but with surprise behind her gray eyes. Jane's back was to me. Layla got out of the car and called desperately, Ethan! He ignored her and kept walking. It was me he was moving toward. I stood up from my bench, my heart hammering. Ethan stopped in front of me. I came up to slightly higher than his waist. You're my father, he said, with utter contempt. You! Layla was running from the car, but Jane was closer. She threw herself between us, just as Ethan's fist shot out, and the blow intended for my face hit her in the chest. I don't think any of her ribs are broken, Layla said wearily. She said it doesn't hurt when she breathes, which is a good sign. Layla and I sat in her car, a three-year-old Ford, each of us holding steaming mugs of fresh coffee. Mine trembled in numb fingers. Jane slept, courtesy of a pain patch in the bedroom. The twins, subdued now, had been ordered back to their cookie-making, and had actually gone. Ethan had stalked away into the woods, and I was sickened to realize that I hoped he'd stay away. I was afraid of my son. Layla, I didn't realize. I know you'd said, but, of course... Behavior is a complex genetic and environmental phenomenon, and when you interfere with, don't. Don't go informational and theoretical on me like you always do. Just don't. All right. She turned her face to look at me. That's the first time I think you've actually heard me when I've said that. Maybe it was. Information and theory were good hiding places. And... Ethan gets like this, unpredictably. The psychologist says he has poor impulse control. When he gets upset, there's a major neural hijacking. You've seen the brain scans with all the irregularities in his amygdalas and hippocampus. He gets swamped with rage, and sometimes he can't even remember what he's done. Not always, but sometimes. And you've dealt with this alone for since he was a toddler. But you knew all this, Barry. I told you. She had. But I hadn't really heard her. Hadn't wanted to hear her. I'd preferred to blame her, as she blamed me. Layla continued. When he comes back from the woods, he'll be different. Until the next time. But now that he's old enough to run away, and looking like he does... She didn't have to finish the sentence. I knew what L.A. could be for a 15-year-old who looked like Ethan. I said, Did you two just happen to come up here today? No. Jane called me. I spilled my coffee. Jane? Yes. She did what you should have done. Now Layla's anger was back. Anger and blame. Or didn't you bother to think that Ethan might be in danger once the witch hunt down there fingered you? Which it has, by the way, according to the car radio while I could still get reception on the way up here. Didn't you bother to think that your son might make a good substitute target? 
I didn't think anyone would trace you and Ethan to me. Jane obviously did, and probably used a private detective to do it. How long ago? Why? I'm sorry, Layla. I didn't think you'd be in any danger. I didn't think the media... I stopped. She knew what I meant. However nasty the daily world is to dwarfs, there is only one official story about us allowed in mainstream media. That's the happy talk, big hearts and little body slant. Dwarfs making good, doing good, being good. Thus is the daily nastiness offset and balance restored to the universe. That the media in L.A. had now abandoned the formula was a strong measure of how much fear the group had engineered along with their virus. I said, this whole thing. God knows I didn't want these twins here either. Where are their parents? Or are you guilty of kidnapping along with everything else? Yes. No. Their parents know the kids are here. They're on their way home from Europe. The Barrington twins of all kids. God, Barry, you really can screw up royally. Like I needed to be told that. But I pushed down my anger. This was maybe the only chance I was going to get. And I had to say it right. Listen, Layla. I want to say something. I know I've been negligent, and I know that Ethan is... I know I had a lot to do with this because of what I insisted on before he was born. But I want to say three things, and I want you to really consider them. You don't have to, but I'd really like it if you would. First, what I said before is true. Even though I picked a stupid time to say it, Behavior is genetically complex, and Ethan's problems, his brain irregularities, could have happened, even if I hadn't insisted on the in utero gene mod. We'll never know. Layla made a sudden motion, but I kept on, afraid to stop. Second, just consider, please consider, that I tried to help with Ethan, and you pushed me away. You were so angry that you... I don't say you weren't justified, but you did push me away and left me and refused to let me see him. And I think it's unfair that I then get blamed for not seeing him. I wasn't, she said hotly. I put my hand on her arm. Please, just one more thing. It's not too late. I want to help, want to do whatever I can, whatever you and he will let me do. If we can get past this anger at each other, finally, and cooperate, that has to be better for Ethan. She shook my hand off her arm, but she didn't get out of the car. We sat in silence for a few minutes. I held my breath. Finally, Layla spoke in a different voice. I don't know if I can. I've hated you for so long. I think... I think I might need to hate you in order to go on. I knew enough to be quiet. Oh, God, I don't want to be that person, Layla cried. Barry! I know, I said. I don't want to be the person I am either. She blindsided me then. Do you love her very much? Only honesty would do now. Yes. I'm seeing somebody, Layla said. That's part of why Ethan's so angry. He hasn't ever had to share me. I'm glad for you, Layla. But I had to ask. Is he a dwarf? Yes. We met last year at the LPA convention. He lives in Oregon. He's in insurance. She was smiling, despite herself. I found myself hoping that it worked out for her. She deserved a little insurance. But then, didn't we all? I didn't get a chance to tell you before, Layla said. I brought a satellite TV. It's in the trunk. Riots had started in south-central L.A., Ostensibly, the mutation plague, which was what the media was calling the group's virus, was the cause of the riots, but they quickly took on life of their own, 
with all the usual looting, car burning, rock throwing. The LAPD used microwaves and tangle foam on the rioters, who then regrouped at different locations and started over again. The press, having been the actual cause of the turmoil with its inflamed reporting, now took on its next role in the inevitable sequence, which was the voice of reason, trying to calm things down. Talking heads appeared on TV, on the link, on wall screens, in hollows projected over the city. They explained that the virus was not airborne, needed contact with bodily fluids to survive, and did not cause cancer or suicide or nerve decay or zombieism. Nobody listened. A rumor started that the group leadership was headquartered in a warehouse by the waterfront. A mob torched it, and strong winds carried the fire westward. The governor ordered out the National Guard. Kill the mutant makers, said the improvised placards. Jane was hung in effigy. Frida and John Barrington landed at LAX and were besieged by robocams. Jane's picture with the twins had been everywhere in recent weeks. Their flyer finally took off, but airspace over the city had been shut down, and the flyer returned to the airport. By nightfall, the rioting had subsided, damped down by rumors that muties were secretly roaming the street, infecting everyone. People fled inside. In several hours of watching the link, not once did I hear a single reporter or avatar refer to what the virus actually did, increase the desire to nurture. People cared that they had been fucked with, not how. That was the part of the whole reaction that I most understood. Barry, Jane said, come eat something. She and Layla had prepared a meal from the canned goods in the cabin. Layla had made a fire in the fireplace. Ethan, who had returned sullen from the woods and stayed sullen ever since, sat at the table with the twins. He'd spent most of the afternoon outside, smoking God knows what, while the twins circled him like disintegrating stars around a black hole. Bridget seemed afraid to speak to him at all, but Belinda and he had several long, low conversations, during which Ethan scowled a lot. Layla and Jane moved back and forth between table and kitchen, elaborately and artificially polite to each other. I didn't need Bridget or Belinda to tell me what everybody felt. Nobody wanted to be here with these other five people, and there was nowhere else any of us could go. Barry, Jane said again. Belinda said, He doesn't like you to act like his mother. I said, Shut up, kid, or you'll wish you had. Bridget, wide-eyed, said, He means it, Belinda. She shut up, glaring at me. Layla glanced my way, puzzled. Ethan raised his head, and I would have given anything for just one moment of Arlen syndrome so I could tell what my son was thinking then. Bridget said, I don't like it here with you guys. Her eyes welled, and immediately Jane's arms went around her. It's okay, Bridget. You girls are just tired. I think you should go to bed right after you eat, sweetheart. Everything will look better in the morning. Oxytorin. I was too tired to think straight. But one sentence from Ms. Resentful came back to me. Susceptibility to the gene mod will vary among people. Like, say, susceptibility to cholera depends on blood type. I'd seen no susceptibility to increased nurturing from Belinda. As she watched Jane hug Bridget, Belinda's look could have withered a cactus. Layla produced three sleeping bags from the closet that hadn't existed when I'd been here last. The twins were bedded down on the floor of the bedroom. Ethan disdained to so much as glance at his bag, which was laid out in a corner of the living room. Jane and Layla would share the bed. I got the couch. Ethan and I were the last to go to sleep. I lay on the lumpy sofa, all lights off except for a dim glow where Ethan sat watching something inane on the satellite TV. His beautiful, beautiful face. How had Layla and I created such beauty? 
lost its sulky look and relaxed into the smile of a normal 15-year-old. Normal, a word dwarfs don't like and seldom use. For good reason. But this was my son, and so I made one more attempt to reach him. What are you watching? Nothing. The scowl was back. It angered me. Obviously it's not nothing, or you wouldn't be watching it. So what is it? Don't pull that logic crap on me, Ethan said. I don't know you. And then, although did even he hesitate before he said it? I thought so, or else I wanted to think so. Crippled little munchkin. We stared at each other across the dim room. Then I rolled over, wrapped myself in my blanket and my pain, and tried to sleep. Some unknowable time later, Jane was shaking me by the shoulder. Barry, Barry, wake up. Belinda is gone. I jerked upright and looked at the sleeping bag by the cold fireplace. The bag was empty. My mind went cold and clear. See if both cars are here. Of course, they weren't. My Lexus was gone. He doesn't even have a driver's permit, Layla said. She was driving. My legs ached too much. I had made Jane stay with Bridget, who was still asleep. Layla drove slowly in the dark, and as we passed the places where the mountain road dropped off sheerly, she shuddered, but her hands on the wheel didn't falter. This wasn't the teenage dwarf I had married, the girl dancing exuberantly at the LPA convention, the young bride who had blindly accepted my arrogant authority. I thought he understood how dangerous it would be to go back home, Layla said. I thought he understood. He did. That's why he's going. She glanced over at me, then returned to her driving, her endless scanning of the roadside. Was that a break in the bushes? Had a car gone off there? Was that a skid mark in the headlights? She said, no, that's not why. It's that girl, Belinda. She wants to go home, and I saw her whispering to him all afternoon, and I should have realized. But he doesn't like children, and she's only eleven. I didn't think she could influence him. Layla was right. I should have anticipated this. I'd seen far more of Belinda than Layla had. Belinda would have known exactly what Ethan was feeling, exactly how to play on his weak spots. She didn't even have to think about it, merely let her instincts take over. Empathy in action. Barry, he's not a bad kid underneath. He can be very sweet sometimes. You've never seen that. I believe you, I said, wondering if I did. And the other times, well, he can't help it, can he? It's in his genes. No, it's not! The intensity of her anger surprised me, even as she kept on scanning, looking, dreading what she might see. You attribute everything to genes. It's not true. Genes made you a dwarf, and you think that's wrecked your life. But genes didn't make you so bitter and unhappy. I know that because when we met, you weren't bitter and unhappy, and you were a dwarf then, too. I didn't want Ethan around your self-created misery. I still don't. And maybe he does have some predisposition to danger and anger and impulsiveness, like the doctors say. But he doesn't have to indulge it. He chooses to do that, just like you choose to be miserable and envious. Layla, there's so much wrong with that simplistic analysis that I don't even know where to start correcting it. Then don't! I don't need your corrections. You can't. What's that? I saw it a second after she did. The Lexus smashed headfirst against a tree, which was the only thing that had kept it from going over the embankment. Layla, younger and with less spinal constriction, was first out of the Ford, running toward the car, uttering loud, wordless cries. I followed her stumbling as my treacherous legs collapsed under me, getting up, trying again to run. Those were the longest seconds, minutes, hours, eons of my life, until I reached 
That car. They were both alive. Belinda seemed unhurt, mewling in her seatbelt. Ethan, who had taken the brunt of the crash, had he turned the wheel at the last minute to save the little girl? Slumped unconscious against the steering wheel. Blood trickled through his bright hair. Don't move him, Layla said frantically. If anything's broken, I'm going for help. She ran back to her Ford. I undid Belinda's seatbelt, yanked her out, and dropped her on the dark roadside weeds. I could feel her fear, just as she could feel my fury. She shrank back against the fender. I climbed into the passenger seat beside my son. He stirred. Mommy. She'll be here soon, Ethan. Help will be here soon. He said something else before sliding again into unconsciousness. It might have been, fuck you. Maybe no child, other than those with Arlen syndrome, understands how a parent feels. Maybe I hadn't earned the right to even be considered a parent. Maybe, as Layla said, my bitterness and anger would be worse for Ethan than if I weren't there at all for him. I don't know, any more than I know any more what's genetic and what's not. Did Jane go all maternal with the twins because she had more oxytorin receptors? Or did the group's virus make her a good candidate for growing more oxytorin receptors? Because she always had a penchant for wounded birds anyway. Susceptibility to the gene mod will vary among people. In the darkness, I sat for a long time beside my injured son. Finally... With great deliberation, I spat on my fingers and gently, gently pushed them inside his mouth. I felt the softness of his slack tongue, his strong young teeth. Strong teeth, strong, long bones. He was not a dwarf. I spat a second time on my hand and did it again. Overhead, medical and police flyers droned in the dark night. When they arrived, I borrowed a cell phone and comlinked to Lane Brown, Human Protection Agency. A week later, I sit in a temporary government quarantine facility in San Diego, watching TV. On the other side of the negative pressure barriers, researchers from the United States Army Research Institute for Infectious Diseases dressed in level four biohazard suits, go through two airlocks to reach Jane and me. The Barrington twins are here too, but not Layla or Ethan. Ethan is in a hospital in L.A., and she is with him, along with her boyfriend from Oregon. He flew down immediately to be with her. They treat us well here. There are endless medical tests, of course, but I'm used to that. Everyone is both respectful and curious. If they're all so frightened, I don't sense it. But of course Bridget and Belinda do. Bridget is a favorite with the staff. Belinda wants to go home, although she likes all the attention from Jane. The twins' parents visit via link several times each day. Frida sometimes has a distinct look of relief. Her kids are behind glass, and she can break the link with Belinda whenever she needs to. The link has brought the most attention to Jane. Death threats, pleas for help, fan letters, offers from the ACLU to sue the group if any members of that organization can be found, which so far they haven't. Jane would be a high-profile and appealing case. The movie is on again, but not with the same script, or even with the same studio. There's another chapter now to the Arlen Syndrome story, and Jane has become an actor in that saga, in both senses of the word. The whole thing looks like box office gold. Jane is not unhappy. If that's not exactly the same thing as being happy, it seems to do. The link is also how I visit with Ethan. He had three broken ribs and a damaged spleen, which seems to be repairing itself without surgery. Youthful spleen can do that. We gaze at each other and sometimes he's sullen, and sometimes I'm impatient. 
and sometimes he sees me shift on my spine in chronic pain. Or maybe he catches a sadness in my eyes. At such times, his expression softens. So does his voice. He'll ask if I'm okay. When he asks, I am. Is it wrong to genetically modify human beings? First, I thought it was, when I tried to alter Ethan's FGFR3 gene in utero. Then I thought it wasn't, seeing both Ethan and the Arlen Syndrome kids. Now, I don't know again. There's still panic out there about the group's virus, and the virus is still spreading, and eventually it may, or may not, make enough of society more nurturing. In turn, that may, or may not, change society. If enough people are susceptible, if feelings of compassion actually translate into actions of compassion, if the weather holds and the creek don't rise and seven or eleven comes up enough on the dice, this is barely act one, scene one of whatever comes next. Chaos theory tells us that, in a system of circular feedback, a small change in initial conditions can cause huge and unpredictable changes down the road. Human behavior is a system of circular feedback. Is Ethan more compassionate toward me because he's growing more oxytorin receptors, or because I'm more open to his and everyone else's compassion? How did the same gene mod for empathy produce both Bridget and Belinda? I have no idea. And to tell the truth, I don't really care. I'm supposed to care, ethically and pragmatically. But I don't. Jane comes into the room and says, Guess what? The studio was getting Michael Rosen to write the script. Michael Rosen? It's sure to be terrific. I smile back. Michael Rosen is indeed a terrific writer, a creator of sensitive and layered scripts that both challenge audiences and fill seats. He's also a handsome womanizer, and Jane is looking more beautiful than ever. I know what will happen. That's good, I say. Congratulations. The movie will be a smash. Thanks to you. She smiles at me and goes out again. Nothing has changed. Everything has changed. I turn to my computer and get back to work. Twilight of the Gods John C. Wright John C. Wright attracted some attention in the late 1990s with his early stories in Asimov science fiction, with one of them, Guest Law, being picked up for David Hartwell's Year's Best SF. But it wasn't until he published his Golden Age trilogy, consisting of The Golden Age, The Golden Transcendence, and The Phoenix Exultant, in the first few years of the new century, novels that earned critical raves across the board, that he was recognized as a major new talent in SF. Subsequent novels include the Everness fantasy series, including The Last Guardians of Everness and Mists of Everness, and the fantasy Chaos series, which includes Fugitives of Chaos, Orphans of Chaos, and Titans of Chaos. His most recent novel, a continuation of the famous Null A series by A. E. Van Vaught, is Null A Continuum. Wright lives with his family in Centerville, Virginia. Here, he delivers a rousing space-age take on Wagner's Ring of the Nibelungen, which performs the trick of writing valid science fiction that reads like epic fantasy, as well as anyone has ever done it. Tall golden doors loomed up behind the dais of the throne. Behind those doors, it was said, the main bridge of the Twilight of the Gods reposed, a chamber dim and vast, with many altars studded all with jeweled controls set before the dark mirrors of the computer. But acting Captain Weston II found the chamber oppressive, 
and did not like the mysterious dark mirrors of the computer watching him. And so, since his father's death many years ago, this white high chamber before the golden doors was used as his hall of audience. The chamber was paved in squares of golden white, with pillars of gold spaced along white walls. Hanging between the pillars were portraits of scenes from somewhere in the ship the captain had never seen. Fields of green plants, some taller than a man, growing, for some reason, along the deck rather than in shelves along the walls. In the pictures, the deck was buckled and broken, rising and falling in round slopes, perhaps due to damage from a weapon of the enemy, with major leaks running across it. The scenes took place in some holder bay, larger than any acting Captain Weston II had seen or could imagine. The overhead bulkhead was painted light blue, some sort of white disruption like steam clouds floating against it. In many pictures, the blue overhead was ruptured by a large yellow, many-rayed circular explosion, perhaps, again, of a weapon. In most pictures were sheep or other animals and young crewmen and women out of uniform, blissfully ignoring the explosion overhead and doing nothing to stop the huge leaks, one of which had ducks swimming in it. Acting Captain Weston II found the picture soothing, but disturbing. He often wondered if the artist had been trying to show how frail and foolish men are, that they will trip lightly through their little lives without a thought to the explosions and disasters all about them. Perhaps he preferred this chamber for that reason. What the original use and name of this chamber had been in days gone past, no man of the captain's court could tell, not even his withered and aged computer man. The chamber now was bare, except that the computer man approached the throne, and it knelt to Weston. My lord, he said. His face was worn and haggard, his garb simple rough and belted with a hank of rope. The computer man's eyes showed red and staring, a certain sign of the many long night watches he had spent writhing in the grip of the holy drug, which allowed his brethren to commune with the computer. Why do you come unbidden unto me? Weston asked sternly. I know you will wait another. The computer man replied, it is to warn you against that other, that I am come. The acting captain raised his hand, but the computer man said swiftly, Bid me not to go, unless you would not heed the will of the computer in this thing. The computer which knows all, indeed, even things most secret and shameful. The captain had a troubled look upon his face, and sat back with one hand clutching the front of his jeweled coat, as if to hide something behind his hand. Something, perhaps, on a necklace hidden beneath his tunic. What shame, he said. Every child knows the story of the Ring of Last Command, the computer man said. Of how, when the sixth barrage destroyed the lights and power of the second hundred decks, and weapon of the enemy opened the great chasm in the hull, reaching from the stars below almost to the thousandth deck. The first Captain Valdemar capitulated to the enemy and allowed a boarding party to come in from the void below the hull. Decks 300 through 770 rebelled and followed Bright Alvarin into battle against the traitor captain. But the captain was not found, and his ring of final command was lost. The ring, they say, can waken the computers all again, then send the weapons of the twilight down into the void. Children's fairy tales, the captain said. Yet, I deem. They tempt you, the computer man said. The captain was silent. This prisoner which the giant brings. He had a ring inscribed with circuits, did he not? 
a ring which matches the descriptions of the command ring? You dream of learning the secret word which controls that ring, and of conquering the world, of driving back the tall elves from decks above, where they fly and know no weight, and compelling the twisted dwarves from engineering to obedience to your reign. And one day, who knows, you think you will drive forth the destroyers and the servants of the enemy who infest the many anti-spinward decks and hurl them down into the void from whence they came. You dream a dream of vile pride. You are corrupted with temptation. The captain rose angrily from his throne. Stop. Do you think your holy office will protect you from my wrath? Were there such a ring as legends say, for certain I would seize it to my own. And who would dare deny me? You? You? But the computer man bowed in all humility and said, My lord knows there can be no such ring. A ring to waken the computers. Indeed. Our faith informs us that the computers do not sleep, that their screens are not dark, not to eyes that keep the faith. I and my brethren commune with the computers each night watch, and it gives us secret knowledge. My father told me the computer screens once were bright to every eye, and a voice like a man's voice spoke from them. Every man, even the humblest, could hear that voice. Before the fifth barrage, in his youth, he had seen them shining and heard the voice. Men knew less sin in those days, my lord. At that moment came a noise at the doors before them. Not the golden doors of the bridge, but the silver doors leading to the outer part of the palace and to the corridors and warrens of the great city of Forcomcon. The silver doors swept wide. Here were twenty pikemen of the Gatewatch, dressed in blue and silver, and here, garbed hugely in the gray-green of the ancient order of marines, strode in the giant, the giant's shoulder was taller than a tall man's head, but his hair and beard were white with age, for he was the last of his kind, born to serve as a marine, created by the lost arts of the medical house, back when the twilight was young. His name was Caradoc. In one hand, Caradoc held a mighty weapon like a spear, made by ancient and forgotten arts. The weapon could shoot bullets like a musket, except that it could fire many at a time. Yet the bullets were slow, and would not pierce the bulkheads or damage the equipment, and so the weapon was lawful according to the weapon's law. In Caradoc's other hand was a chain. Bound by that chain, manacled and fettered, was a strange dark man, wearing a uniform of silver-white unlike any uniform known to Weston's lore. The man had pale hair like an upper-deck elf, and like them he was tall, but he was darkened and scarred by radiation, like the dwarves of engineering, or like those who live near the great chasm, the lesser chasm, or the hole, or near any other place the weapons of the enemy had blown up through the world. He was muscled like a down-deck dwarf, with thicker muscles than Weston had ever seen, except perhaps for those on Caradoc. The gatewatch lieutenant spoke up out of turn, coming forward and saying, My lord, I pray you, let not this man alone in audience with you. He has the strength of three men. Then let him be bound with three men's chains. But I will speak alone to him. The prisoner in silver white stood, face calm, staring at the captain. His face was still, his demeanor quiet. He seemed neither proud nor humble, but he stood like a man surrounded by a great silent open space, wherein nothing could be hidden from him, nor anything approached to harm him. When he did not kneel, the gatewatch pikemen struck him in the back of his knees with the butts of their spears, but the muscles of the prisoner's legs were strong and did not bend when struck. Three of the gate watch put their hands on his shoulders to force him down. The prisoner watched them calmly, but would not budge. 
Leave him stand, the captain ordered. The men stepped back. Then the captain said, Where are his wounds? He has no new scars. I ordered him put to torment. Bring forth the apprentice torturer. But the lieutenant said, Sire, the apprentice torturer fled after you ordered the master torturer tortured to death. After, none of the lesser torturers would approach this prisoner. They refused to obey your order. The computer man was still standing near the throne. He leaned forward and whispered, Sire, why did you order the master torturer put to the question? I guess this. This prisoner told you that he had told the master torturer the words which command the ring. The master torturer denied it. You conceived a jealous suspicion and feared the master torturer craved the ring and knew the word. Do I guess all right? The captain stood. Leave me, all of you, except my giant. Leave me. You as well, computer man. The lieutenant said, Sire, shall we bring the other prisoner in now as well? The blind man we found wandering the inner corridor? What care I for wandering beggars? Leave me, all. But the computer man would not leave until the gate watch came to drag him away. The computer man was shouting, Beware the thing you covet. Beware. It is a thing accursed. All who do not possess it will crave it. It will drive you to madness. It will drive you to destroy your trusted servants, as you have destroyed your torturer. Just chew this thing. Cast it away. The computer cannot be controlled by it. But by then, the gate watch had gently pulled the old man out of the chamber and closed the door behind them. Acting Captain Weston II sat upon his throne again and bent his gaze upon the dark, scarred man before him. The man did not fidget or stir, but stood, calm and silent, and the giant stood waiting behind him. Speak, ordered Weston. The man said, I have nothing more to say. His voice was soft and pleasant to the ear. The old code requires you to speak to a superior officer. What is your name and station, rank and duty? I am Henwis, son of Himdal. I come from Starwell. My rank is watchman. I am come to report to the true captain. There are no watchmen. The order is defunct. After the boarding by the enemy, all the outer hull was laid to waste. No, you are no watchman. You have the look of an aftman farmer about you. I was not born a watchman. Indeed, I was born a farmer. My village is called Aftshir, in the secondary engine corps, near the Axis, where the world has no weight. My youth was spent tending the many plants and green growing things from whence come our air and life. But I was captured by the enemy, and for a time was a slave. I escaped and fled below decks, where every step is a crushing weight, and the air is poisoned by the radiations of the seventh barrage. The servants of the enemy feared the radiation and could not tolerate the weight and did not pursue me. Crawling, I went still lower, till I was nearly crushed. Then I came upon a place where nothing was below me, except for the stars. There I was found by Himdal last of all watchmen, in the midst of a deserted place and empty corridors, a chamber lit and filled with sweet air, although surrounded by darkness and poison on every side. Himdal nursed me back to health, and taught to me his art, and showed to me the star well, at whose deep bottom the stars underfoot turn and turn again. And I became a watchman in truth, and was adopted as his son. And for long years I kept watch on the enemy stars and saw the slow grave motions. Weston asked, And do you believe the heresy which says the stars which move are not mere colored lights, but the ships from which the enemy in ancient times came forth? I do. 
and yet among those lights, our four ships friendly to our own, sent out as we were in ages past. From Earth, their names I think you know, the Gotterdammerung, the Apocalypse, the Armageddon, and the Ragnarok. Weston stirred uneasily upon his throne. I tell you, the original captain betrayed the crew and fled. This happened when my father was a boy. He was acting captain. Now I am the acting captain. By what right do you call yourself so? Weston shouted angrily. By right of blood succession. Then he was quiet, and he said quietly, You may give any report you must give to me. Very well, said Henwas Watchman. And he recited all he had said when first he had been brought before Weston. The eighth barrage, which has been approaching for so many years, has turned aside and seeks now to strike the Armageddon. The missiles and small ships of that barrage shall smite their target starting twelve years hence, with a bombardment lasting a year or two, peaking fourteen years hence, and diminishing thereafter. We shall not be struck by it. Presumably, the masters of enemy now know we were boarded by the sixty armies from the landing party from the dreadnought, Kazal Karangakai, which, in our speech, is named the Hungry Indeed for Battle. I further report that our escort ships, the Revenge and the Vendetta, were destroyed between thirteen and seven years ago by picket ships launched from the Tizal Zalkiorum, which, in our speech, is named Ready to Do Grave Harm. This ship is presently four light minutes off our port bow, where it has remained for seventy years no doubt waiting to see if it must render aid to the Kazal Karang Akai. Yet the main sweep of the destroyer fleet has passed beyond us and done us no hurt. We are in the midst of some eighty dreadnoughts and four motel planets. Their crown ships are within eight light minutes of us now, and have not maneuvered to avoid us by a further distance. Asteroids from the shattered planet called Warstorm are all about us in each direction, and perhaps hide us from the main body of the enemy, and from the crown ships, which take no heed of us, but proceed against the Armageddon and the Gotterdammerung. Of the apocalypse there has been no sign for thirty years. The Ragnarok is hidden by a great light. Either she maneuvers, or she is in full retreat. The captain was sarcastic. And you believe all this? That the fate of our world depends on the motions of these little colored lights? I have one thing further to report. The escort ship, Hermes Trismegistus, out from the Gotterdammerung, has entered an orbit of the enemy planet called Promise of Destruction. She maneuvers without any flare, and will not be seen by the enemy. The orbit will carry the Hermes Trismegistus to us before the decade ends. It is a rescue ship. When the officers from the Hermes come aboard, power and light will be restored to all sections. The wounded and the poisoned will be healed by their knowledge, and those who have not kept faith will be punished. If you have been disobedient, you will be taken before the court-martial. The captain sneered. My nurse! when I was but a babe, would terrify me with tales of the court-martial and the day of judgment that would come when the earthmen would come up from heaven underfoot. But you shall not live long enough to find the truth of these things, unless the medicine of the earthmen know how to resurrect the dead. The watchman said simply, I have lived near the radiations of the outer hull. I have the disease. I know the hour of my death is not far off. Why else would I be willing to bear the cursed ring? Weston drew on a chain around his neck. Up from inside his jeweled coat he drew out the ring. It was gold, inscribed with delicate circuitry, and set with gray stone. In the middle of the stone gleamed a strange light, which showed that the power of the ring still lived. 
Tell me the word which commands this ring. I may only tell the captain. I am captain. I am he. There is no Captain Valdemar. He is myth. Even were there such a man, he would be long dead. A hundred years or more gone by. I am the true captain. A true captain would use the power, not for himself, but to complete the mission, and discharge the great weapons the story say our world carries at its axis. The watchman said softly, And if that were my intention? Then you would not have chained me, said the watchman, rattling his manacles. The captain sat until he felt his anger cool within him. Then he spoke in a voice most reasonable and even. Watchman, if I could persuade you that there are no worlds hanging in the void beneath our world, no dreadnoughts of the enemy, no war, except for the wars fought with the enemy aboard our ship, between here and Midline Darkhall, and spinward toward the Lesser Chasm. But then, if there is no world outside our world, no weapons to fire, what reason have you then to withhold from me the ring of final command? No reason, said the watchman. If there were no worlds below our feet, I would give the ring's commands to you. Then reckon this, if you are right, and there is a war in space below us, then this ship and all aboard were sent into that war to fight, perhaps to die, all in order to defend the ship called Earth from our great enemy. Earth is not a ship. It is a planet. Earth is inside out, for the crew there live on the outer hull, and their air is outward from them. On Earth, gravity is backwards and draws them toward their axis, so that they stand with their feet on the hull, with their heads looking down toward the stars. Be that as it may, the Earthmen sent these great ships far out into space to fight their wars. Not so? This they did with all wisdom and intention, knowing that even the swiftest flight across the void would take generations. Not so? It is so. I ask you then, in all candor, how could this be? Who but a madman would dispatch his armies to fight across the void, sending them to battlefields so far that the grandchildren of those sent out would be the only soldiers on the field? I know not. Yet it was done. Leaving us ignorant of all? No one has even seen the enemy stars, nor do we know them. How have we become so ignorant so soon? My master said once that the computer spoke to all the children and instructed them. When the computer fell silent, there were no written things aboard with which to teach the children. Much was lost. More was lost in the confusion of the wars and darkenings. What we know, we know by spoken lore. But in the past, all men knew the priestly arts and could read the signs. Weston waved his hand impatiently, as if this were nothing to the point. Heed me. I tell you, I have led men into battle, not once, but many times, both against the rebel elves of Alvarin and against the enemy. Will you take me at my word, that no battle could be fought, nor any force commanded, unless the soldiers are willing to die for one another, or for their home corridors? I believe it. Now then. Who aboard this ship is willing to die for Earth, which no one has ever seen, or is willing to die for those aboard the other ships of which myths speak, the Goddardamerung or the Apocalypse? Are the crews and peoples of those mythic worlds willing to die for us? If so, why? Perhaps their great-grandfathers knew our great-grandfathers back when Earth first made us. But who knows them now? Do you see? Wars over such length of time cannot be possible. But the watchman said, The medicine of those times past was much greater than our own, and men expected lives many hundreds of years in length, due to things they had put inside their bodies, things we do not have, and cannot make with our scant arts. To the immortals, wars, no matter how long, are done with swiftly. The captain knew a moment of doubt. His gaze rested on his giant, 
a man made huge and strong by arts the captain knew had been lost. He also knew the old tales, which said that, before the medical house was destroyed during the second barrage, all officers were young and ageless, able to see in the dark like cats, strong as dwarves, and instantly cured of any wound, poison, or hurt. Even were there such a war, the captain slowly said, if we are, as you say, deep in the ranks of the enemy, overlooked and ignored, to fire our weapons now would mean the destruction of this world, if not now, then in the time of our children. At that moment came a great commotion at the silver doors, a sound of trumpets and alarms. There came a banging at the doors, and the lieutenant rushed in, his sword drawn. Sire, called the lieutenant, the rebels from above decks attack in great force. Alvarin himself leads them. Already he has been struck by a dozen arrows. Each time he plucks them forth and laughs. The men, the men are saying he is an earth man. Rally the men. Draw down the great doors at Spinhole Common Fork and at the under road. Flood the stairwells leading to deck 836 with oil. Then, withdraw the men behind the great barrier wall and close the high gate. Use hand pumps to withdraw some part of the air from the circular approach corridor. This will seal all door beyond the power of any battering ram to breach. But if he brings unlawful weapons? Explosives? Fool. Alvarin has never broken the weapon law. Never cheated a treaty. Never lied. Why do you think his rebellion does so poorly? They must be mad things to attack us now. Will you come to lead us? Presently. First I must do otherwise. Go! And when the man had left, Weston said to the watchman Henwes, With this ring, I could call upon the computer to close and open doors at will, extinguish lights, drain corridors of air. Tell me the words! But Henwes said, you did not think to hide the ring when your lieutenant entered here. He saw it. If he craves its power as much as you, he will be gathering men to lead against you here, to seize the ring. There is no more time for talk. Say the words, or I will order my giant to snap you like a wire. You cannot escape the curse of the ring. Whoever does not have the ring craves to have it. So my master Himdal was told by the strange blind man who gave it first to him. Strange blind man? Perhaps he thought the curse would be alleviated if the ring were given to so remote a hermit as my master. And did your master say what this man's appearance was? Many times, for he was most peculiar. The wanderer, he wore his hair long, like those of the lower decks, but walked with a staff, like an upper deck man, not used to our weight. He wore a wide-brimmed hat, like the men of the greenhouses, where the light controls never dim their fierce glare. But he wore cusps of black glass before his eyes, like a darklander out here where lights still glow. On each shoulder he carried a bird, like men who walk in fear of poison corridors, who, when they see their pets keel over, flee. Caradoc, go tell the gate watch to bring the other prisoner in. The description matches. It is he. When the giant was at the door, Speaking to the guard, the watchman flexed his muscles hugely, and chains about his wrists snapped free. He bent down and tugged the chains about his ankles. The links bent and broke, but by then, the giant had seen, and flung himself back across the room to fall upon the watchman with his full strength. For a moment they strove against each other, limbs intertwined, muscles knotted. Their strength was equal, yet the aged giant was more cunning in the art of wrestling. The giant twisted and flung the watchman to the ground and fell atop him. By this time, the guards from the door had run forward and stood with pike ready, but could find no opening and dared not strike for fear of hitting the giant. When he rose, the giant had the watchman's arms pinned painfully behind his back, his hands twisted up. The giant was grinning. You are a worthy opponent, he whispered, panting. You also said the watchman, as blood trickled down his face. A moment later, a second group of knights and pikemen came in the chamber. 
escorting an old man in a broad black hat. The old man walked, leaning on a staff. Two black birds clung to the shoulders of his long cape. The cape was fastened with a steel ornament, shaped like a spiked wheel. Lieutenant, why does he come before me, unchained, garbed in no uniform, holding his stick? Were these things not taken from him at the door of his cell? Sire, stammered the lieutenant. We found him now, not in his cell, but walking the corridors leading to the palace, singing a carol. A carol? The stranger lifted his head. As the hat brim tilted up, Weston saw the man wore round discs of black glass before his eyes. The stranger sang, Woe, my child, woe is me. My son was born while falling free. Cannot endure earth gravity. He never shall come home. Not he, but evermore, forevermore, shall fly the airless deep. Fly free. That is an old song, said Weston. I am an old man, the stranger replied. I think you are Valdemar, said Weston. Then why do you not salute me? Valdemar was a traitor. Then why do you not embrace me as a brother, my fellow traitor? What treason do you say I do? asked Weston. The same as mine. You covet the ring. But I cannot use it. When the chief engineer Alberac learned I had let the enemy aboard, he bound all the main circuits of the computer to a single overall command and wrought that command into the ring you hold, leaving all other systems on automatic. Lauren, the ship's psychiatrist, and I, we traveled to the engine room, and we deceived poor Alberac and seized the ring. But Alberac had wrought more cunningly than I had guessed, and had programmed the ring, such that whenever it was used, any other member in the computer then would know from where and from whom the ring's commands had come the enemy would bend all their forces toward its capture. Were there any enemy aboard? You see, the ultimate power of command, yet it can be used only by someone not afraid to die. Where to find such absolute devotion to one's duty? Many years I searched the hulls of this great ship, from the ventilation shafts where pirates aboard their giant kites fly the hurricanes from level to level down to the swamps and stench of the sewermen, who silently take the dead away. And in the darkness, use secret arts to recycle all foul things to air and light again. Only one man I found had not deserted his post. Himdal, last of the watch, and most faithful, surrounded by the enemy, abandoned, alone, yet true to his duty. And look, here is his son, equally as faithful as is he, equally as doomed. Henwis called out, Captain, I wish to report the enemy crown ships are nigh to us, believing our world conquered and desolate, and are presently vulnerable to the discharge of our weapons. Several of the knights stared at the black-cloaked stranger in awe. It is Valdemar, said one. Captain, another whispered. And a third said, Can it be he? One of the pikemen in the room was looking, not at Valdemar, but at Weston. This pikeman spoke out, saying, My lord, you have the command ring? But there was envy in his eyes, and he stepped toward the throne. But a knight, dressed all in ribbons and fine clothes, drew his rapier and touched that pikeman on the shoulder with a naked blade, so that the man was frightened and stopped. The knight spoke to Weston, saying, The rumor of the ring draws Alvarin and all his tall, frail men. This old dribbler, if he is Valdemar, came also for its lure. I think the squat and surly dwarves who serve the fat lord of engineering cannot be far behind. The ring is surely cursed, my lord. It were better cast into a pit. A second knight. This a tall man from Cargo Bay said, My lord, the stranger rambles at length. He hopes for delay. Perhaps he is in league with Alvarin's people. 
the giant said to the stranger, Captain Valdemar. I am Caradoc, son of Cormac. My father died in the battle of Four Section Sevenhold, killing the great champion of the enemy. My father was an Earthman, born beneath blue skies, and he did not desert his post, even at his death. By his name, and in return for the vengeance I owe you for his death at the hands of the enemy whom you allowed aboard. I ask this question. Why? Broad question. Why what? Why did you surrender to the enemy and allow them to land sixty armies into our halls? Is that your full question? Are you not also going to ask why, on the day of the last burn, did our drive corps suddenly accidentally ignite? Why the enemy vessel was struck amidships with a line of flame a hundred miles long, sterilizing half their outer decks? Why? To this day. They have not landed a thousand armies more. And why can they barely keep the empire to our anti-spinward, supplied with arms and food? And that with picket ships which, till recently, were kept at bay by our escort ship Revenge. Why they dare not bombard the twilight into flaming ruin, for fear of striking dead their own armies. And best of all, why does the Sirdar Emperor aboard this ship? the son of the leader of the boarding party. Why has he reported to his masters that the ship is taken? This last question I can answer. The destroyers would certainly annihilate this vessel with their great weapons were they to learn that we still lived, and fought, and still ruled the inner decks as far spinward as water store, and forward as air bay and greenlit field. Watchman, said the giant, if you will promise not to escape, I will release one arm of yours, and I will trust your promise, knowing that, of all orders and ranks of men, watchmen are the most true and trustworthy, for the good of the ship relies on the honesty of their reports. Why do you wish to let go my hand? The watchman asked. So that my own hand shall be free to salute my captain, as he has asked. I agree, said the watchman and the Caradoc raised his huge hand and saluted Valdemar. There were tears in Caradoc's eyes. Weston was livid. Tell me the word to unleash the power of the ring. Tell, or I swear you die this moment, traitor. Valdemar said, I know many secret words of high command. Words to open doors or trigger circuits which only open to my voice. Doors leading down into secret corridors, access ways, and crawl spaces where no designers ever meant a human being to go. Every inch of all thousand decks of this fast ship I know, for it is mine, and I have never renounced my claim to it. I know words to darken lights, and still the airs to silence, or to send them rushing up again. But one word I do not know the word which Himdal whispered to Ring when he took it for his own. Now a group twelve of computermen came into the chamber, carrying staves and bludgeons. The pikemen in silver and blue lowered their lances, but confusedly, some pointing at the computermen, some at the black stranger, and one or two at the watchmen whom the giants still gripped. Three pikemen began walking toward the throne in a menacing fashion but when the lieutenant called sharply out to them, these three hesitated and stood uncertainly. The chief computerman was near the silver doors. He waved his truncheon and called out, Weston, give up the ring. It is false and has no power. Do not dream you can control the doors and lights and weapons of the world. Only the computer can control these things, and it heeds only our holy order. Is that so indeed, spoke the dark stranger. He pointed his staff at the silver doors and spoke a single harsh syllable. Immediately, the silver doors swung shut, and there was a sound of great bolt slamming home. The computerman jumped forward to avoid the doors. No doubt, hissed Valdemar. These doors reacted of their own accord. 
from a wish to keep more riffraff and sweeping of the corridors from blowing in to botch the brew. Edgal! Sindal! Garvarus! called out Weston to three of his knights. Kill Valdemar upon this instant! If he knows not the word to command the ring, then he is not any use to me. Other words I know, Valdemar mildly replied. And he shouted. The chamber dimmed into utter darkness. During the moment as the lights failed, Henwa saw Valdemar leap and spin lightly into the air, surrounded by a great gray circle of cloak, and by the flutter of his two dark, shrieking birds. With one hand, as he leaped, Valdemar drew out a breathing tube from his collar and put it to his mouth and nose. His other hand drew a hidden sword blade from his staff. The staff end, which had been the scabbard, fell away, smoking. Valdemar spun, disemboweling one oncoming knight with a kick, hidden knives unfolding from his boot spurs. In one smooth motion it was done, and the two other knights rushing forward missed him with their pikes as he leaped, swirling his cloak about the head of one of them. While the man was tangled in the weighted net hidden below the cloak, Valdemar slashed him to death with a stroke of his shining sword, which he held under his palm, against his forearm, after the fashion of blind fighters. Then it was dark. There came a noise and shattering explosion of light. In the flare of the explosion, the corpse of the one knight standing near where the smoking cane end had been abandoned could be briefly seen, headless, bloody, arms flailing as it fell. The hollow tube had contained some shrapnel which had been scattered among the pikemen and guards. Their chests and faces were bloody. Screams were starting. One man was blubbering like a baby. Henwas heard a hiss, smelled the fetid, dizzying smell of poisonous gas radiating from the corner of the chamber where Valdemar had been. All was noise, screams, horn calls, darkness, confusion, the stench of blood, the smell of poison. Henwas was awed by the destruction. Was the captain truly blind? There was another flare of light. The lieutenant stood with an illegal hand weapon blazing in his fist, his face blood red, contorted with murderous wrath. He was shouting, Suffer not to live who breaks the weapon code. Who kills the ship kills all. The lieutenant had been driven beyond all reason by the traitor captain's use of poisons and explosives, which could damage air filters and bulkhead seals. He reckoned nothing for the illegality of his own weapon. The ornament which Valdemar had used as a cloak pin spun shining out of the darkness and struck the lieutenant's hand. The disc was razor sharp. It severed the lieutenant's fingers. The hand weapon fell. Again it was dark. Weston shouted, Caradoc, save the watchman! And then he cried out in great pain, having betrayed his location by his shout. Someone struck at Henwas with a bludgeon. With his free hand, for the other was still gripped by the giant, Henwas reached out and seized the arm wielding the bludgeon, and the bones broke under the strength of his fingers. At first he was amazed and angered, for he did not think that any in that chamber would risk his harm. But underhand he felt the rough spun cloth of a computer man. Then the giant was dragging him to one side. Henwas heard a clash of blades, a coarse cry where he had just been standing. Now the giant held him still. By some odor or noise or pressure close at hand, Henwas felt an intuition the Valdemar was nearby, silent in the darkness. The giant still had him by one arm, but even so, Henwas did not move or speak, for fear of someone hearing. There was a ruckus in the blackness all around them, the clash of arms. Hen was suspected that the computer men or the pikemen were in rebellion, and thought, under cover of darkness and confusion, to steal the ring. Valdemar's voice slithered out of the blackness. Caradoc, I ask you, by your ancient oaths, now to be obedient to me, and bring the watchman to the throne where Weston is. We will seize the ring. When you call to him, he will answer, thinking you loyal. Henwas was amazed that any man who used explosives aboard the ship could say words like oath and loyalty and not be choked. But he feared a coming tragedy. Caradoc and Valdemar both were resolute, brave men. He knew the giant would not break fealty with Weston, who, 
however unworthy, was his lord. He knew as well that Valdemar, who might admire the giant, would not hesitate an instant to cheat, deceive, or murder him, the moment that such crimes became useful to his grand design. The giant made no noise. Henwis was not surprised. Valdemar spoke again. Unfortunate that you must betray Weston, who is your lord, but the mission goals require it. Fret not. Treason is only bitter at first. The soul grows easily accustomed. Caradoc lashed the bayonet of his weapon through the air toward the voice. He struck nothing. By some trick or slight, Valdemar had made his voice seem to come from where it was not. Henwes, Valdemar whispered, sounding very near. Call out that I may hear where the giant stands and slay him. But Henwes did not want the giant to die, and did not answer. Henwes, Caradoc, both of you have disobeyed my direct command in time of war. For this I instantly condemn you. I now release the deadly vapor. Breathe and perish. Henwes knew this was some feint to compel them to move or act, so he doubted and stayed still. And perhaps the giant suspected this a ruse as well, but staked no chance on it. Caradoc discharged his weapon straight up into the air. In the momentary muscle flare, Valdemar could be seen, crouching like a great black bat near the floor, white blade in his hand, point poised across his back like the sting of a scorpion. The giant dropped the barrel of his weapon and fired again. Valdemar flopped and fell limply. The giant fired many times. At that moment, the great gold doors behind the throne opened a crack. There was a weak light from the main bridge beyond, dusky blue service light said to burn forever. Silhouetting against that light, Henwes could see the staggering figure of acting Captain Weston, who was pierced and bleeding. The slim crack of light from the door, the huddled figure of Valdemar could be seen, bleeding terribly. Except my surrender whispered Valdemar, for I am wounded unto death. The giant stepped forward. I repent that when finally I had found a man worth serving, the true captain from the young days of the world, he sullied his hands with unlawful weapons. Your surrender I accept, for memory of the nobility once you had. A pause. Then... Can you hear me? And when he bent over the huddled figure, Valdemar, hearing the sound of his voice, flung up his hand and threw a poisoned dagger into the open mouth of the giant, piercing the roof of his mouth. Nothing is unlawful. Nothing noble in war, Valdemar screamed in anger. The white-haired and ancient giant staggered forward and fell onto the supine body of Captain Valdemar, crushing him down. And perhaps the giant, falling, had struck down with his knife or hands, for the body of Valdemar was crushed and was not seen to move again. As the giant fell, Valdemar cried a single word of command, and then was silent. The moment the giant had unhanded him, Henwas bounded across the chamber toward Weston. A knight rose up before him, like a ghost in the gloom brandishing a rapier, but Henwes, scarred by radiation, knew no fear, came forward, was stabbed in the shoulder painfully, but struck in the knight's skull with his fist. He nearly had his hands on the wounded Weston, who, sobbing, was crawling through the golden doors into the vast dark chamber beyond, when a pike stroke from behind Henwes cut into the muscles of his leg and toppled him. In a moment, the pikeman had him by the hair and was pressing a dirk against his throat, even as Henwes' hands closed around the bracelet-ringed ankle of Weston's jeweled boot. Weston drew a bloody hand out from underneath his gem-studded coat. This is my death wound, he panted, staring in horror at the heart's blood in his palm. I am slain. Meanwhile, Valdemar's last spoken word had its effect. There was a noise like that of bolts being drawn back and of doors opening, and the pictures which lined the walls swung free in their frames, 
and from half a dozen secret doors, lights and trumpet noise issued forth. Into the chamber from these secret doors came suddenly the tall pale men of Overdeck, garbed all in green, some with breastplates and helms of polished steel, carrying bows and tall spears and slim straight swords. The knights of the above world were tall and fair and terrible to look upon, and they were singing their war song. Not one of them was pockmarked or scarred, or showed any sign of the radiation diseases which those who live on lower decks, to their sorrow, know only too well. Before them came the white star banner of Alvarin. Many carried bows and crossbows, for, although the overmen are weaker in their legs and bodies than our other men, their arms are sinewy and their eyes are keen. Alvarin himself came forth, his uniform as green as leaves, and from his wide shoulders hung one of the fair white-winged cloaks those who live at the axis of the world use to steer themselves in flight. His hair was as yellow as the corn as people grow in greenhold. His eyes were blue and bright, and shone with a light of stern command. Now Alvarin raised his straight slim sword, and called upon those within the chamber to surrender, saying, Whoso lays down his arms shall be spared, and set free. I vow, suffering no hurt, nor any dishonor. Because the rumor of Alvarin's honesty and clemency was so well known, the knights and pikemen in that chamber instantly threw down their swords and pole arms. None had heart to fight, seeing their leader, Weston, lay swooning with his lifeblood bubbling out of him. The weapons fell ringing to the chamber floor. But one of the computermen seized up a pike and, with a terrible cry, cast it straight into Alvarin's breast. Alvarin staggered backward, pierced through the heart and lungs. In that same instant of time, the man who had cast the pike was stricken through his arm by three arrows. Yet these shots were not ill-aimed, for Alvarin's men, by custom, spoke before they struck wounded rather than slew. Alvarin drew the pike head out from his bloody chest and wiped the blood away. The wound closed up into a scar, and then Alvarin's chest grew fair and smooth again. He cast the bloody pike aside. I am an earthman. I was born beneath blue sky, he called out. To the wounded man, he said, the knowledge of the men who made this entire world have made me as I am and I am not to be slain by your small weapons. And he ordered his physician to tend to the wounded among the enemy, even the man who had smitten him. Alvarin turned. He saw Valdemar laying motionless, his body crushed beneath the fallen giant. So, Alvarin whispered, these secret paths you showed to us were not a trap. Did you play us true, this once, old liar? If so, where is the ring? Now he turned again. In the threshold of the golden doors leading to the main bridge, a pikeman still crouched above Henwes the watchman, a steady knife still touching the prone man's throat. Henwes was bleeding at the shoulder and the leg, and yet his face was remote and calm, as if no wound nor pain could trouble him. Alvarin stepped forward till he could see, laying in the shadow of the door, dying acting Captain Weston the second, and in his blood-stained hand, the ring. Beyond was the bridge, a large, dimly lit cathedral of a space, surrounded on all sides by the darkened screens of the computer. Weston croaked. Pikeman, slit the watchman's throat if the rebel king steps forward one step more. Weston said Alvarin in a soft, stern voice. Yield up to me the ring. I will restore to all the world the light, the power, and the justice which, by right, should have been ours. You have my solemn promise that all your men shall be dealt with justly. Should I believe a mutineer? You betrayed Valdemar, hissed Weston wearily. After he surrendered to the enemy. Free men follow leaders into battle and render him the power of command. Only while he does their will, in pursuit of a just war, 
or in defense against hostility. That power of command, incapable of destruction, returned to the free men of this ship upon Valdemar's abdication of it. By their fair and uncoerced election, I was tendered the command, and so am captain. That trust I hold sacred. Render me the ring, and I shall see this world prosper. Prosper? Are we not surrounded by enemy worlds? Weston asked softly. We are too humble for their attention, Alvarin said. If we do not offend them, they will pay us no more heed. And if the ring is used to launch the fabled weaponry at World's Core? Weston now raised himself on one elbow. His face was pasty white, his eyes wild and sick. Then the world dies, if not in this generation, then in the next. The lieutenant, his hand being bandaged by a tall, pale doctor, spoke up. Sire, yield the ring to Alvarin. Even we, so many years his foe, acknowledge his justice, wisdom, and true-heartedness. If any man is deserving of empire, it is such a man as this. But Henwes, who still had him by the ankle, said a voice of calm command. In your last moment, sir, I pray you be a captain truly. Use the ring, or give it to me, to complete the mission of the Twilight of the Gods. We both are dying, you of wounds, me of radiation, poison, and disease. Should we, in such a time as this, abandon our posts and sue for peace? This whole world was made for war. Pikeman, stand away. Here, Watchman, take the accursed thing. Do your duty. Kill all my enemies, you, them, everyone, and be damned to you all. With a curse on his lips, Weston slid into death, and his cold hand gave the ring to Henwes. Henwes came up to his knees and thrust the pikeman down across the dais stairs. Such was the strength of his arm that the man was slung many yards away. Alvarin and the elves started forward suddenly, but Henwes, leaning inward from the golden door, reached and touched the shining ring against the dark, cold, mirrored corner of the nearest of the many computer screens which filled the huge black bridge. He spoke the words, Eternal fidelity, I am forever loyal. And all the mirrors flamed a life and shined with purest light. On each screen, images appeared, words, symbols, strange letters and equations, and everywhere, the thousand shining lights of all the enemy stars. A pure and perfect voice, like no voice ever to be made by lips or tongue of man, rang out. Ready! Several of the computermen screamed in fear or shouted with joy. One sank down to his knees and cried out, Oh, that I have seen this day! Even the knights and guards of Weston's, and the Alvarin's tall men stood speechless, eyes wide. But the chief computerman called out for the men to avert their eyes. This is a deception of the enemy. The computer cannot speak to men, except through us. But one of the knights smote him across the face with his fist. The chief computer man fell to the deck and lay sullen, wiping his mouth, weeping and afraid to speak again. One of the Overman knights raised his bow and spoke in a soft, clear voice. Noble Lord Alvarin, we have heard the word which can command the ring. One shot, and all the world shall be yours. Nay, Elromir, spoke Alvarin, not even to win empires will I have such a blow be struck against a man wounded and unarmed. The watchman, kneeling, said, Computer, are there weapons at this world's core, ready to strike out against our enemies? All weapon systems at ready. Targets acquired. Firing sequences ready to initiate. Standing by, Alvarin said, Watchman, I pray you, wait. 
you will unleash a storm of fire. None save me aboard this ship even recall the origins of this war, its purpose or its cause. Why do you condemn all the nations, lands, and peoples here aboard the twilight to be obliterated? Think of those born innocent years after this dreadful ship of war was launched. Our captain betrayed us. We have surrendered. Let it rest at that, Henwa said. When the stranger, whom I now know to have been Valdemar, gave my master Himdal this dread ring, he did so with these words. You alone shall know when the waiting is completed, when the enemy grows lax and deems us dead. Only now do I understand the captain's purpose after all these years, even from before my birth. The other ships we know only as names of glory. These ships are hard beset by that great foe which ruined and overthrew our world so long ago. And our true world, Earth, though we have forgotten it, still calls to us to fight in her defense. The captain expected us to fight and die for the glory of the fleet, to die, if need be, to have all the twilight die, if it would forward the mission goals and accomplish our duty, Alvarin said. But those aboard the other ships, why do you give such love and loyalty to them, that you are willing to call destruction down on all our world for the sake of those whom you have never seen and do not know? I will not live to see salvation, yet I know it comes, said Henwes. I never knew the other men who serve aboard those other ships, yet I know that there are those aboard them who would gladly do for me what I now do for them. That knowledge is enough for me. One of the knights, evidently realizing the hen was meant to do an act which would provoke the enemy to destroy the world, stooped, picked up a fallen dagger, and before any of Alvarin's men could think to stop him, threw it. The dagger spun and landed fair on the middle of Henwis' back. Henwis, back arched, eyes blind with pain, now shouted, Computer! Shut these doors! Acknowledged. All stations notified of override command location. The men in the room swept forward like a tide. But too late. The golden doors fell to, and shut in their faces. Alvarin raised his hand and cried out with a great voice to rally his men. Alvarex curses told all the computer screens now where the ring hides. The enemy will sweep this area with fire, exploding all the decks below us if they need be. Come, we must be gone. It may be already too late. And he set his men passing swiftly out of the chamber. He and his paladins stood on the dais before the golden doors, unwilling to depart till all the men had gone before them. And as they stood so, through the doors, they heard the great, chiming, and inhuman voice call out, Weapons free! Initiating launch! Warheads away! There came a noise like thunder, and a great voice echoing from every wall rang out, and it was the watchman's voice, tremendously amplified and echoing throughout every corridor of every nation of the great ship. They heard the watchman call out, saying, I have seen it, I have seen it, and the heavens are consumed with light. Then, more softly, they heard the great voice say, Father, if you see this, you shall know. I did not leave my post. And then, even more softly, Computer, now destroy this ring and let its curse be ended, and return all functions to their proper stations and commands. Light returned to the chamber where they were, and they heard, as from far off, a great noise of wonder, as of many voices of people near and far, all crying out at once. And they knew that light returned to darkened places which had known no light for years beyond count. One of the knights took hold of Alvarin's cape, Sire, look, and he pointed to where the giant Caradoc lay. Of Valdemar's body there was no sign. He was gone. Look there, 
one of the knights, in wonder, pointed upward to where the two black birds were huddled among the pillar tops, bundles of black feathers, croaking. They are his magpies, said Alvarin softly. Even in ancient times, from before he was blind, he always kept such birds near him, to remind him of what he dared not forget. And to himself, he murmured. Or perhaps, since all this was arranged by his cunning, perhaps it is I who am blind, or who have forgotten. One of the blackbirds croaked and spoke in a voice like a man's voice. No matter what the cost, the mission goals must be accomplished. No matter what the cost. The other blackbird croaked and said, All's fair in war. All's fair. All's fair. Alvarin and his men departed from that place and did not look back. Blood Dauber, Ted Kosmatka and Michael Poor. New writer Ted Kosmatka has been a zookeeper, a chemtech, and a steel worker, and is now a self described lab rat who gets to play with electron microscopes all day. He made his first sale to Asimov's in 2005 and has since made several subsequent sales there, as well as to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Seeds of Change. Idiomancer, City Slab, Kindred Voices, Cemetery Dance, and elsewhere. He's placed several different stories with several different Best of the Year series over the last couple of years, including this one. He lives in Portage, Indiana, and has a website at Ted, K O S M A T K A, dot com. Michael Poor has appeared in both literary and speculative magazines nationwide including Story Quarterly, Fiction, Tale Bones, and The Nth Degree. He was runner-up for the 2006 Fountain Award for Literary Excellence in Speculative Fiction and has new work coming up in Glimmer Train. Here, the two join forces to investigate an intricate biological mystery that doesn't begin to come close to the mysteries of the human heart. The animals hate you. You get used to that working at a zoo. Over time, it becomes a thing you can respect. Bell trudged up the path, pushing the wheelbarrow before him, already sweating under his brown khaki uniform. He squinted in the bright sunlight, eyeing the exhibits as he ascended the hill. The goats and their pandering, the silly, horny monkeys, the slothful binturongs, all moving to the front of their enclosures as he approached. Most zoo animals eventually came to an understanding with those who brought the food. An uneasy truce. But Bell knew better than to trust it. He'd seen the scars. Mary had scars on her arms. Garland was missing the tip of one finger. And John, the assistant super, had a large divot in the calf of his right leg. Zebra, was all he'd say. Bell was the newest zoo keep. No scars yet but a wariness. Walking up the hill that morning, Bell noticed Shauna up ahead of him on the asphalt path. As he walked, he noticed she wore two different colored socks, one red, the other white. He wondered if she were absent-minded or just quirky. He hadn't been at the zoo long, didn't know her well. As he closed the distance, he saw that she was crying, and he realized why she wore one red sock. Her calf was gashed open bleeding streams. He followed her into the staff room, and she explained that the juvenile baboon had attacked her. She was outraged, betrayed. Why did you go in there? he asked. I always go in there, she said. I was here when it was born. I raised it. Animals are unpredictable, she shook her head. It's never done that before. Never done that before. Bell thought about that on the way home. Surprises puzzled him. On one hand, it seemed there should never be any surprises. The world tended toward order, didn't it? It circled the sun at the same speed all the time. Water boiled predictably, froze predictably. 
People weighed the same in Dallas as they did in Quebec. The speed of sound in dry air was 767 miles an hour. So why, Bell wondered, can't he and his wife keep track of money, plan ahead and stop living in a trailer? In an orderly world, this shouldn't be impossible. In an orderly world, you shouldn't have to choose between buying food and keeping your car insurance. Bell knew things were always more complicated than they looked. Water froze predictably, but strangely. It expanded. Crystals crashed and splintered. Sound moved faster underwater. And you can't keep from buying shit, he thought aloud, driving home. He popped over the curb into the Lil Red Barn parking lot. They weren't going to spend anything this week, Bell and Lynn had agreed. They didn't need to. Food in the fridge, gas in both cars. This week, they wouldn't spend. That morning, they'd run out of toilet paper. It's not an insurmountable problem, he told Lynn. We have paper towels. You're not, said Lynn, supposed to put anything besides toilet paper in the toilet. But you can, argued Bell. If you need to. Bell thought it was a spending problem. They knew how much money was coming in. If they controlled what went out, their money would be orderly, would increase. Lynn disagreed. It's a matter of supply, she had pointed out. Your job needs to supply more money. So does yours. Lynn worked in the mall. She glared ice, splinters and crystals. In Lynn's world, it was okay for her to criticize Bell. It was not okay for Bell to criticize Lynn. Not if things were to be orderly. In every mating pair, Bell knew, one animal always bit harder than the other. Lynn was the biter. And in their two-mammal world, where daily life was defined by constant grinding poverty, it seemed she bit constantly. It was important, they had once agreed, to do what they loved, to love their work. I love my work. Bell had told Lynn a thousand times. Last month, in bed, he had told her how he loved his work, and they'd argued, and she'd scratched him with her fingernails. Drew blood. Made him want to hit her. And he almost did. But he didn't. There were light years between wanting to hit a woman and actually doing it. Bell wasn't that kind of man. Wasn't that kind of animal. What kind of animal was he? He wondered if she knew. Wondered if she'd seen it in his eyes, the almost hitting, the wanting to. He quit saying how much he loved his job. Most zookeepers, he knew, were women whose husbands made better money. They could afford the love. Lynn knew this, too. Shelley Capriotti's husband sells guitars, she had told him, just the night before. Shelley Capriotti was someone she worked with or worked out with. He couldn't recall. High-end stuff, like for professionals, like if Eric Clapton needed a new guitar. There's no reason you couldn't do something like that. He makes a ton of money. And he was on the edge, as he often was, of admitting to himself that he wished he hadn't gotten married when she stretched herself across his lap in front of their 11-year-old TV and was nice for a while. Long enough for him to sweep some hard truth under the rug. Again. It was easier that way. He focused on that, the niceness, while he paid the cashier at the Little Red Bar. She could be nice. Things in general sometimes were nice. Sometimes she was predictable, which was easier, but you had to be ready for both. Driving into the trailer park, he thought about that. The baboon had never attacked anyone. Then today it did. There's a first time for everything. You're cute the way a dog is cute, Lynn had told him, in front of the TV. You run out of toilet paper. Things fall apart. Not having money was a theme in Bell's life. Even the zoo was a poor zoo, poorly funded. Sometimes people complained. Once, a woman had come in, and when she'd seen the conditions in which the lions were housed, she'd been angry. People love the lions. 
It's a cage, she said. Bell had agreed with her. Zoos are supposed to be natural, she continued. They're supposed to be habitats, and the animals aren't even supposed to realize they're confined. Bell understood. He sympathized. He'd been to zoos like that, too, in towns that weren't dying. Do you think they don't know? he asked. She only stared at him. Do you think, in these other zoos, that the animals don't know they're locked in? A disgrace, she said, walking away. Low funding required management get creative when provisioning the animals. In addition to supplies bought on the open market, there were arrangements with local grocery stores and butchers and meat processors. A truck was taken around each day to be filled with heaps of food, loaves of bread that had passed their freshness dates, meat that had begun to turn, gallons of milk that had expired. Occasionally there was carrion brought in, deer which had been struck on the highway and then picked up by the county. All of it fed into the bottomless maw of the zoo. The trucks would drive around back and unload their cargo into the kitchen. It was called the kitchen, but it was not a kitchen. It was a room with several huge stainless steel tables on which food was piled and sorted and divided. Bell was on his way to the castle when a voice on his walkie-talkie stopped him. Bell, there's something you need to see. Lucy, one of the kitchen workers, out of breath. He got there fast, came in through the back door. It's a bug, said Lucy, hands at her collar. What kind, he asked. She shrugged. It's a bug. She pointed at a bowl turned upside down on the counter. Bell lifted the bowl, put it down again. He stood perfectly still. He lifted the bowl and stole another quick glance. Hmm, he said, and lowered the bowl. The kitchen worker stared. What is it? I'm working on it, he said. He looked into the distance. I think it's a grub of some kind. I didn't think grubs got that big, Lucy said. No, Bell said. Neither did I. Bell looked again. The grub was large, fleshy, and blood red, five inches long. Where did it come from? he asked. She shrugged again. The table. Bell looked at the table. There were watermelons and apples and bread and the partially disarticulated hawk of a deer. Several bunches of blackened bananas made a mountain in the center, along with a smaller mound of more exotic fruit shipped in from Lord knew where. It could have come in with anything, she said. I found it crawling along the edge of the table there. She shuddered. It was moving pretty fast. Bell retrieved a glass jar from the cabinet, opened the lid, then dragged the bowl across the edge of the table so the strange grub dropped into the jar. He stepped outside and plucked some grass, put the grass inside, and closed the lid. Poked holes. He took the jar across the zoo to the castle and placed it on a shelf in the back room. The castle was the name used for the entomology building. Bell could only imagine what the structure's original use had been, with its block construction and odd turrets. But whatever that long-ago intent, it now housed all manner of creepy crawlers, hissing cockroaches, and ant farms, and snakes, and lizards and frogs, anything that required darkness or careful temperature control. The building was a box within a box, there was an open central area ringed on three sides by walls and exhibits, and just behind these walls was a space called the back room, closed to the public, which was actually a single narrow hall that conformed to the outside perimeter of the building, a gap space where you could access the back side of the cages. At the far end of this hall, in a dead-end spot furthest from the entry door, was a table and chairs, a TV, a desk, and several terrariums. These extra terrariums were where the sick were boarded, those unfit for public examination. Bell did the rest of his chores for the day. In the evening, he checked on the grub. 
It was still there, happily curling up the sides of the glass jar. Bell had studied entomology in college, and he'd never seen anything like it. The insect's sheer bulk seemed to push the cubed square law to its limit, perhaps beyond its limit. He hadn't thought insects could be that big. When he opened the lid, the grub reared up at him, strange mouthparts writhing. Bell was in charge of the castle, the petting zoo, and the convicts. This had not always been the case. He was in charge of the castle because he was the only zookeeper who'd taken college-level entomology. The petting zoo was meant as an insult, and the convicts were punishment. The convicts came in most weekdays. You could point them out in the parking lot. Men and women who were there too early, hours before the gates opened. Bell would feed the insects, drink a cup of coffee, and then walk to open the front gates. Here for community service? he'd ask. Yeah, they'd say. Sometimes there were two or three. Sometimes none. They handed Bell their paperwork, and Bell passed it to the zoo superintendent at the end of the day. The number of hours worked was the all-important statistic, because they all had a number they were working down from. 150 hours. 200 hours. 100 hours. Sometimes they talked about their crimes, and sometimes they didn't. Bell never asked. Not his business. Bell often talked to himself in the bathroom mirror. In this world, he said, you are not an apex predator. Humans are, as a species. But you, yourself, are not. You do not always win. Problems are not always solved. There are defeats and surrenderings, small but important. Last winter, they gave up heating the bedroom. They sealed off the back of the trailer and slept on the sofa. They learned the science of climbing into the bathtub. The bathtub was metal and descended a few inches through the floor, arctic air right beneath. No matter how hot the water got, your button legs would start to freeze if you sat still too long. You had to lift yourself up now and then. Let the hot water get under there. Lower yourself. Wait. Repeat. It's like not even being part of the food chain, Bell said aloud one cold night, eating burritos in the kitchen. They hadn't spoken to one another that morning. His remark about the food chain was one of two things they said to each other all day long. Sometimes he opened up the bedroom door and exhaled just to see his breath cloud the room. He wanted her to ask about his food chain remark, wanted to explain it, wanted her to understand. The food chain, he began. I get it, she said. That was the second thing that got said. Her breath made a cloud even though they were in the kitchen. Bell didn't dare tell Lynn how much he loved his job. Not anymore. He told the mirror instead. I love my job, he said. His reflection said it, too, it seemed. Like the zoo, their life at home had been built on various pretendings. Pretending there might be gas money. Pretending they could afford to eat better, but chose not to. Pretending that Lynn still thought it was important to have a job you liked. Loved. Whatever. She had quit pretending. Somewhere behind her mask was the Lynn who thought, if you loved me, you'd do what it took for me to live a better life. And that Lynn had surfaced, unmasked, through fucking around. Classified ads appeared, taped to the fridge. Sales, landscaping, power washing trucks, all kinds of things you could do with a degree in biology. It's easy, Bell told her, to lose track of what's really important. She didn't have to say that having heat and electricity were important, too. Instead, never breaking eye contact, she grabbed her coat and her vibrator and locked herself in the bathroom. Library clerk. Barista. All things that paid more than working at a zoo. Mexican cook. Sky cap for a Mexican airline. Didn't matter if you weren't Mexican. It was amazing.
thought Belle. How much pretending went on in a zoo? The public pretended the cages were jungles, savanna, desert or snow. The animals pretended that they were not interested in the public. The public and the zookeepers worked together at pretending that the zoo was not, when you got right down to it, just carefully engineered cruelty. Sometimes the animals forgot to pretend, like when babies were born and wouldn't eat, because they knew captivity when they saw it, felt it, forgot to pretend life was worth living. Like when the llama attacked Bria Vagades. Belle was there when it happened. It wasn't like an animal attack in the movies, all snarling and snorting, blood and fur. It looked almost comical. One second, Bria was lifting the rock-shaped hatch which concealed the garden hose, and suddenly here came Nunez, the llama, ridiculous and splendid with his two-toned black and gray coat, rearing on his hind legs, waving his front hooves like a boxer. He was on her before she saw him, and she screamed. Ow! she screamed. And, fuck you, Nunez, before she got a grip on herself. The zoo was closed, but there were strict rules about losing your cool where the public might see, might panic. Nunez lost his balance, came down on all fours, still advancing, sniffing the air, reared up again, hooves waving as Bria covered her head, backing away, feeling behind her for the door. He didn't want her in the enclosure, Belle told John Lorraine, another zookeeper, later on in the cafeteria. It was obvious. It's never obvious. It's sloppy is what it is, assigning human motives to animal behavior. Territoriality is an animal behavior, Belle answered, chewing peanut butter crackers. It's an animal motive. What's sloppy, John said, is pretending to understand why all the time. Why they do anything they do. Because it's mating season, said Belle. That's why. John Lorraine's eyes narrowed. And she went in the enclosure by herself? That's sloppy, too. These animals aren't pets. But Belle knew some of the animals were like pets. Bad pets. Pets you couldn't trust. You should write a fucking memo, he said. You should shut up. Belle agreed. He said, yep. The grub wasn't like a pet. The day after, Belle placed it in one of the large terrariums. It began to construct a papery cocoon. During his evening break, Belle sat in the back room and watched the grub work. He checked the zoo's entomology books, but couldn't find a match. None of the pictures looked anything like the strange insect in the terrarium. The cocoon only deepened the mystery. Whatever this thing was, it was a juvenile. There were four main groups of insects that had a larval stage of development. Coleoptera, Lepidoptera, Hymenoptera, and Diptera. The thing in the terrarium was no caterpillar, so Bell could rule out Lepidoptera. The grub's size seemed to rule out Diptera, which left Hymenoptera and Coleoptera, wasps and beetles, but it didn't look like any wasp or beetle grub he'd ever seen. Most grubs didn't have eyes. Most grubs didn't have mouth parts like that. At the end of its third day in the terrarium, Belle arrived to find it had sealed itself into its papery chrysalis. And just like that, the grub subtracted itself from the world. The next day, there was an addition to Belle's army of community service workers. A late arrival. Belle was on one knee, mixing food for the lemurs when a shadow fell over the bucket. Belle shaded his eyes and looked up. They told me to find Belle. Report to Belle, they said. Said Belle was young. You look like you might be him. The shadow had a voice like raw sand. Belle stood and shook hands. Shaking hands, the first thing he noticed was scar tissue. Burn scars splashed across hand and wrist. Both hands, Bell observed. Both wrists. Leather-skinned. Scrambled white hair. Eyes blue like a cutting torch. If a bomb could explode and come back as a person, it would be this guy. Just looking at him, sunburned and fired-burned, 
made Belle thirsty. They sat down over Cokes at the Savannah Cafe, where Belle learned that the bomb's name was Cole. Learned that, at 60, Cole was by far the oldest community service con to grace the zoo. Then he put him to work, hosing down empty cells in the elephant house, beginning with the Cape Buffalo. Bullshit, rasped Cole when he saw the cell. Belle must have looked startled. Literally, Cole explained, waving the hose at the floor. He smiled, revealing teeth like rubble. Smiled and winked. It was like being winked at by war. Just as the lions were star attractions for the tourists, Cole became a star attraction for the staff. He was scary, like the lions. Like the lions, he seemed to keep most of his energy bottled up in some soft, invisible engine. It was an uneasy feeling, locking eyes with a lion. Same with Cole. You couldn't talk to a lion, though. Couldn't ask him how he came to be at the zoo. But you could ask Cole, if you were nosy enough. Belle didn't ask. Belle stood in the dark tunnel with Cole. The baboons are smart, he said. You have to be careful, Cole nodded. They can throw their poop at you. They can bite. You have to lock both sets of doors. There is a procedure you have to follow, and you should never be in the enclosure with them. Cole nodded again. It's very important. Do you understand? Cole nodded again. But Bell wasn't so sure. Several years earlier, there'd been an incident in the cat house. The exhibit had been in the midst of repairs, and the lion had been allowed access to its run overnight. This normally wouldn't have been an issue, except that the adjacent run had been under construction. The door separating the bobcat run from the lion run was made of thick plywood, a temporary measure which was fine to keep the bobcats in, but insufficient, apparently, to keep the lion out. The next day, they found the plywood partition shredded and the lion sleeping in the bobcat cage, blood coating its muzzle. All the bobcats were dead. Zoos are dangerous places. Dangerous for the animals. Dangerous for the zoo keeps. Cole had a thousand hours of community service. Bell had never seen a number that high. It would take him a year to finish it. When Cole had been at the zoo for a week, the zoo superintendent pulled Bell aside. The superintendent didn't like Bell much. She wore a serious expression. The older guy, Cole. Is he a good worker? He's fine. He's going to be here for a while. Yeah, Bell said. I know. He could see the gears moving behind the superintendent's eyes. A free long-term worker. A worker that didn't need getting paid. Perhaps we could give him more responsibilities, she said. For weeks, Bell checked on the cocoon waiting what would emerge. It happened on a Monday. There was a buzz in the room when Bell entered, a buzz like one second before an electric light went bad. Only this light kept going bad, second after second, an electrical hum that did not fade. Bell looked in the terrarium and saw it. Huge, winged, bright red, but the mouth parts were black. I'm an optera he whispered, of some kind. The summer stretched on. Bell trained Cole how to be a zookeeper. On their breaks, they sat in the back room. When the insect first hatched, the question became what to feed it. Bell tried a little of everything. Sliced bananas and apples and small chunks of meat. Some of the fruit on the table came from exotic locales and it was easy to imagine the grub stowed within the corpus of some melon from Central America. And it was easy to imagine how such a melon might go quickly bad, and soft, and end up on the zoo's table as discarded produce. Weeks passed, and the insect thrived. 
Even Cole took an interest. Pit wasp, he said as he helped Belle clean out the nearby lizard cage. I'm not convinced it's a wasp. Several days later, Belle found Cole looking through the glass. Cole was the one who noticed it first. What's that? he asked. Belle looked. I'll be damned. The wasp thing sat perched on a small branch in the terrarium, oddly jointed legs flexed, wings slung like swords over its narrow back. Hanging beneath the insect, dangling from a fibrous string, was a small pod of what looked like dried brown foam. What is it? Cole said. I think it's an egg case. Cole surveyed the terrarium again. So there's two of them things? Bell shook his head. There's just the one. Maybe she was already fertilized. This particular convict was smarter than he pretended to be. Bell caught his reflection in the glass, blowtorch eyes darting back and forth. It's not likely, he said. She is female, but the reproductive stage usually begins after metamorphosis, not before. And this thing has been alone since it hatched. Santa Maria of the bugs, said Cole, cracking a shipwreck smile. Bell laughed. It's less than a miracle in the insect world, he explained. It's called parthenogenesis. Some kinds of hymenoptera can... Hymen who? It's an insect clade. Ants, bees, and wasps. Certain species can reproduce without males. Worms can do it, too. And some lizards. But hymenoptera are the champs. Cole straightened. Let's hope that doesn't catch on. Bell thought it over. Reproduction and marriage and wives and such. Might not be so bad, he muttered. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. Bell contacted the university. He wrote a letter to the biology department describing the insect and the circumstances of its arrival. A week later, he received a reply. The note was short and polite. It's probably a mud dauber. Bell wadded the letter and threw it in the trash. I know what a mud dauber looks like. One evening, a few weeks later, he found the insect dead. Even in death, it looked formidable, with a head the size of a dime and a body like a smooth, slick walnut. For the first time, he dared to touch it. With its legs spread out, it was nearly the size of his hand. He jabbed a pin through its abdomen and stuck it to a small cork. The legs sagged under their own weight. He looked inside the terrarium at the egg case, wondering if anything would hatch from it. Months passed, the egg case forgotten. Belle and Shauna took turns training the old man. Shauna didn't like Cole and didn't pretend she did. In the spring, the eggs hatched. There were a million tiny grubs, just like the original, only smaller. Belle watched them wriggling through the sawdust he'd put in the terrarium. These more of your wasps? Cole asked. They will be. They watched them writhing for several minutes. What do they eat? Cole asked. Belle thought about this for a moment. The adult form of an insect often ate a completely different diet than the juvenile. I have no idea, he said. Feedings could be tricky. When Bell was first hired by the zoo, he'd been put in charge of feeding the raptors. Raptors weren't dinosaurs, though, like you'd think, with a name like that. It turned out they were big damn birds. One of them was a golden eagle. All went well for the first few days. The golden eagle ate about five rats a week, but it was fed every day, which would have been fine except that the uneaten rats had to be removed from the enclosure. This idea didn't bother Bill until the moment he first went to do it. He stood at the cage door and looked at the big damn eagle, and it occurred to him that he was about to go inside a big damn eagle's enclosure and take out its food. It occurred to him what might happen if the big damn eagle felt suddenly partial to that food. He stared at the eagle. He stared at its talons. 
two-inch daggers strong enough to pierce bone. Belle walked down to the zoo superintendent's office. She was unmoved by his concerns. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with it, Belle said. She waved that off. You've got nothing to worry about. Then she went back to her paperwork. But how do you know the eagle won't attack? It'll be fine, she said, not bothering to look up. Nothing like that has ever happened before. A preamble to every scar story he'd heard at the zoo. I'm not going to do it, he said. She looked up from her papers. She sighed. She weighed her options. All right, she said. The next week, he was put in charge of the petting zoo. This was meant as an insult. When he complained, pointing out that his particular skill set could surely be put to better utility, she only nodded sympathetically. Then she put him in charge of the convicts, too. Bell divided the newly hatched grubs into three groups, in three terrariums. In one terrarium, he dropped only fruit. In another, he dropped chunks of bread. In the third terrarium, he dropped meat. Insects tended to specialize in their diets, so he thought there was a good chance that two of the terrariums would starve. But then at least he'd know what they ate. The grubs, however, surprised him. All three aquariums thrived though the grubs given meat grew fastest. Two months later, the grubs all began to spin cocoons. As if by agreement, they all started their nests on the same day. That night, as if to celebrate the milestone, Bell committed a budget crime. He stopped at McDonald's for a bite on his way home, knowing that tuna salad was all they had in the fridge. He was trapped and doomed once he'd spent the money. Spend whatever you need to, Lynn said. Just make sure you tell me about it. Lynn was the official banker of their marriage. Just tell me about it was the trap, because if he spent money and told her, she got mad. She might get loud. She might stay quiet. Either way, when Lynn got mad, she fed on her own energy like a hurricane, getting louder and madder. The hurricane usually blew until she charged out the door and drove away, still screaming. Hours later, she'd return. Maybe still mad. Maybe not. One of these days when she came back, Belle would be gone. This thought came from an increasingly vocal part of his brain, the part where he'd swept so much crap under the carpet. A week after his crime, she dropped a bank statement in his lap while he sat reading. They were both reading a lot these days. The cable company had run out of patience. What? he asked. It's highlighted. Shit. He'd forgotten. MCD store number 1635. You didn't give me a receipt for that. Thought I had. Sorry. He was sorry. What else could he do? Here, he thought, was where a rational person would let it go. But not Lynn. She yelled, Stormwind's building. How, she wanted to know, was she supposed to know how much to spend on the rent and the car and the power company and the phone company and the fucking grocery store when she didn't know how much he'd spent on whatever big important things he needed to spend money on? Like a Big Mac, apparently. She didn't remember him asking if she'd like a Big Mac, too, because he was too busy being a selfish, irresponsible asshole, and then hiding the receipt. He could tune out the yelling, until she made accusations like that. I forgot, he reminded her. Now he was pissed. This was going to be bad. The louder she got, the louder he got. Eventually, she was shrieking at him. A responsible voice inside him grew worried. She was really, really wound up this time. The tiny voice said that he couldn't let her drive off like this. She'd hurt herself. Hurt someone. It was a zookeeper voice. The voice that knew you couldn't let the animals run wild. No matter what. She took a bathroom break, still yelling, and Belle took advantage of the opportunity to hide her car keys. 
deep inside a box of stale Triscuits. Sure enough, when she emerged, she hunted for her keys. Lynn was notoriously bad about where she laid her keys. They could be anywhere. She hunted. For ten, fifteen minutes, she looked everywhere. Everywhere she might rationally have put her keys. She stopped yelling about Bell and started quieting down. The quiet, Bell knew, was deceptive. It did not signal calm, just quiet, like a fire that gets into the walls, hidden, until someone opens a door. Bell realized he had made a mistake. She would keep looking forever. That was the problem. Sooner or later, he was going to have to tell her he'd hidden her keys, and she'd get worse. Get louder. The storm of the century. In some ways, he felt sorry for her. She was kind of crazy, really. More than kind of. Poor girl. But what a bitch. He almost said it aloud. In the end, she retreated to the bathroom again, and Belle put the keys in the silverware drawer, silently, like a cat burglar. She came back out, and the silverware drawer was the third place she looked. She had already looked there. Several times. And she knew it. Belle knew she knew it. You fucker, she whispered, almost choking, near tears. Remorse. He was no match for tears. He melted, moved toward her. He'd been protecting her. She whipped the keys at him, catching his left ear as he ducked. It was loud again for a while. Belle picked up the keys and opened the trailer door. Lynn had grabbed her purse. Give them here, she screamed. Belle ignored her. He drove off this time. He used up ten dollars of gasoline just driving in circles. He enjoyed the waste, enjoyed the drive, talked to himself. When he circled back, at last, he found her shivering on the steps. She'd been locked out. It was a cold fall evening. Remorse again. This was not fucking working. Mating is complicated. Mammals click. Personalities come together and they click sometimes. Other times they don't. The day after he and Lynn unclicked so badly, the day after he locked her out of the trailer, Bell and Cole sort of clicked. Bell couldn't have said what did it exactly. He was on the roof of the walrus tank, watching the pinnipeds heave their awkward bulk across wet concrete. Cole climbed the ladder and joined him. In the enclosure below, two males bellowed at each other, bumped chests. The smaller male backed off, retreating to the tank, but the larger walrus followed. It slipped its hulking form into the water and was suddenly graceful, like a different animal entirely. They stared together in silence until Cole said, simply, Well, goddamn. And they both cracked smiles. Reminds me of my dad growing up, Cole said. Big and mean, harder to get away from than you'd think. Bell cocked an eyebrow. Oh, a real tough guy, Cole continued. Beat my ass until I got bigger than him. Cole smiled war again. Bell was unsurprised when Cole showed him a silver flask and asked if he'd like a sip. And Bell had a sip. Just one. But it was enough to set the stage for a detour. After closing, to a nearby grill with a liquor license. Bell didn't feel like going home to Lynn, and Cole didn't feel like going back to the halfway house. He wasn't due for an hour yet. At the bar, Bell lit a cigarette and found himself talking about Lynn. He told Cole all about the money problem and the fight. Cole's cutting torch eyes burned as he listened. He looked terrifyingly wise all of a sudden. After two beers, Bell found himself saying out loud the thing he could barely admit to himself. I wish I'd stayed single, man. I really, really do. Just then, a woman wearing 50 pounds of makeup came in, clunked across the floor in square heels. Cole winked at her. She said something to the bartender and walked back out. Bell watched her go. 
The setting sun blazed straight in through the door as it wheezed shut. Bell winced, and, too late, shaded his eyes. Momentarily blind, blinking, Bell groped for his beer. Into this momentary darkness, Cole said, I crashed a helicopter, in case you wondered. Bell blinked. Cole's eyes became visible, twin coals. Huh? I noticed you didn't ask about my hands, or why I was in jail. You never ask nobody. It's actually pretty conspicuous the way you don't ever ask how anyone came to community service. You just give them some shit to do and mark down their hours. Bella must have looked troubled. Purple circles rotated in the dark in his brain. No, it's cool. It's cool you do people like that. Makes them feel normal. But not asking the way you do. It's kind of obvious how bad you want to know. So I'm telling you. I wrecked a helicopter. Cole was right. Bell wanted to know. Wanted to know quite badly. Hadn't realized until this moment. All right, he said, by way of encouragement. It took 15 minutes for Cole to tell about Brazil. He was a helicopter pilot, to begin with. First in the army, then for the president of a frozen chicken company. Then for United Airlines, on contract with Canadian Railways, shuttling engineers from checkpoint to checkpoint. It was the kind of solitary work he enjoyed. The engineers were usually stone-tired. Quiet. Then he crashed his United Airlines helicopter. The kind of thing that could happen to anyone. His tail rotor crapped out, and he had to auto-rotate down from 800 feet, spinning and yawing with three cursing, pants-pissing passengers, rolling sideways at the last second, landing sideways, splintering the rotor, rupturing the fuel tank. No deaths. The only serious injury was Cole, who remained behind until all three passengers were out and running, safe, sustained burns over 25% of his body, including the splashy scar tissue on his left hand and wrist. Bell began to ask a question, but Cole anticipated him. The other hand was something else, he said. Something later. United Airlines hadn't been cool about his benefits, and the hospital bankrupted him, could barely afford the surgery that let him use his hands, let alone reconstruction or cosmetics, which was why he started siphoning aircraft fuel. You could make a lot of money on the black market. Selling aircraft fuel at half price. A dangerous business, though. No honor among thieves and so on. Someone turned him in, and a federal warrant came looking for him. The feds called him while he was in the air, in Virginia near the coast, on his way to Richmond for a pickup. Put down at Richmond International, the FBI told him. And Cole had flown out to sea instead. How stupid did those bastards think a guy was? Stupid enough, he supposed, to get caught fencing felony amounts of helicopter fuel. Cole flew out to sea. Flew into the sea. If the feds wanted him, they were going to have to work for it. Bell must have looked at Cole's right hand. The fuel tank ruptured when I hit the waves, said Cole, draining his beer. Set the water on fire. I could either surface and tread water in the burning fuel, or stay under and grow gills. Happened when I was 27. They gave me nine years. Bell did the age math, but before he could ask, Cole said, Oh, I was in and out after that. Assault, mostly. The last one for a bar fight. Guy got his eye socket broken, and the judge gave me extra. Those women judges. They're the worst. She said my anger gonna burn me up someday. Cole smiled war again. But that already happened, ain't it? Besides, not all that burns is consumed. He took a last swallow of his drink. I gotta scoot. If they lock my ass out, I'm fucked. Very quickly, Cole was up and out the door. 
Bell turned and watched him go. And the sun hadn't quite set yet. And Bell's eyes got nailed a second time. Blind as a bat, Bell thought. Good zookeeper that he was. Bell knew bats weren't really blind, and he said so. What? called the bartender. Also, Bell thought, a zookeeper of sorts. Bats aren't really blind, Bell repeated. Never get drunk with the convicts, Bell lectured himself. It was a bad idea in so many ways. It was unprofessional. Besides, if you got to be drinking buddies with one of them, even going so far as to sip whiskey with them on top of the walrus tank, a firing violation by zoo rules, then what do you do afterward if the convict does something you should report him for? Something else. A week after the bar, Bell arrived at work and found Garland, the maintenance chief, waiting at the gate. There's an issue, said Garland. An issue? With your friend. He's drunk. Where? I have him shoveling the camel enclosure. Figured that would keep him out of the way until he sobered up a bit. Garland paused. Only I think he's a lot worse off than I thought. A headache came rumbling up on heavy treads. Bell sighed. Garland looked uneasy, too. It was bad news, Cole being drunk, especially if Garland had noticed it and let him work anyway. It was like Watergate. A lot of people could wind up in trouble before this was over. I thought I'd wait and see what you wanted to do, said Garland, as they walked uphill through the zoo. I didn't want to make out a report if it was just... Well, Bell understood. The old man was scary. Bell nodded. I'll handle it. At the camel enclosure, Bell called out Cole's name and the old man approached, shovel in hand. He smelled like rum. Yeah. The question had an edge to it, like Cole knew he was in trouble. For a moment, looking through the bars, Bell saw something aggressive in his eyes. Something leonine. Bell explained how it would go. Cole would drop the shovel. He would avoid speaking to anyone. He would leave by the back entrance. Now. So I'm fucked, Cole said. Bell shook his head. You called in sick today is all. This never happened. He should be firing this guy. Bell knew. Why didn't he? He could see it now. He'd tell Cole to get the hell out and not come back. And Cole would go to Coverman and say, Did you know I drank whiskey with Bell during work hours on top of the walrus tank? I'm fucked, Cole repeated. He swayed. Bell frowned. There was something that started out to be a long silence. Then Cole whispered, I'm not going back to jail. I won't do it. Bell let him out. Come back tomorrow, he said. Sober. It took exactly four weeks for the cocoons to hatch. There was a sound like electric lights going bad, and Bell stepped in the back room. He stared for a long time. The terrariums teemed with strange new life. Each glass box seemed to house a different creature entirely. Strange wasp things, and things not like wasps, things without names, some larger, some smaller, some with wings, some without. All were red and black. Impossible, he muttered. They couldn't all be the same species. His first instinct was to call the university. Then he remembered their note about mud daubers. Screw the university. Besides, instincts were for animals. He'd solve this on his own. He could figure it out. Bell was certain. He knew a lot about insects. He knew insects had been among the first living things to walk dry land. They'd seen the rise and fall of dinosaurs, the birth of flowering plants. Humans weren't the first species to farm or to domesticate animals. 
or to war. Those milestones belong to insects. When humanity first began its clumsy, ongoing experiment in agriculture, the Atine ants of South America had already long since perfected it, cultivating vast fungus beds in underground chambers in their nests, seeding carefully tended gardens with the clones of a fungus that linked back more than 30 million years. Another species of ant, Lossius flaws, managed large flocks of domesticated aphids, the aphids were kept in subterranean corrals where they grew mature and succulent, grazing the roots of plants, and were then milked for their nutrient-rich honeydew. Some termite mounds sprawled more than 30 feet in diameter, housing tens of millions of individuals, all bound up in a single, sophisticated caste system. Soldiers of Macrotermes bellicosus developed jaws so huge that they could no longer be used in feeding. Instead, they relied on teams of lower caste workers to lift sustenance to their mouths. Insects build cities and farms and superhighways. Slant your eyes and look hard enough, and you'll see a level of social sophistication that can only be described as civilization. Bell had often thought that humans had achieved their conspicuous position in the world, not because of how perfectly adapted they were, but because of how weak, how clumsy, how fragile they were, how unsuited to existence. One species of dairying ant secreted an enzyme from their heads that was carefully rubbed onto each aphid during the milking process. The enzyme disrupted wing development, preventing their aphids from ever flying away. Where humans came up with external solutions, like building fences, insects often found a more elegant solution, a biological solution. They'd had the time to do it. Determined and cautious, Bell fed the grubs every day and wrote down his observations. But still, Cole was the one who noticed it. When Bell finally understood, his mouth dropped open. Holy shit, he said. He looked at his notes. He'd fed the insects one of three different diets. The insects, which, as grubs, had eaten bread, did not now have wings, but stunted twists of chitin. Their color was dull red, like rust. More beetle-like, less wasp. Now, as adults, they still preferred bread. The fruit eaters still ate fruit. They were large-bodied and short-limbed, with stumpy wings that buzzed loudly as it made awkward flights inside the terrarium. Bell could imagine them making those same flights between distant stands of fruit. The meat eater was the most strange, blood red, with wings like blades, mouth parts huge and angular. They adapted, Bell said. They adapted to the food sources they ate as grubs. Bell shook his head in disbelief. Fast learners, Cole said. Then he moved as if to stick an experimental finger in the meat-eater cage. But Bell said, don't. Shauna, when he showed her the hatchling, said, can that happen? There it is, he said. But in his heart of hearts, he knew she was right to doubt. Like a million years of evolution in a single generation. No species adapts that quickly. It was a bad movie. Junk science. Not possible. But there it is, he repeated. The insects lived for more than a month. They buzzed or crawled or flitted around their cages. Over the course of a single week the following month, they took turns dying. The meat eater lived longest. After each die-off, Bell found egg cases. He cleaned the terrariums and put the egg cases back inside. Then he waited to see what would hatch. Late one evening, Shauna climbed up the ladder while he was in the barn loft at the petting zoo, checking the hay for rot, climbed up and stood behind him until he turned around, then stood on her toes and kissed him. If the zoo hadn't been closed and nearly deserted, if Bell hadn't known for sure that no one was likely to venture into the petting zoo, let alone climb into the loft, then maybe it would have happened differently. 
Maybe Belle would have kissed her back, because kissing would have been all that could happen. But the zoo was closed. Belle did know, and it did happen the way it happened. I can't, he said. She pulled away. I want to, he said. She looked at him, waiting. Beneath them, the horses shuffled, made noises, kicked their stall doors, and talked to each other in soft equine language. He thought of Lynn, home in their trailer. I can't, he said again. A black mood seized Bell on the way home. He drove the darkening highway, following his headlights into space. He pushed the old beater faster, watching the speedometer climb to 70, then 80. He took the curves without easing off the accelerator. The tires squealed, but held the road. His mind was a movie of loves and hates. He loved and hated his job, loved the animals, but hated the conditions, hated that he couldn't afford to live on what he was paid. When you're young, he thought, they tell you that if you get a degree, everything else will fall into place. But it's not that simple, is it? Nothing, not one thing, had worked out like it was supposed to. He thought of life at home, a second maze of contradiction. He was tired of being alone and together at the same time. He wanted to be free, but there was no freedom, no way out. He felt like an animal with a trapped limb. He understood why animals chew their own legs off. He had a recurring fantasy of being robbed and putting up a struggle. If he were held up at gunpoint, he had decided. He would not cooperate. He didn't know what to think of Shawnee yet. So he didn't at all. Red like rupture. Blood squirm. A coagulation of grubs across brown terrarium stones. The egg cases pulsed like clotted hearts, spilling strange new life. Bell stared through the glass. Each cage told the same story. The grubs were a centimeter long. Even as small as they were, Bell could see the mouth parts working each grub identical. As far as he could see, the differences which had been so apparent from cage to cage in the adult form were now absent from the next generation. The grubs were all the same, as if a reset button had been pushed. It was only the adult form that seemed vulnerable to change. Bell opened his sack lunch. He took out his apple and sliced it into a dozen pieces. He dropped a slice into the first cage. The grubs responded immediately, moving toward the fruit. They swarmed it. Bell fed the grubs first thing in the morning. He decided to turn it into an experiment. He stole a sheet of sticky labels from the staff room and stuck a label to the side of six different terrariums. On each label, he wrote a different word. The grubs labeled fruit were fed fruit. The grubs labeled meat were fed sliced meat. The grubs labeled control were fed a mixture of foods. The grubs with the cool sticker on the side of their terrarium were fed the control diet, but were also placed in refrigerator for an hour a day while Bell did his chores. An hour wasn't long enough to kill them, but it was long enough to impact their physiology. They grew slower than the grubs in the other cages. If these insects could really adapt to their environments, Bell was going to see how far he could push it. He'd see if diet was the only pressure they responded to. The grubs labeled heat were in a small glass aquarium placed on the floor near a space heater. Bell put his hands against the glass. It was hot to the touch. These grubs too seemed stressed by the temperature, but they still grew, doubling in size every week. The grubs labeled carrion were fed the occasional discarded rat from the Golden Eagle enclosure. These were the grubs Bell found most interesting. They burrowed into the dead rat and ate it from the inside out. Charles Darwin had believed in God until he studied the parasitic wasp, Ibelia. Darwin wrote in a journal, There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created wasps with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. 
Darwin found particularly gruesome that the Ibelia grub only gradually consumed the living tissues of its host, taking a full three years to complete its meal, saving the vital organs until last, as if to extend the host's suffering. Darwin couldn't imagine a god who would create something like that. Bell could imagine it. He thought of the reset mechanism. He imagined a single insect species with multiple phenotypes already encoded in its genome, a catalog of different possible adult forms, and all it took was a trigger to set the creature down its path. Maybe it's like blind cave fish, he told Shauna one evening. He watched Shauna's face as she peered through the glass. Cave fish have most of the genes for eyes still carried in their DNA, he said. All the genes required for lenses and retinas and eyelids. All the genes except for the one crucial ingredient that starts eye development in the first place. If you crossbreed two different populations of blind fish, sometimes you get fish with eyes. That doesn't make sense, Shauna said. It does if the blindness is recessive, and the two populations are blind for different reasons. But you said these things aren't breeding. Bell ignored her, lost in thought. Or they're like stem cells, he continued, each carrying the genes for multiple tissue types, multiple potentials, but they specialize as they mature, choosing a path. He leaned forward, tapping his finger on the glass. Where do you think they come from? Shauna asked. The fruit, maybe. The bananas. Central America. I'm not sure. Why can't you find it in books? There are millions of insect species still undescribed by science. Besides, maybe it has been described. Some version of it. I mean, how would you really know? Later, searching for reasons to avoid going home. Bell ran down his closing checklist twice. On his second round, he found the outer door to the lemur tunnel wide open. He had locked it himself, checked it himself. His inner alarm went off. Zookeepers developed inner alarms, or they developed scars. He stepped through the door and let his eyes adjust to the dark, to the long mildewy tunnel which ran under the moat, to the lemur island. At the end of the tunnel, bright light, because the door at the island end was open, too. In the middle, a silhouette. Who? Hey! Bell shouted. Several silhouettes. Sharp, jabbering shadows. Five or six lemurs hopped and shrieked. The shadow in the middle wound up like a pitcher and threw something. A yelp. The lemurs howled and ran. Coal? Called Bell, starting down the tunnel. One lemur didn't run. It whirled in confusion, chattering. Bell's eyes had adjusted. The shadow grew details. Cole. Cole, with a handful of smooth, white landscaping stones, eyes wide with rage. What the fuck are you doing? Bell shouted. They threw shit at me. They threw their fucking shit. Jesus Christ, Bell yelled lurching forward. Cole turned, arm pistoning in the dark. The stone whistled past Bell's ear and struck hard against the outer door. The tunnel echoed. Bell froze. Cole stepped toward him. You watch how you talk to me, he said. And for a moment they stared at each other, waiting to see what would happen. Then Cole's eyes changed the rage blown out of them like a gust of wind. Cole brushed past him and was gone. The lemur groped its way back into the light, back to the island. Bell unfroze, closed up, and said nothing. He'd have to say something, wouldn't he? Something would have to be done, right? He made a mental note. In the future, he wouldn't let crazy people into his life. He meant it. Metamorphosis is magic. Darwin had known this, too. Sometimes it is a dark magic. The metamorphosis of a tadpole into a frog, 
a grub into a wasp, a friend into an enemy. Bell watched the grubs feed. By now they'd grown huge. Some approached five inches in length, blood red, large beyond all reason. Soon they would spin their papery cocoons, turn into whatever they would turn into. Bell pondered the advantage of such an adaptive mechanism. Perhaps it was a way to guard against over-specialization, a reservoir of adaptive potential. Evolution is a slow process, and when conditions change, populations take time to react. There is a lag. Species that don't change fast enough die out. Bell knew of several kinds of island lizard that reproduced parthenogenetically. Such species, when found, were always young, isolated, at risk. They were aberrations outside the main thrust of evolution. Most were doomed, in the long run, because sexual reproduction is a much better way to create the next generation. In sexual reproduction, genes mix and match, new phenotypes arise, gene frequencies shift like tides. Sexual reproduction shuffles the genetic deck from one generation to the next. Parthenogenetic species, on the other hand, are locked in, playing the same card over and over. But not the insects in the back room. The insects in the back room seem to have a whole deck from which to deal, parthenogenetic or not. Such insects could adapt quickly, shifting morphotypes in a single generation, and then shift back the next. It was the next logical step. Not just evolution but the evolution of evolution. But how is it possible? Bell thought of Cole, of what made men like him. That old argument, nature versus nurture. In another time, in another place, Cole would have fit in. In another time, maybe Cole would have been a different person entirely. The descendants of Vikings and Mongols today wore suits and ran corporations, or veterinarians, or plumbers, or holy men. Perhaps tomorrow, or a thousand years from now, they'll need to be Vikings and Mongols again. Populations change, needs change, optimums change, and it all changes faster than selection can track. From a biological perspective, it would be easy to produce the same kind of people again and again. Stable people, good people, again and again, Generation after generation, a one-to-one -one correlation between gene set and expression. But that's not what you find when you look at humans. Instead, there is a plasticity in human nature, a carefully calibrated susceptibility to trauma. What looks like a weak point in our species is in fact design. Because the truth is that certain childhoods are supposed to fuck you up. It is an adaptive response. Wired into us, the ones who couldn't adapt died out. Those gene sets which always produce the same kind of people, stable people, good people, no matter the environment, no matter the violence, those gene sets which always played the same card again and again died out, leaving behind the ones who could metamorphose. We were not so different from these bugs. Bell unloaded all this on Shauna one day during lunch. They sat across from each other sipping soft drinks. The evolution of evolution? Yeah, he said. Why would this happen in insects, she asked. Because they've been here longest, he said. But it was more than that. He thought of the ants and their aphids, the enzyme that clipped their wings. He thought of the different ways that insects solve their problems. Because insects... Always choose the biological solution. Bell avoided Cole for days. He told himself he was waiting for a good time to see the director, to tell her what had happened in the lemur tunnel. Told himself he wasn't afraid that Cole would retaliate by telling about drinking together on zoo time, zoo property. Both were lies, but what he had the toughest time with was pure simple fear of Cole. Ridiculous, he told himself. You're a grown man and a professional. On the other hand, Cole obviously was dangerous. Maybe he could get Cole to leave, 
to resign his service contract without anyone having to tell the director anything. This seemed, on reflection, to be the best bet for an outcome where he, Bell, kept his job and got rid of the problem. The reflection took place at home, on the sofa, in front of the TV, in his underwear. When Lynn crossed the room, he saw himself through her eyes. He looked like a bum. She was thinking, he knew, what an asshole he was for buying beer. He didn't care. Neither did she, it seemed. She sat down on the couch beside him. What was he? When had he turned into a person who said nothing, did nothing? What had he let himself turn into? The next day, Bell followed Cole down to the supply shed and said, We're going to have a talk. Cole took a set of eight-foot pruning shears down from the wall rack and turned to face Bell. Yeah, he said. Bell fumbled for a beginning, forgetting what he'd rehearsed. Cole began whistling. He leaned on the pruning shears as if they were a wizard's staff. I have to turn you in, Bell said. For what? Throwing rocks at the animals. Cole stared at him. His grip on the shears tightened. I lose my temper sometimes. I have a temper, I admit. That's why you can't be here. Listen, I'll work on it. I'll be better. Bell shook his head. I'm just letting you know as a courtesy. I have to report it. You don't have to do anything. The other choice is that you leave today and don't come back. That's not any choice at all. There are other places you can do your service. I like it here. Here doesn't like you anymore. You know what I don't like? I don't think I like you trying to push me around. Today is your last day here. One way or the other, Bell said. You can leave on your own, or you can be ushered out. You really don't want to do that. You're right. I don't, Bell said. Cole's face changed. I'm warning you. Bell raised his walkie-talkie, never taking his eyes off Cole. Garland? He spoke into the handset. There was a squelch, then a voice. Yeah? You better come to the supply shed. What's wrong? Now, Garland. Cole shoved Bell into the wall, shoved him hard, so his teeth clacked. And the rage was there again in the cutting torch eyes. Rage like nothing else mattered. Scarred hands curled into Bell's shirt. This is your last chance, Cole said. Bell only smiled, feeling something shift inside him. He found suddenly that he was through being scared. Fuck you, he said. Bell ducked the first blow, but the second caught him upside the head, splitting his brow open. Bell spun away, throwing an elbow that missed, and then they were both off balance, taking wild swings, and Cole grabbed at him, and they were falling. They hit the ground and rolled, wrestling on the filthy floor. Cole came up on top, sitting on Bell's legs. I fucking warned you, he hissed. And then he rained down punches until Garland tackled him. After that, it was two on one, and Bell didn't feel the least bit guilty about that. The zoo super interviewed Bell for her report. They sat in her office. Behind her, against the wall, her fish swam their little circles. The superintendent leaned forward and laced her hands together on her desk. She didn't dig very deep. Seemed to think Cole's behavior was its own explanation. I think you need stitches, she said. Bell nodded. He touched his brow. His first zoo scar. He'll be barred from the zoo, of course, she said, and I'll insist that his community service hours be revoked. What's going to happen to him now? Charges, probably. I don't want to press charges. Animal cruelty. The lemurs. He's going back to jail. She paused, then added. When they find him. Bell looked at the fish, swimming in the aquarium. He said he's never going back. That evening, as he was closing up, 
Belfoncol's parting gift. Found it revealed at first in the presence of a door ajar. The back room of the castle. After the fight, Cole had climbed to his feet, wiped the blood from his face, and then walked off, heading toward the gates. Even two on one, the fight had been about even. And when Cole had finally stepped back, wiped the blood from his face and walked away, Bell and Gavin let him go. A draw. They'd assumed Cole left Sue property. But he hadn't left. He'd circled back around to the castle. And he'd poured lye into each and every terrarium. Several grubs were on the cement floor, ground into pulp with a boot. Others were desiccated husks. Only a few still moved, writhing in the white powder. Bell stepped further into the room, surveying the carnage. He should have known. He should have known this was coming. Bell's inner alarm started bothering him on his way home that night. Once a zookeeper developed an inner alarm, it worked everywhere. In this case, it was less an alarm than a sense of something out of place. It got stronger as he closed in on the trailer park. At first, he thought the alarm had something to do with coal. But when he got home, he understood. The universe had an interesting sense of timing. Lynn was gone. Not like gone to the store. Gone, left, leaving him. She left a note about it. The note explained. Blamed him. Distantly, he heard himself curse. All Belle could think at first was that she didn't seem to have taken anything. Like there was nothing about their life worth bothering with. She had written the whole thing off, it seemed. Him, their life, a total loss. He made some growling noises. She might be back. She might change her mind. The stereo, after all, was really hers. She'd had it before they moved in together, and they'd never been able to afford a new one. Somberly, he unplugged the stereo. In something like a trance, he planted it in the sink and turned on the water. Like a zombie, he let the water run and started searching the trailer for enough change to buy beer. The next month passed in a haze. Word filtered down as word always did. And it turned out Cole had skipped town. The cops were still looking. Not many of the grubs had survived Cole's attack. The ones that did were scarred. Cole had been very thorough, even pouring lye in the terrarium on the floor. In all, only a handful of the grubs finished their cocoons. A few from the control cage. A few from the terrarium marked heat. But they were twisted things, these cocoons. Damaged things. His experiment was ruined. His hope was that he'd be able to get at least a few reproducing adults. Start over. If the cocoons hatched at all. And word had filtered down, too, that it would be bad for Cole when he was caught. Because the list of charges had grown, and the warrant had sprouted teeth. Cole was facing time real time for what had happened. Bell knew Cole would need someone to blame. He would blame Bell, and he would blame the zoo. Several weeks later, Bell pulled into the parking lot and found there were fire trucks already in the lot. Hoses ran upward along the hill. Black smoke curled into the sky. Bell ran. He knew what he'd see before he saw it. The castle was engulfed in flame. The firefighters fought the blaze, but Bell knew it was too late. He imagined the animals inside, baking. He imagined the sizzle and pop of burst skin, the soundless cries of dying snakes and lizards and frogs and bugs. He imagined his insects burning alive. He looked around, searching for coal, wondering if he'd stayed long enough to watch it burn. When the fire was out, Bell walked through the ruins. The devastation was complete. Dead frogs and snakes and lizards. In the back room, he found the terrariums blackened and cracked. The insects inside, charred and unrecognizable. Except for one. The terrarium on the floor. The terrarium with the heat sticker, now curled and blackened. The cocoon was charred, split wide by the heat. 
there was no grub inside. They found Cole's body later that day in the weeds behind the parking lot. Bell watched them load the body into the ambulance. Dark and swollen, it had been a bad death. There were burns, minor, across his hands, like he'd come too close to his creation. Burns and something else, something like stings, eyes swollen shut, anaphylactic shock. Not everything burned in the fire, not all that burns is consumed. Cole had said that once. Bell stood there for a long time, listening, listening for a buzz like an electric light. But there was no sound, only the sound of wind in the trees. It was long gone, whatever it was. He just wished he could have seen what the grub had turned into. Next year it would be different. Next year it would be a fruit eater, or a wasp, or a beetle. It would be what it needed to be. It would be what the world made it. Approaching home, Bell felt his inner alarm stir again. The cable had been turned off. Those cocksuckers didn't know who they were dealing with. Bell had gotten drunk two nights in a row now, and he was feeling mean, feeling predatory. He stalked outside, nine trailers down to the cable box, opened it up with a hex wrench and hooked his cable back up, went home and surfed channels for anything resembling porn. After two hours of this, his thumb hurt, and the battery on the remote died. He heard the screen door open. Lynn? In the moment before the inner door opened, it occurred to him that her stereo was still soaking in the kitchen sink. He had a momentary, fearful impulse. His leg jerked. Then the beer kicked back in. He slouched back. He sneered like a sleepy lion. A shape in a doorway. Shauna. His sneer disappeared. She stepped inside and said nothing. Looked at him a moment, as if reading him. Slouched down beside him with the sack of takeout chicken. His hand, heavy and lazy, rested on her leg. She tugged his hand higher. They didn't talk. Even the TV flashed in silence. Outside the thin walls, the world licked itself and made hunting noises. This wind blowing, and this tide. Damien Broderick. Here's a fascinating study of the border country between science and the paranormal, where remote viewing psychics take us a little further afield than usual, all the way out to the frozen wastes of Titan. Australian writer, editor, futurist, and critic Damien Broderick, a senior fellow in the School of Cultural Communications at the University of Melbourne, made his first sale in 1964 to John Carnell's anthology, New Writings in SF, 1. In the decades that followed, he has kept up a steady stream of fiction, nonfiction, futurist speculations, and critical work, which has won him multiple Dittmar and Aurelius Awards. He sold his first novel, Sorcerer's World, in 1970. It was later reissued in a rewritten version in the United States as The Black Grail. Broderick's other books include the novels The Dreaming Dragons, The Judas Mandala, Transmitters, Striped Holes, and The White Abacus, as well as books written with Rory Barnes and Barbara Lamar. His many short stories have been collected in A Man Returns, The Dark Between the Stars, Uncle Bones, four science fiction novellas, and the upcoming The Quilla Engine, science fiction stories. He also wrote the visionary futuristic classic The Spike, how our lives are being transformed by rapidly advancing technology. A critical study of science fiction. Reading by Starlight, postmodern science fiction. Edited the nonfiction anthology Year Million, Science at the Far End of Knowledge, as well as editing the SF anthology Earth is But a Star, Excursions Through Science Fiction to the Far Future and three anthologies of Australian science fiction, The Zeitgeist Machine, 
Strange Attractors, and Matilda at the Speed of Light. Broderick also serves as the fiction editor for the Australian science magazine Cosmos, which publishes a science fiction story per issue. Has anyone else had word of him? Not this tide, for what is sunk will hardly swim, not with this wind blowing and this tide. My boy Jack, Rudyard Kipling, 1915. The starship was old, impossibly old, and covered in flowers. Despite a brisk methane breeze, not a petal nor a stamen of the bright blooms moved. Under an impervious shield, they remained motionless, uncorrupted, altogether untouchable. They're alive, reported the Navy remote viewer. When I was a kid, the idea that the armed services might employ a trained, technologically enhanced psychic would have got you a derisive smack in the ear from your elders and betters, even though the American CIA ran a remote viewing program called Stargate back in the last century, before they ostentatiously closed it down and took it to black ops. This viewer was blind alike, but saw better than the rest of us by other means, on a good day. Like me, sort of, in my own itchy way. He stood at the edge of the huge flower-bedecked vessel, gloved, open palms held outward, his hands vibrating ever so slightly, like insect antennae hunting a pheromone. It's amazing. Those blossoms are still alive after, what, millions of years? I can't find my way in yet, but I can detect that much, even through the stationary shield. Is that the same as, uh, you know, stasis field? I asked the Marine Master Sergeant standing guard beside us. I turned to face her and bobbed sickeningly. Two days ago, I had been on Ganymede and on Earth's moon before that. Now I walked on another world entirely, around yet another world entirely. It wasn't right for a man as ample as I to weigh so little, especially with Titan's bruised peach air pushing down on me half again as heavily as Earth's. It went against nature, even with the body glove wrapping me and an air tank on my back. I only weighed about 18 kilos, say 40 pounds, a tenth of what the scales would show back home. Stasis, my ass! That's sci-fi nonsense, she barked. Media technobabble, like your own... She bit the rest of her sentence off, perhaps fortunately. This here is hard science. So sorry. And please don't speak again without an invitation to do so, Sensei Park. We don't want to put Mr. Meagle off his stroke. Opening his startlingly blue blind eyes, the Navy viewer laughed. The sound echoed oddly in his body glove and through our sound loop. All sounds did, out on the orange snowy surface of Titan. Let him natter on, Marion. I'm entangled now. You'd have to cut my head off and pith my spine to unhook me from this baby. I wondered idly how either of them would respond if I told them I was the reason, or at the proximate occasion, that they were here. They'd regard me as a madman, probably. My role in developing the portage functor was undercover about as deep as any since the creation of the U.S. Office of Strategic Services in 1945, long before the CIA got tight with clairvoyance. Perhaps these people already did consider me deluded. Yeah, it was true that I'd told them where to look for the starship, but it wasn't as I had the credentials of a remote viewer. So, undoubtedly, it was just an accident. Right. I felt the pressure of the thing, its causal gravitas, as I gazed down at the starship. If that's what it was, under its stationary shield and floral tribute. This thing on Titan had been tugging at me, at my absurd and uncomfortable and highly classified gift, since I was four or five years old, running in the streets of Seoul, 
playing with a red devil soccer ball and picking up English and math. A suitable metaphor for the way a child might register the substrate of a mad universe and twist its tail. My own son, little Song Dom, plagued me with questions when he too was a kid, no older than I'd been when the starship buried under tons of frozen methane and ethane had plucked for the first time at my stringy loops. If light's a wave, Daddy, can I surf on it? Brilliant, lovely child. No, darling son, I said. Well, not exactly. It's more like a Mexican football wave. It's more like an explosion of excitement that blows up. I pulled a big-eyed face and flung my arms in the air and dropped them down. Boom! Song laughed. But then his mouth drooped. If it's a wave, Dad, why do some people say it's made of packets? Well, said I, you know that a football wave is made of lots and lots of team supporters, jumping up and sitting down again. He wasn't satisfied, and neither was I, but the kid was only five years old. Later, I thought of that wave, sort of not there at all at one end then plumping up in the middle, falling to nothing again as it moved on. Follow it around the bleachers, and you've got a waveform particle moving fast. Kind of. But for a real photon, you needn't follow it. It's already there. Its onboard time is crushed and compressed from the moment of launch to the final absorption. Just one instantaneous blip in a flattened, timeless universe. Why... You could jump to the moon, or Ganymede, or even Titan, all in a flash. Just entangle yourself with it, if you knew how. As I showed them how, much later. Like Mr. Meagle, remote viewing is impenetrable stationary starship. Physics! You're soaking in it. I can likely get more now, sitting in my relaxation cell back at Huygens, Meagle said. He looked very calm, as if he just stepped out of an immersion tank but there was a faint quivering around his blind eyes. I watched his face in my view mask, as if neither of us wore gloves over our heads. The man was exhausted. So tell me, Mr. Park, he said, as we turned and made our way to the big wheel jitney. What were your own impressions, sir? Scrupulous about not front-loading me with hints of his own. I like that. Anyone, or any thing, who loves flowers that much, I said judiciously, can't be all bad. Huygens had provided me with a customized, broad-beamed, sanitary personal. I have authoritative hams and a wide stance. It degloved me with slick efficiency. I relieved myself with a gratified sigh. While body gloves have the capacity to handle such impositions of the mortal order, the experience is undignified and leaves a residual aroma trapped inside with one's nostrils. So I tend to hold on. We had been outside for hours without a pit stop. The sanitary squirted and dabbed, removed sweat from my perspiring hide with its dry tongue, dusted powder across the expanse, set me free. I dressed in my usual unflattering robe and made my way directly to the commissary bubble. I was starving. Banali, the wall and ceiling display showed a foe of thrice magnified Saturn, four hand widths across, tilted optimally to show off the gorgeous ring system. I'd just seen the reality outside with nothing between me and the ringed planet itself but a protective film and a million or so kilometers of naked space above the bright Xanadu regional surface where we'd stood. Since we were almost at the equator, Saturn's belt had been a thin glitter in the photomultipliers in our body glove masks, and would be invisible to the naked eye, directly overhead, right and left of the primary's waist. Not truly impressive. Of course, even with the high-frequency step-downs of the photomultipliers, the atmosphere looks hazy anyway. This magisterial feed on the wall was probably coming today 
from one of the polar sats keeping an eye on the big feller. It seemed to me a bit tacky, a lame pretense. But then again, Titan is tidally locked, so it must get a tad wearying for the regular staff, seeing exactly the same thing in the sky forever, whatever installation dome you're at, Huygens or Herschel at the North Pole. Except that nothing is ever the same. All is nuance, the slow fortnightly progression of light and shade, the phases of the sun's illumination of the big ball of gas. Well, these were scientists and military, most of them. What could one expect? I loaded my tray with rather edible boeuf bourguignon from the dedicated cuisine printer, took it to a table where a handful of my new colleagues were chowing and jawing away, sat down at the spare place, set to after a genial glance around. At least with the queasy low gravity, I wasn't worried that this spindly conventional chair would give way abruptly beneath me, tipping my considerable butt ungraciously to the floor. It had been known to happen back on Earth. Nobody laughed derisively if it did. At least there was that. Not any more, they didn't. My sensei, said the Japanese biologist, Natasha Shai, with the slightest edge in her tone. Won't you join us for dinner? I do not give her title, nor do I mean any disrespect. All these eggheads had at least a couple of doctorates apiece. It went without saying. My Natasha, thank you. I believe I will. I started in on my second pearl onion. Good fare. They don't stint you. Nor should they. You are doing sterling work out here. Several of the boffins shared glances. Perhaps amused. They fancied themselves a cut above. The handsome, dark-haired fellow at the head of the table cleared his throat. So, have you been outside yet to pay your respects to the Enigma, Mr. Park? From the dossiers I'd memorized before leaving Jupiter's space, I recognized him, beneath his heavy, straggled beard, as the head of molecular engineering, Antonio Cayetani. Just got back from the tour, Dr. Cayetani. Fascinating. Right up my street. That's Tony, he said gracelessly. More glances flickered about the table. He chose to go right for it. Had to give him points for that. Unless I'm mistaken. Your street is paved with donations from the ID Institute. I had encountered this kind of feral attitude previously, of course, especially from hard-headed scientists of conventional stamp. I could even share a kind of empathy for his rancor. It was as if, from his highly credentialed point of view, a government-sponsored raving crackpot were to be imposed on his team. As if a SETI astronomer in the Fermi task force had been obliged to include a rectally probed UFO abductee, or a global proteome program forced to sign up a fundamentalist creationist. I shrugged. Oh, give the guy a break, Tony, said the Iranian artifact expert, Mansur Khosrojerdi. Let him eat his meal. His beard was darker and thicker even than Cayetani's. Granted, the temperature was nearly minus 200 degrees Celsius on the other side of the bubble. But this was self-mythologizing on a preposterous scale. Did they imagine they were rehearsing the doomed expeditions of the Arctic explorers? We can postpone the ideological catfights until after the cheese in Amontillado. No need to spare my delicate sensibilities, I said with a hearty laugh, and reached for the carafe of red wine, luminous as a garnet under spurious golden Saturn light. The woman to my right, the string loop specialist, Jandai Shumba, got there first with her competent, chunky hand. Dark as night. Allow me, Sensei Park. You are gracious, thanks. But let's all be friends. No need for formality. Call me Miang Hui. I grinned with big teeth at her dismay, then laughed out loud. No, that's an impossible mouthful. It's all right. Just call me Sam, love. 
Everyone does. Sam. A slightly uncomfortable silence fell. Scrapings of plastic flatware on realistic plates. I gobbled up my tasty beef, placed the empty plate back on my tray, slurped off some more of the stunningly convincing compiled Shiraz, took a bite of a lemon ginger dessert to die for, decorated with pistachios. Fermi 53. That's my considered opinion, I said with my mouth full. My tentative, preliminary opinion, naturally. There are no recognizable roses or jonquils or violets or orchids, obviously. But the flowers scattered over the vehicle certainly do appear to be derived from earth angiosperms, specialized to a range of climates and coevolutionary biomes, said Natasha Shai, so far as we can tell purely from visual inspection. Which rules out Fermi 53 instantly, Antonio Cayetani said. Blossoms of such complexity and beauty did not evolve on Earth until the Holocene. Probably not until humans deliberately bred the cultivars during the rise of agriculture. Oh, let's not oversimplify, Tony, Natasha said. Pollinator insects and hummers and lizards and all the rest. They speciated along with the angiosperms. They sculpted each other without any help. Yes, I grant you. Early humans broke up the soil to an unprecedented extent so they could grow their dinner, and then, as a sideline, retained and cultivated those blossoms that especially well, made them happy. They're our botanical pets now, because flowers make us smile and feel good. They induce positive emotions. They're scented sex organs, Kayatani said, doing their job. I'd finished eating, for the moment. The first flowering plants, I pointed out, evolved 65 million years prior to the Shikshalub catastrophe. Nice symmetry, that. As far back in time before the extinction of the dinosaurs as we now stood after it. I didn't need to spell that out. These were, after all, highly trained intellects. But I had to add the obvious, the intolerable, the all but unthinkable crux. Humans, I remind you, were not the only cultivators. I found I had no appetite for cheese and pushed back my chair. Do you allow smoking here? Anyone for cigars and port? No, said Cayetani brusquely. Sensei Park, we are scientists, not mystagogues. I confess myself bewildered by your presence at Huygens. Jendai Shumba pulled at his sleeve. He shook her off. I am frankly offended that the Imperium invited a quack from the Intelligent Dinosaur Institute here to Titan. Shumba kicked his leg under the table. I saw and felt the small causal shock of her intention and its manifestation. Because that's who I am. That's what I do. I have nothing more to say to you. He looked away disdainfully, drew his own dessert plate in front of him scooped up a heaping spoonful of tiramisu and shoved it into his left eye. Hard. I raised one eyebrow, sighed, and rose, gathered my soiled crockery and plasticware on the tray, and walked away from the table. He probably wouldn't lose the sight in his eye. But what could I do? Speaking technically, I'm an ideological distortion. Less pompously, there's something buried deep inside me that screws with cause and effect. I'm a footloose bubble of improbability. Call me a witch, or a freak if you'd prefer. It rolls more easily off the tongue. Chances are good, though, that if you do call me nasty names, and I get to hear about it, you'll trip over the kid's bike in the dark, or run into an opening door, and break something painful. It's not that I harbor resentment at name-calling, but my unconscious seems to. As I say, not much I can do about that. Sorry. There were ructions and alarms, but I brushed them off, went to bed and slept, as I had done every night for five years, like a damned soul. 
My gift or curse does not permit me to stand aside from that which wraps me like a shroud. Sorrow eddied in my dreams. My son. And as so often these days, the booming, tolling voices came to me from a century and a half past. Voices I have heard only in my head, reading their words on the pages of old books I found in an abandoned library, stinking with the reek of extinguished fires, where I had crept for silence like a heavy old dog with a wound too great to bear. The words were in English, that tongue almost as familiar to me as my own, picked up in the streets, later honed in special classes for promising children. I knew nothing of the writer, save that he was a man of substance in his place and time. His words raised a resonance in my burned soul. He must have known this same agony, and sought some bitter draught of comfort. O oh, sorrow, cruel fellowship, O oh, priestess in the vaults of death, O oh, sweet and bitter in a breath, what whispers from thy lying lip? The stars, she whispers, blindly run. A web is woven across the sky. From out waste places comes a cry, and murmurs from the dying sun. And all the phantom, nature, stands, with all the music in her tone, a hollow echo of my own, a hollow form with empty hands. And woke in the morning by the conventional earth clock calibrated to soul time, GMT plus nine hours. As always alone, empty hollow form and all, despite the web woven palpably across the sky, and ravenously hungry, as usual. So I ate a healthy breakfast and went to watch Meagle on close circuit, a feed from the audiovisual record that military remote viewers are obliged to make for assessment, interpretation, and the archive. Today he sat Zazen in a small cell, like a non-denominational chapel. If chapels come with voice-activated holography displays, and maybe they do. I'm not a religious man. Hands curled upward on his knees. His breathing was slow, regular. Maybe this was what their protocol called cooling down. His blind eyes were open, apparently fixed on the deep blue depths of the holly. Upon his head was a crown of thorns, a tidy maze of squid detectors pulsing to the quantum state of his brain, his brainstem, his meditative consciousness. Looking at the vehicle from above, he murmured, still can't find my way in. Yet, his lips quirked the smallest amount. Who dares wins, I thought. Semper Fi, rah, rah. Well, it took a lot of quiet confidence in one's oddball abilities, no doubt. My own kind of disreputable ability just happened to me. More around me. Get back to the signal line, a gravelly voice said. Someone not in the room. His controller, I supposed his operator, whatever they called the role. He's physically blind. I realize that, I told the medical officer seated beside me in the observation booth. But doesn't knowing the identity of the target sort of pollute his... his guesswork? The viewer does not guess. No offense. I mean, bias him unconsciously with preconceived notions. Front-loading, they called it. I knew that much. Like that stasis field thingy. Can we be sure that's not some scrap of nonsense from a comic strip he read when he was a child? Mr. Meagle has well passed all such neophyte hazards, the nurse said, offended by my uppity kvetching. He had gray hair at his close-cropped temples and a steady gaze. Almost certainly a veteran of the war in... I shut that thought down. Hard. The colonel can afford to depart from the lockstep of traditional protocol, as he does when it suits him. I nodded, made soothing conciliatory sounds. Perhaps mollified, he explained. It contracts the search path polynomially. Um, I said. 
and settled back to view the sketched images form. Dissolve. Reform in the imaginary three space of the holograms. As Meagle's fingers move through the air, unseen lasers track the shapes he sketched. It seemed, watching him, that he actually felt his way around this starship out there in the frozen crust of Titan. Kinesthetic imagery, a kind of heightened physicality, perhaps unavailable to a sighted person. Or was that nothing better than my whimsy, my fat man sentimentality? Moving downward, gravity tugs at me, the remote viewer murmured. His voice was drowsy. I saw his shoulders spasm, as if he were falling forward and had caught himself. Wake up there, Colonel, the voice said, without reproach. You're drifting. He's sliding into phase two. That was hypnic myoclonia, the nurse commented. Jack detation. Haven't slept since yesterday, Meagle muttered. He shook himself. Okay. Got it. I'm in. The screens, trying to emulate whatever it was the psychic was seeing, feeling, bloomed with a burst of visual noise. Were those things sketchy blocks of cells? Like the hexagonal innards of a beehive? They shrank, jittered, smoothed into a kind of curvy passageway. The image was being enhanced by the computer's analysis, drawing on an archive of Meagle's private symbols. Analytical overlay, the operator said in a tone of admonition. I don't. No. This is what I'm actually perceiving. My God, Charlie, the place is so fucking old. Millions of years. Tens of millions. Give me some stage three. Weirdly beautiful man. But alien. Not insects, I'm pretty sure. The overlapping images loped along, as if from a camera mounted on a cartoon's shoulder. Is this how the blind imagine seeing? Meagle had been sightless from birth, the dossier had informed me. But maybe that shouldn't be surprising. The blind repurpose the cortical and precortical tissues specialized by evolution for visual capture and registration. The large, dedicated occipital lobe, the striate V1 cortex, all the way up the V hierarchy to middle temporal MT, pathways carrying neural trains from the retina to the brain, interpreting, pruning as they flash their binary code. Yada yada. His sensitive, trained brain had nabbed that spare capacity, retained its function, modified its input channels. The marvel that is your brain. I overheard my own mocking subliminal commentary and wondered why I was so anxious suddenly. A kind of curdling in the causal webs. I felt more and more uncomfortable, as if I badly needed to take a dump. Maybe I did. Meagle had fallen silent, dropping off to sleep again. No, the constructed image was sliding past us in the hologram, slurring and breaking up in detail. But it was a corridor he walked along, in his spirit walk or whatever you call it. Something sitting in a large padded chair. Christ! Christ! Meagle cried loudly. Small indicator lights went from placid green to blipping yellow on one display. A histogram surfed briefly into the red. The nurse was clicking keys, fast and unrattled. Bingo, Colonel, said the operator, triumph shaking his professional sang froid. My etiological sense scrambled. I lurched up, leaned forward, ready to puke. Meagle was doing the same. Cable tangled at his neck, contacts pulling from his cropped scalp. In the great chair shown on the screen, as the imaginary viewpoint swung about, the interpretive computer sketched a seated person with a snout and deep-set hooded eyes, clawed hands gripping bank controls on the armrests. The image skittered and jittered, revised itself as the causal whirlpool screeched around me. But no! This wasn't the dragon I was looking for. 
It was. It wasn't. The machine image spoke directly to me through Meagle and memory. That dead person, that ancient thing in its ancient warship, it was, was impossible. Delusion and grief. Something else. I knew the beloved face beyond denial, of course. Like a clumsy pencil drawing on the screen that tore my heart out. Human. Face burned down in places to the bone. Gaze suffering. Mouth mute. Determined even in death. In his stained UN uniform. With Korean Imperium lieutenant flashes at the collar. Oh, Lord God, I moaned, and did barf then, like a puling schoolboy drunk. From the corner of my leaking eyes, in the window feed from his RV cell, I saw Meagle turn convulsively. He seemed to stare right at me, through the camera, into the display, with his blue, blind eyes. The main hologram image, too, looked steadfastly back at me, Sketch from the naval remote viewer's words and speaking hands, his brain rhythms, the archived set of his stereotypical ideograms. Looked at me from a grave five years dug in the soil. Song Dom, my son, my poor boy, my lost hero child. I started to cry, wiping at my bitter mouth, and couldn't stop. Huygens is not part of the Imperium, of course, being a research agora, like Herschel, the other settlement on Titan. But it is a fiscal affiliate of Korea, as well as of Zimbabwe, the Brazilian superstate, Camp Barsoom, on, you guessed it, Mars, and a handful of other policies on the moon and Ganymede. So while the writ of Mr. Kim, my sponsor, did not run on Titan precisely. His paternal hand was heavily in the weighing scales. The warlord had developed a fondness for the intelligent dinosaur paradigm when he studied paleontology as a young student in Antarctica, where all the equivocal evidence was located prior to the Enigma's excavation, and he carried that interest through into maturity, and, some said, senility. He would be pleased as punch, Dr. Kayatani, surprise, surprise, was not. Everyone by now had studied the remote viewing session, and more than once. My participation and role could be determined only by inference, since no recorders had been trained on the observation room. But the recording of Meagle's results showed plainly the results. The alien or saurian, and moments later, the harrowing, superimposed image of my late son. For Kayatani, I'm sure, my distress, my involvement, was just a piece of hammy theatrics, a shameful way to spray my mark onto an historic event. This afternoon, we know nothing more than we did a week ago, he stated bluntly. I'm candidly dismayed at the gullibility of some of my colleagues here. The Saurian, began Jendai Shumba, he cut her off instantly. The image was no more veridical than the the disturbed imposition into the colonel's entangled state of Sensei Park's tragic fixation on his son's death. Nobody doubts that Mr. Park is a functioning poltergeist, capable of casting images and interfering with complex electronic systems. It's why he's here, over my objections, and isn't the point... He took a deep breath, his features flushed behind that pretentious beard. Our visitor's martyred son is certainly not aboard that Jurassic artifact, and surely nobody thinks he is. Neither, by the same token, is the dinosaur space captain that Mr. Park's well-prepped imagination also dreamed up and shoveled into the idiot's face. With all due respect... You're out of your depth, Tony. This one I hadn't met before. An industrial psychiatrist named Lionel Berger. Back off, will you? Remote viewing is no exact science. Nor even an accomplished art. 
and I mean no disrespect to Colonel Meagle in pointing this out. We don't know how it works, except that quantum field non-locality is engaged and implemented by an act of deliberation. Its famous vulnerability is that other minds can become trapped into the entanglement and add their own measures of information. But whether that aggregate data is veridical, symbolic, mythological, or sheer fantasy, we can't tell just by simple inspection. Dismissing this evidence by flinging about words like psychic and poltergeist is argument by slur. I'm prepared to wait for more evidence before I decide so confidently what's inside that vessel. Kayatani, the surly fellow, actually said, Bah! I'd never heard anyone actually say that before. Others spoke in their turn. Meagle sat at the back, his blind eyes closed, sunk into a sort of exhausted torpor. I'd have liked to go to him, sit beside him in respectful and sorrowing silence. Instead, as requested, I also remained silent, half listening to the academies, the scholasticism, the stochasticism, the loop theories of cognitive reconstructuration. I had seen my dead son. I had seen the Saurian sat in his great chair. Or hers. If cause is a pool of chaos and order blended by intention and brute event, I am, and nobody, as yet, has managed to explain why it is so. A small stick of dynamite exploding up random fishy critters to the shore. Brr. That's a macabre, self-lacerating image. It had been my boy Song, who perished in mindless explosions, and not by my hand. But hadn't I sent him into fatal danger, into ultimate harm's way? Of course I had, not by urging or forbidding, in so many words, but in my reckless skepticism, my loose lack of patriotism, which had fetched us up where? Him? smashed like a detonated fish in a pool he could not escape, did not wish to escape. Me? Bereft, alone, my bond to my nation, long ago broken and betrayed. I grunted aloud, hoisted myself into a less uncomfortable position on a seat too small, as usual, for my girth. Sam? You wanted to say something? I looked around. They were gazing at me expectantly. Oh, nothing. What can I donate that hasn't already been weighed and found wanting? It was petty and self-regarding, and I snapped my mouth shut. But a fierce anger burst up in me anyway, so I opened it again. I'll say one thing, and make no apologies for it. We are here. I swung one arm through an embracing arc taking in the auditorium, the station, Titan. Because, years ago, when I was still on Earth, I discerned a causal anomaly near this place. We are here because military and independent remote viewers on three worlds concurred in finding and describing the vehicle. We are here, therefore, driven by the many motives that arose from that discovery. But I insist that the principal occasion is Premier Kim's wish to test the hypotheses forwarded by the scientific entity I represent. I took a deep breath. So far as I can see, what Colonel Meagle uncovered this morning corroborates precisely the predictions of the Intelligent Dinosaur Institute. If my presence has muddied your waters, I'm sorry. But again, I remind you, if it were not for me, none of you would be here today. So, lay the hell off, okay? I dug in my robe's pocket, found a Mars bar, unpeeled it, and gobbled it down. Shortly after Song Dom's eighth birthday, his mother long since escaped back into the whorehouse alley she and I had both come from, I took him with me on a business trip to Palo Alto. I was the object of the business trip, my absurd gift, my poltergeist prowess with cause and effect. 
Several Stanford biophysics researchers had somehow picked up trash journalism stories about me as the luckiest, unluckiest man on earth. Funding was limited, but I convinced them that Song was in my sole charge and that I wasn't budging without him. So we took an exhausting flight from Incheon International across the Pacific and through the absurd indignities of U.S. homeland security, despite a graduate student being on hand at the airport to collect us, now cooling his heels in the arrival lounge with a wilting cardboard sign in two languages. I had inadvertently set off various bells and whistles, so of course we were detained pointlessly until one of the senior professors was persuaded to drive to the airport and vouch for us, and stayed in an anonymous, ugly block of apartments that seemed to have been compiled from polyurethane, pretending to be marble. We could hear the dreary TV set next door through the adjoining wall. I took Song for a long walk so he and I could get a feel for the alien place, this America, as we stretched our weary legs. Within three blocks, trust my causal eddies for once, we found a Korean food store, established at my parents' modest residence in Nangok, back at the turn of the century when it was still a squalid slum in a hilly area of Silamdong, Wanok District, was just spitting distance from the proprietor's familial stamping grounds, and found ourselves dragged happily to a nearby park by Mr. Kwan's wife and three kids, to fly dragon kites in the cool afternoon breeze. I helped Song pay out the string. Our borrowed kite was a scarlet and gold dragon diamond, a gift to us both, as it turned out. And thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Kwan. Our dragon quivered on the middle air a moment, strained against his leash, then suddenly flung himself upward into the deepening blue Californian sky. The line went taut. Song let it go in fright, but I held tight, and a moment later he put his hands back to the winch reel beside mine. I saw the line stretched between my hand, his small, resolute hands, and the high, swooping, flower-bright dragon, a luminous string. Daddy, look, said my son, wild with excitement. Our dragon is flying on a beam of photons. At that moment as if Buddha had smacked me in the ear. I was enlightened. I think I can get in, I told the director of operations, a tight-jawed fellow named Nangung, almost certainly a political appointee, but in secure possession of a decent scientific reputation with degrees in geology and astrobiology. Earth and sky, I thought, but hid my smile. I think I can break the shield. The question is, do I dare? Yes, precisely. If you rupture the stationary shield, who knows what might seep out into the atmosphere? He gave me a thin-lipped smile. Fortunately, Sensei, we shall not have to wait three years for an environmental impact study. The Imperium wants this thing opened. Now. It's why you're here. To tell you the truth, sir, I'm more worried about what might seep in. They must have sealed it against Titan's atmosphere for good reason. A motive that expired millions of years ago. He rose. I'm having a containment dome erected around the Locus. There's no way we can establish blockade underneath the ice as well. But this will meet most likely challenges, or so I'm assured. I'm relieved to hear it. I belatedly heaved up my bulk. When will you want me out there? You'll be advised. We have a full-scale colloquium scheduled, starting at two. I'll expect you to be there, Sensei Park. And on your best behavior. No more outbursts, if you please. More damn chin-wagging. Science used to be an empirical exercise, I grumbled. Led by theory, as I'm sure you understand. He was standing at his door, and I went out, biting my lip.
Nobody had the faintest starting point for a theory to explain my causal distortions, and not much to account for the photon-entangled portage functor. I could do it. I could show them a method for using it, and had. But I didn't have a theory-empowered clue how or why. I'm nobody's mutant Superman. That much I do know. Or is that just a fat man self-doubt speaking? Postmodern science, as far as I can tell, looking in from the outside, is drunk on the sound of its own voice. But yes, I know. Look who's complaining. I recalled again that Victorian sage, that poet Tennyson. He had it right. I sometimes hold it half a sin to put in words the grief I feel. For words, like nature, half reveal and half conceal the soul within. But for the unquiet heart and brain, a use in measured language lies, the sad mechanic exercise, like dull narcotics, numbing pain. I followed Dr. Namgung along the narrow compiled corridors of Huygen Station, so like those awful domiciles on the outskirts of Palo Alto, and went to hear the sad mechanics exercise their tongues and dull their pain. And maybe mine. The circulated air was pungent, despite the scrubbers, with the musk of excited animals crowded together, a schematic chart I'd grown familiar with these last few months started displaying on the auditorium wall, replacing the magnified image of Saturn's glorious tilted hat. The Fermi Paradox Solution candidates. My eye bounced off them, falling down a cliff of words and logic with no footing in reality beyond the dragon-haunted thing outside the dome. Where are they? Fermi won. They are here among us and call themselves Koreans. That always got a satisfied titter. Except for many Hungarians in the crowd. They're me too. They are here, running things. A chance for the Hungarians, and anyone else chafing under the Imperium, to get their own back with a belly laugh. No giggles here, though, I noticed. They're me three. They came and left. Bingo, I thought. They came and left flowers scattered in their wake. Strictly, though, that was Fermi 53, the only choice left. The ancient, intelligent dinosaur hypothesis. Fermi 6. We are interdicted. Fermi 10. They are still on their way here. The starship had blown that one, and others like it, clear out of the water. Time to trim the list, methinks. Fermi 21. They're listening. Only fools are transmitting. Fermi 22. Dedicated killer machines destroy everything that moves. Anywhere in space. Fermi 28. The Vingian singularity takes them. Elsewhere. No singularity back near the end of the Cretaceous, I thought. Judging by the remote viewer sketches, that Saurian pilot was advanced but not sufficiently advanced as to be indistinguishable from magic. Fermi 38. Earth is the optimal place for life, just by chance. Could be, and for intelligent life at that. Hey, look, we've seen it twice, the smart dinosaurs and Homo sape. Fermi 48. Language is vanishingly rare. Ha, huh. yeah, right. Blah, blah, blah. Still, maybe so. The skies are awfully silent, which is where we came in. Fermi 49. Science is a rare accident. Not as rare as I am, I thought, touching the etiological chains and vortices all around. And no scientist ever predicted me. Most of them still didn't even know about me, thanks to all those above-top-secret restrictions. Damn it. Namgung cleared his throat at the podium. Voices, in clumps, and then one by one, fell silent. Hey, maybe that's it. God tapped his microphone and the Cosmo shut up to listen. And they're still listening, bent and cowed by the awfulness of what they heard. But not us. 
We haven't heard from God yet, despite a thousand revelations claimed and proclaimed. Or if we have, there's no way to search through the babbling noise and extract the divine signal. Funny way to run a universe. I could feel the dinosaur calling to me. Even so, through the appalling cold of Titan snows and the void of fifty or a hundred million years, and the entwined memory of my son, sacrificed for nothing. 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 Those are the classic guesses. Most of them wrong. The director flicked his finger. The display went to blank gray. We still have no idea why the galaxy, indeed the universe as a whole, is quiet. Why the stars are still shining, spilling out their colossal energy resources, when intelligence should be collecting it. Calculations you're all familiar with prove that a single intelligent species arising anywhere in the galaxy within the last billion years would by now have colonized all its trillion stars and associated bodies, turned the sky black with matryoshka shells, or perhaps obliterated the stars in vast wasteful wars. I pricked up my ears. A political subtext? Perhaps not. Maybe our director was just a tone-deaf drone. I glanced around. Several people near me had dropped their eyes. More than one held fists clenched tight. Okay. One of the equally classic great filters must screen out potential intelligent life and leave the heavens exactly as they'd have to be if there is no life at all out there. No intelligent starfaring life, anyway. So, now we're faced with a new paradox. Fermi remains unanswered, and yet we have this old vehicle made by beings not of our own species, but apparently related. The likelihood of that coincidence being due to chance alone is impossibly small. I see only three remaining possibilities. Barney did it, someone called, muted but clear across the room a wave of tittering. I felt my jaw tighten, and a flush creep into my cheeks. A previous civilization sprung from dinosaur stock on Cretaceous Earth, or even earlier. Yes, said Dr. Namgung, evenly. The opinion represented here today by our guest, Sensei Park. A pattering of polite applause, some even more muted groans. We have evidence in the form of preliminary scans by our naval remote viewer, Colonel Meagle, that the creature, the being, forgive me, in charge of the craft has just such an origin, leaving aside the improbability of parallel evolution. If so, this leaves the earlier and larger Fermi question unanswered. Where are its kindred now? Why haven't they conquered the whole galaxy? Tipler and others proved decades ago that this could have been achieved at achievable sublight speeds within a million years. If they have, why don't we see them? Hearing it stated so flatly, I was dizzied as always by the prospect. Flotillas of starcraft fleeing into the spiral arms at a tenth of light speed, crammed with dragon seed or our own or minute nanoscale pods fired toward a hundred million stars by magnetic catapult, or driven on filmy wings by laser light. Yet these, too, were last year's dreams. Last centuries. We had stepped from Earth to Ganymede to Titan, entangled on a light beam, and without waiting to be shoved here by sailboat. The moment entangled luminal portage became a reality for my own species— it opened the yawning cavern. Why not for them, as well? What the hell was a starship doing here? Why bother? It was so last week, like finding a steam locomotive under the ice. Namgung was enunciating his other solutions to Fermi, but I didn't care. I was entranced by the mystery of the sleeping creature, sedate under his bedding of live flowers. It was a hunger like my endless appetite for chow. I wanted to step straight through the damn shell of the ship and look the critter in the eye, man to man, even if it decided to eat me. That's what dragons do, 
isn't it? And so to bed, where I lay in the dark in a lather of fright for fifteen minutes, fearful and weak, bleak, needing a leak. I climbed out and thudded to the sanitary personal. When I got back, after a swab up and down and a cross with a wet face cloth to dab away the worst of the flop sweat, my door was slightly open. Through it came the never-stopping background clanging and banging of humans and machines, keeping the place ticking over. Snapping my fingers, I clicked the room light up to dim. Dr. Jendai Shumba, chubby string looper, stretched at ease on my bed, clad in sensible pajamas with a mission blaze on the collar. Of course, I jumped and squealed. What the? Is there some... Hush up, dear man, and come over here. She grinned. You're not serious, are you? In evidence, she slithered out of her PJs and raised her eyebrows. Absurd! I'd crush you like a bug. Myung-hui, you don't weigh any more here than my little boy. You have a... I swallowed and crept closer. I had a son once. Let us be in this moment, sensei, she said without reproach. I'm disgusting to look upon, I said frankly, and I don't need a pity. She had her fingers across my mouth and then pulled me down through several clunky, jumpy evolutions. There are other ways to convey one's intimacy, she said. Oop, I protested. An easy mouth is a great thing on a long journey, is it not, old fellow, she said, releasing mine and patting my neck. Excuse me? Jendai burst out laughing, a slightly husky, wonderfully exciting sound. A quote from an old British classic about a horse. Nineteenth century, I believe. You might have read it as a child. Black beauty. You are the black beauty, I said, noticing a cue when it smacked me between the eyes. I raised my voice and said, Door close. And it did. You've got a way to break into the ship, don't you? She said, after a time without time. I was reeling and reckless. Yes, probably. So you really are a poltergeist. She stroked my contemptible belly, as if it were a friendly animal sharing the bed with us. Tony nearly poked his damn eye out. Her laugh was throaty, dirty, a tonic. Don't blame me, I said, and found a glass of water. Drained it. It's like being able to wiggle your ears. In the near dark, she wiggled hers. And more. But before she left, Jendai said, Bring me back a sample. A skin scraping, anything with DNA. Just for me, honey. Okay? Oh, so that's why you're here? Had to be some reason, exploitative bitch. But that's life, right? Looking like a well-laid but annoyed and put-upon squat polar bear in my body glove, some hellish number of minus degrees on the far side of its skin, I stood gazing down from the edge of the excavation. The spacecraft was unaltered every bloom precisely where it had been several days before, where it had been, perhaps, several tens of millions of years before, unless it was salted here recently as a snare for gullible humans, in which case it might be younger than I. Not so likely, though. Ready when you are, Sensei, said the political officer, doing Mr. Kim's bidding, and damn the scientist's caution. I raised one thumb and let myself drift. Cause and effect unbraided, started their long, looping dance of ideological distortion, swirling, curdling. I was the still center of the spinning world. Certainties creaked, cracked. A favorite poem entered my heart by Ji Hoon Cho. Flower petals on the sleeves. The wanderer's long sleeves are wet from flower petals, twilight over a riverside village where wine is mellow. 
had this saurian person below me, trapped now in timelessness, known wine, crushed release and perhaps moments of joy from some archaic fruit, not yet grape. I thought, with a wrenching mournfulness, when this night is over, flowers will fall in that village. Hey! And there went the flowers, drawn up and tossed away from the hull of the starship. They were scattering in the methane wind, lifted and flung by the bitter gusts, floral loveliness snap-frozen, blown upward and falling down in drifts into the alien snow. The stationary shield is discontinued, said a clipped voice in my ears. I stepped forward, ready to enter the ancient imprisoned place, to meet my dinosaur, who had either died or even now lived, freed from timeless suspension. A hand caught my encased arm. Not yet, Sam. We have a team prepped. Thanks, you've done good here today. I turned, hardly able to see through my tears, and it was not that bastard Tony Cayetani, groveling his apologies. The universe could not be so chirpy as that. I hadn't met this one before, although he'd picked up my dining room nickname and used it with a certain familiar breeziness. Some beefy functionary of some armed service division, grinning at me in his bluff farm boy way. I nodded and watched the team of Marines go down, and remembered my dear boy and the way he had gone forward fearlessly into darkness, and then into the fire falling from the sky. It did not matter one whit that I thought his cause wrong-headed. I remembered a poem in that book I'd found in the ruined library, a poem by an Englishman named Kipling that had torn my heart as I sat before Songdam's close coffin. There was no comfort in this tide, the poem warned me, nor in any tide save this. He did not shame his kind, not even with that wind blowing and that tide. Without shame, I sobbed, but then drew myself up and turned back to Huygen Segura. Perhaps, I told myself, ten or sixty million years ago, another father had laid his son on these cruel snows and bade him farewell. I murmured to that reptilian father, offering what poor borrowed comfort I might to us both, across all that void of space and time. Then hold your head up all the more, this tide, and every tide, because he was the son you bore, and gave to that wind blowing, and that tide. I looked straight up above me, at the photodiode display before my eyes in the view mask, swallowing hard, to follow the streaming tide of blossoms on the wind, and there was Saturn, old Father Time, hanging in the orange smoke of the sky, an arrow through his heart. I gave him a respectful nod and raised one gloved thumb in salute. Hair Adam Roberts Cosmetic fashion sometimes sweep the globe, but as the sly story that follows demonstrates, Sometimes they have a particularly good reason for doing so. A senior reader in English at London University, Adam Roberts is an SF author, critic, reviewer, and academic who has produced many works on 19th century poetry, as well as critical studies of science fiction, such as the Palgrave History of Science Fiction. His own fiction has appeared in Postscripts, Sci Fiction, Live Without a Net, Future Shocks, Forbidden Planets, Spectrum SF, Constellations, and elsewhere, and was collected in Swiftly. His novels include Salt, On, Stone, Polystone, The Snow, Gradisil, Splinter, and Land of the Headless. His most recent novels are Yellow Blue Tibia and New Model Army. He lives in Staines, England, with his wife and daughter, and has a website at adamroberts.com. 1. It seems to me foolish to take a story about betrayal and call it, as my sponsors wish me to, the hairstyle that changed the world. 
All this hairdressing business, this hair work, I don't want to get excited about that. To see it as those mass strands of electricity shooting up from the bald pate of the Van de Graaff machine. And whilst we're on the subject of haircuts, I was raised by my mother alone, and we were poor enough that, from an early stage, she was the person who cut my hair. For the sake of simplicity, as much as economy, this cut would be uniform and close. To keep me quiet as the buzzer grazed, she used to show me the story about the mermaid whose being in the world was confused between fish tail and feet. I'm sure she showed me lots of old books, but it was that one that sticks in my head. The singing crab, more scarab than crustacean, the wicked villainous able to change not only her appearance, but, improbably, her size. I used to puzzle how she was able to generate all her extra mass as she metamorphosed, at the end, into a colossal octopus. Mostly, I remember the beautiful young mermaid. She had the tempestuous name Ariel. The story hinged on the notion that her tail might vanish and reform as legs, and I used to worry disproportionately about those new feet. Would they, I wondered, smell of fish? Were the toenails actually fish scales? Were the twenty-six bones of each foot, all of which I could name, formed of cartilage, after the manner of fish bones, or human bone? The truth is, my mind is the sort that is most comfortable finding contiguities between different states, and most uncomfortable with inconsistencies. Hence my eventual choice of career, I suppose. And I don't doubt that my fascination with the mermaid story had to do with a nascent erotic yearning for Ariel herself. A very prettily drawn figure, I recall. This has nothing to do with anything. I ought not digress. It's particularly vulgar to do so before I have even started, as if I want to put off the task facing me. Of course, this account is not about me. It is enough, for your purposes, to locate your narrator, to know that I was raised by my mother alone, and that after she died, of new strain CF three weeks after contracting it, I was raised by a more distant relative. We had enough to eat, but nothing else in my life was enough to. To know that my trajectory out of that world was hard study, a scholarship to a small college, and the acquisition of the professional skills that established me in my current profession. You might also want to know where I first met Neocles. Long final E. People sometimes get that wrong. At college. Although what was for me dizzying educational altitude represented, for him, a sort of slumming, a symptom of his liberal curiosity about how the underprivileged live. Above all, I suppose, you need to know that I'm of that generation that thinks of hair as a sort of excrescence, to be cropped to make it manageable, not indulged at length. And poverty is like the ore in the stone. No matter how you grind the rock and refine the result, it is always poverty that comes out. Thinking again about my mother, as here, brings her colliding painfully against the membrane of memory. I suppose I find it hard to forgive her for being poor. She loved me completely, and I loved her back, as children do. The beautiful mermaid, seated on a sack-shaped rock, combing her long, coral-red hair, whilst porpoises jump through invisible aerial hoops below her. Two. To tell you about the hairstyle that changed the world, it's back we go to Reykjavik, five years ago now, just after the Irkutsk famine, when the grain was devoured by that granulated agent manufactured by... And the argument continues as to which terrorist sponsored it. It was the year the World Cup descended into farce. Nick was in Iceland to answer charges at the Product Protection Court, and I was representing him. A PPC hearing is not much different to any other court hearing. There are the rituals aping the last century, or perhaps the century before that. There's a lot of brass and glass, and there is a quantity of waxed, mirror-like darkwood. 
I had represented Nick at such hearings before, but never one quite so serious as this, and Nick had more to lose than most, because I had itemized his assets prior to making our first submission before the judicial master. I happened to know exactly how much that was. Five apartments, one overlooking Central Park, a mulberry farm, forty assorted cars and flitters, more than fifty percent shares in the Polish National Museum, which, although it didn't precisely mean that he owned all those paintings and statues and what dots, at least gave him privileged access to them. The Sydney apartment had a canova, for instance, in the entrance hall, and the Poles weren't pressing him to return it any time soon. He had a lot to lose. In such circumstances, insouciance is probably a more attractive reaction than anxiety, although from a legal perspective I might have wished for a more committed demeanor. He lounged in court his Orphic shirt. Very stylish, very a la mode, and his hair was a hundred years out of date. It was Woodstock, or English Civil War aristocrat. When the J.M. comes in. I told him, you'd better get off your gluteus maximus and stand yourself straight. Judicial Master Patterson came in, and Nick got to his feet smartly enough and nodded his head, and then sat down himself perfectly properly. With his pocket strides decently hidden by the table, he looked almost respectable. Except for all the hair, of course. Three. I see you tomorrowed him on the steps of the courthouse, but he was staring at the sky. The bobble layer of clouds on the horizon was a remarkable satsuma color. Further up was cyan and eggshell. The surface of the ice-bound estuary, which looked perfectly smooth and flat in daylight, revealed under the slant light all manner of hollows and jags. Further out at sea, past the ice line where waves turned themselves continually and wearily over. A fishing platform sent a red snake of smoke straight up from the fakir's basket of its single chimney. Tomorrow, he replied absently. He seemed hypnotized by the view. Don't worry, I told him, mistaking, as I now think, his distraction for anxiety about the prospect of losing some of his five apartments or forty cars and flitters. The J.M. said he recognized that some individuals have a genius for innovation. That was a good sign. That's code for geniuses don't need to be quite as respectful of the law as ordinary drones. A genius for innovation, he echoed. I'm not saying Scott Free, not saying that, but it won't be too bad. You'll keep more than you think. It will be fine. Don't worry. Yes? He suddenly coughed into his gloves, yellow, condom-tight gloves, and appeared to notice me for the first time. God knows I loved him, as a friend loves a true friend, but he bore then, as he always did, his own colossally swollen ego like a deformity. I never knew a human with so prodigious a self-regard. His selfishness was of the horizoning, all-encompassing sort that is almost touching, because it approaches the selfishness of the small child. His whim, I shall be humanity's benefactor. But this was not an index of his altruism. It was because his ego liked the sound of the description. Having known him twenty years, I would stand up in court and swear to it. He developed the marrow peptide calc binder treatment, not to combat osteoporosis, the ostensible reason the thing mentioned in his Medal of Science citation, but precisely because of the plastic surgical spin-off possibilities, so that he could add 20 centimeters to his own long bones. Not that he minded people using his treatment to alleviate osteopathologies, of course. Accordingly, when he did not turn up in the courtroom the following day, my first thought was that he had simply overslept, or gotten distracted by some tourist pleasure or that some aspect of his own consciousness had intruded between his perceiving mind and the brute fact that, however much I tried to reassure him, a J.M. was gearing up to fine him half his considerable wealth for property right violation. It did not occur to me that he might deliberately have absconded. 
This possibility evidently hadn't occurred to the court, either, or they would have put some kind of restraint upon him. You would think, they thought, obviously, that the prospect of losing so many million euros of wealth was restraint enough. The shock in court was as nothing, however, to the fury of the company, his employer and mine. I want to be clear. I had been briefed to defend Nick in court, and that only. I made this point forcefully after the event. My brief had been courtroom and legal, not to act as his minder or to prevent him from boarding a skyhop to Milan, it turned out, in order immediately to board another skyhop to... Nobody was quite sure where. If you'd wanted a minder, you should have hired a minder, I said. I was assertive, not aggressive. The court pronounced in absentia, and it went hard on Nick's fortune. But this did not flush him out. His disappearance hurt me. I was sent to a dozen separate meetings in a dozen different global locations within one week. And in the same time frame, I had twenty or so further virtual meetings. Flying over Holland where robotically tended fields shone greener than jade, and the hedges are all twenty foot tall, and the glimmering blue rivers sign their paths towards the sea. At Denver Airport, I saw a man with Parkinsonism, not old, no more than forty, sitting in the cafe and trying to eat a biscuit. He looked as though he was trying to shake hands with his own mouth. The news was as full of people starving, as it always is, Images of a huge holding zone in Sri Lanka where people were simply sitting around waiting to die. That look of the starving. Hunger has placed its leech maw upon their heel and sucked all their fluid and solidity out, down to the bones. The skin tautly concave everywhere. The eyes big as manga. The aching face. On Channel 9, the famine clock. Bottom left corner, rolled its numbers over and over. A blur of numbers. I flew to Iceland. I flew back to Denver. I was acutely aware that Neocles' vanishment put my own career at risk. Had I always lived amongst wealth, as he had, I might have floated free above the anxiety of this. It's easy for the wealthy to believe that something will turn up. But I had experienced what a non-Medensure, hard-scrabble life was like and I did not want to go back to it. He's gone rogue, I was told. Why didn't you stop him? The company, which had been, to me, a dozen or so points of human contact, suddenly swelled and grew monstrously octopoid. A hundred or more company people wanted to speak to me directly. This is serious, I was told. He has the patent information on a dozen billion euro applications, I was told. You want to guarantee the company's financial losses should he try and pirate license those? I thought not. I thought not. Not everybody scapegoated me. Some departments recognized the injustice in trying to pin Nick's disappearance on me. Embryology, for instance, a department more likely than most to require expert legal advice, of the sort I had proved myself in the past capable of providing. Optics also assured me of their support, though they did so off the record. But it would have required a self-belief stronger than the one with which Providence has provided me to think my career, my 20-year career, as staff legal counsel for the company was going to last more than a month. The elegant bee dance of mutual corporate espionage continued to report that none of our competitors had, yet, acquired any of the intellectual property Nick had in his power to dispose. I had a meeting at Cambridge, in the UK, where late winter was bone white, and ducks on the river looked in astonishment at their own legs. I flew to Rio, where the summer ocean was immensely clear and beautiful. Sitting on the balcony of our offices, it was possible, without needing optical enhancement, to make out extraordinary levels of detail in the sunken buildings and streets, 
right down to cars wedged in doorways, and individual letters painted on the tarmac. I flew to Alaska. I flew to Sydney, where the airport was a chaos of children, a flash mob protest about the cutbacks in youth dole. In the midst of all this, I somehow found time to begin, discreetly, to make plans for a post-company life. My ex-wife was more understanding than I might have expected, more concerned to maintain Medinsure for our two children than for herself. I scouted gingerly, secretly, for other employment. But even with the most optimistic assessment, it was going to be hard to carry five lots of Medinsure on my new salary. I could not, of course, deprive the children, and I did not wish to deprive Kate. That left my ex-wife and myself, and I decided to give up coverage for myself and leave my exes in place. Then from the blue, news. Neocles had gone native in Mumbai, of all places. I was called once again to Denver and briefed face to face by Alamio himself, the company enforcer and bruiser and general bully fellow. It was not a pleasant tete-a-tete. At this meeting, emphasis was placed on the very lastness of this, my last chance. The word last, as conventionally used, was insufficient to convey just how absolutely last this last chance was, how micron close to the abyss I found myself, how very terminal my opportunity. The very severity of this interview reassured me. Had they not needed me very badly, they would not have worked so hard to bully me. For the first time since Nick had so thoughtlessly trotted off, putting at risk, the fucker, not only his own assets, but my entire family's well-being, I felt the warmth of possible redemption touch the chill of my heart. My last chance, I said. I understand. You go to him, said Alamio. You have a fucking word, yes? I understood then that they were sending me because I was a friend, not because I was a lawyer. They already knew that money was no longer going to provide them with any leverage with Nick anymore. That he had renounced money. He was easing himself into his new role as Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of the Starving. What can you do to a person who won't listen to money? What else does power have in this world of ours? I'll talk to him. What else? Nothing else, said Amarillo. Bring him home? No, that's not what we're sending you to do. Listen the fuck to me. I don't give a fucking pin. Just, just. Look, we're sending you to talk to him. Four. I was flown out on a Geldern plane, its skin stiffening with the frictive heat of a high-inset aerial trajectory. I ate little medallions of licorice bread, with shark caviar and Russian cheese pâté, and then authentic sausages lacquered with honey, and then spears of dwarf asparagus, and then chocolate pellets that froth deliciously inside the mouth. I drank white wine, a Kenyan vintage. The toilet cubicle of this plane offered seven different sorts of hygiene wipe, including a plain one, one that analyzed your stool as you wipe to check for digestive irregularities, and several that imparted different varieties of dot tech to your lower intestine to various ends. I watched a film about a frolicsome young couple overcoming the obstacles placed in the way of their love. I watched the news. I watched another film. A long one this time, fifteen minutes or more, based on the historical events of the French Revolution. The tipping point of our descent registered in my viscera like a Christmas Eve tingle of excitement. We plummeted to Mumbai. Arriving at Chhatrapati Shivaji was like traveling back half a century in time. The smell, the litter, the silver painted curved ceilings on their scythe shaped supports. An all-metal train, running on all-metal rails, trundling me from the terminal to the departure room. Then it was a short hop and a company flicker to Jogeshwari Beachfront. Seconds, actually. 
a brief elevation over the peninsular sprawl of the city. Its bonsai skyscrapers like stacked dishes, the taller curves and spires further south. The sky was outrageously blue, and the sea bristled with light. And really, in a matter of seconds, we came down again. I could have walked from airport to seafront, is how close it was. But better to arrive in a flitter, of course. When I'd called Nick, he'd been gracious if laid back in reply. No company men, just you, old friend. Of course, of course. Of course. There was a flitter park on the Juhu Dyke, and I left the car and driver there and started walking. Forty degrees of heat. Mild, I was told, for the season. The sky blew like a gem-like flame. It poured heat down upon the world. The air smelt of several things at once. Savory smells and decaying smells, and the worn-out salt odor of the ocean. I don't know what I expected. I think I expected, knowing Nick, to find him gone hippie, dropped out, or a holy hermit chanting Joppa. I pictured him surfing. But as I walked, I noticed there was no surf. There were people everywhere. A rather startling profusion of humanity, lolling, walking, rushing, going in and out, talking, singing, praying. It was an enormous crush. The sound of several incompatible varieties of music wrestled in the background. Beats locking and then disentangling. Simple harmonic melodies twisting about one another in atonal and banshee interaction. Everybody was thin. Some were starvation thin. It was easy enough to pick out these latter, because they were much stiller, standing or sitting with studied motionless. It was those who could still afford to eat who moved about. The bay harbored the poking up tops and roofs of many inundated towers, scattered across the water like the Nine Queens in the chessboard problem, preventing the buildup of rideable waves. These upper floors of the drowned buildings were still inhabited, for the poor will live where they can, however unsalubrious. Various lines and cables were strung in sweeping droops from roofs to shore. People swam, or kicked and splashed through the shallower water. On the new mud beach, a few sepia-colored palm trees waved their heavy feathers in the breeze. Sweat wept down my back. And then, as arranged, there was Nick lying on the flank of the groin with his great length of hair fanned out on the ground behind him. The first surprise, he was dressed soberly, in black. The second, he was accompanied by armed guards. I sat beside my friend. It was so very hot. I think I was expecting beach bummery. I saw your plane come over, he said. Made quite a racket air-breaking. Like I knew anything about that. I'm glad you've come, though, he said, getting up on his haunches. His guards fidgeted, leaning their elbows on their slung rifles. They were wearing, I noticed, Marathi National Guard uniforms. Good of you to come, he clarified. People in Denver are pretty pissed. There's not many I trust, he said. He meant that he did at least trust me. These boys work for you? I asked. Soldiers. They do. The Marathi authorities and I have come to an understanding. Nick hopped to his feet. They get my hairstyle, and with it, they get the popular support. Of the poor. I get a legal government to shelter me. And I get a compound. Compound? I asked. Meaning chemical compound? Or barracks? The answer, though, was the latter, because he said, Up in Bawandi, all the wealth has moved from the city up to the mountains. Up east in Navi, Mumbai. The wealthy don't believe the sea has stopped coming. They think it'll likely come on a little more. The wealthy are a cautious lot. The wealthy, I said. So you can come along, he said. Come along. I got to my feet. Where? My flitter's back here. Are you allowed to park a flitter down here? I was told flitters had to be parked in the official park. Back. I looked around vaguely. 
back up there somewhere. I have, he said, flashing me a smile, special privileges. Five. What is it we do? He asked me a few minutes later as the flitter whisked the two of us and Nick's two soldiers northeast over the Mumbai sprawl. He had to raise his voice. It was noisy as a helicopter. Speaking for myself, I said, I work for the company. I do this to earn enough to keep the people I love safe and healthy. I include you in that category, by the way, you fucker. And, he said, smiling slyly, how is Kate? I'll insert a word here about Kate. It is not precisely germane, but I want to say something. I love her, you see. I'm aware of the prejudice, but I believe it goes without saying that she is as much a human as anybody. She has a vocabulary of 900 words and a whole range of phrases and sayings. She has a genuine and sweet nature. She has hair the color of holly berries. You'd expect me to say this, and I will say this. It is a particularly strange irony that if the same people who sneer at her personhood post-treatment had encountered her before treatment, it would never occur to them to deny that she was a human being. In those circumstances, they would have gone out of their way to be nice to her. And if before, why not afterward? Kate is happier now than she ever was before. She is learning the piano. Of all the people I have met in this life, she is the most genuine. Do you know what? I don't need to defend my love to you. She is very well, I said, perhaps more loudly than I needed to, which is more than I can say for your portfolio. A bunch of houses and cars and shit, he shouted, making a flowing gesture with his right hand as if discarding it all. His was despite this theatricality, an utterly unstudied insouciance. That's what a lifetime of never wanting for money does for you. We could have saved more than half of it, I said, if you hadn't absented yourself from the court the way you did. All those possessions, he said. They were possessing me. Oh, I said. I could not convey to him how fatuous this sounded to me. How very brother, brother. He grinned. Shit, it's good to see you again. This hair thing of yours, I asked him, having no idea what he meant by the phrase, but guessing it was some nanopeptide technology or other that he had developed. Is that a company patent? You know? He said, his eyes twinkling and his pupils doing that peculiar cycling moon thing that they do. It wouldn't matter if it were. But no, as it happens, no. As it happens. Well, I said, that's something. He was the hairstyle man, the savior of the world's poor. I'm a benefactor now, he boomed. I'm a revolutionary. I shall be remembered as the greatest benefactor in human history. In a year, I'll be able to put the whole company in my fucking pocket. The flitter landed, a little series of bunny hops before coming to rest, that telltale of an inexperienced chauffeur. We were inside his compound, a pentagon of walls thick-wreathed with brambles of barbed wire. Inside was a mass of people, and very body without exception, men, women, and children, had long ink-black hair. People were laying flat on the floor, or lolling upon the low roofs, or sitting in chairs, all of them sunbathing, and all with their hair spread and fanned out. A central tower shaped like an oil derrick with a big gun at the top. Impressive looking to a pedestrian, but like a cardboard castle to any force armed with modern munitions. There was plenty of space inside the walls, but it was crowded fit to burst. Nick led me along a walkway alongside the central atrium, and the ground was carpeted with supine humanity. They were so motionless that I even wondered whether they might be dead, except that every now and then one would pat their face to dislodge a fly, or breathe in and out. 
Sunbathers, I said. And then, just before we went in, Nick stopped and turned to me with a characteristically boyish sudden spurt of enthusiasm. Hey, I tell you what I learned the other day. What? Crazy that I never knew this before, given all the work I've done. Discovered it quite by chance. Peptides. I mean the word peptides. Is from the Greek peptidia, and that means little snacks. There's something you never knew. Means nuts, crisps, olives stuffed with little shards of sun-dried fucking tomato. Peptides means Scooby Snacks. Extraordinary, I deadpanned. And you with your Greek heritage, I said, knowing full well that he possessed no Greek language at all. At this, he became once again solemn. I'm a citizen of the world now, he said. We went through, up a slope and into a seminar room. Inside was a horseshoe seating grid with room for perhaps sixty people. The space was empty except for us two. The room put a single light on the front of the room when we came in. I sat myself in a front row seat. Nick stood before the screen, fiddling with his hair, running fingers through it and pulling it. Why do you think you're here? he asked, without looking at me. Just to talk, Nick, I said. I have no orders, except to talk. Man, we really ought to talk. About the future. Hey, he said, as if galvanized by that word. He flapped his arm at the room sensor and the screen lit behind him. The opening image was the federal flag of India. Okay, he announced. The image morphed into diagrams of the chemical structures of self-assembling peptides that filled the screen. Insectile wriggles of angular disjunction, wielding hexagonic benzene rings like boxing gloves. Wait, said Nick, looking behind him. That's not right. He clicked his fingers. More snaps of his molecular tools and trade faded in, faded out. How very Barnum Bailey, I said. Calmodulin rendered in 3D, he said. I always think they look like party streamers. Although, in Zorlandic iteration, they look like a star map. There's just so much empty space at the molecular level. Our representational codes tend to obscure that fact. There. That there's lysine. He danced on the spot, jiggling his feet. Lysine. A lot of that in your hair. NH2 sending down a lightning jag of line to the H and H2N link. And O and OH looking on with their mouths open. Images flicked by. One of the broken down forms of lysine is called cadaverine. You know that? The molecule of fucking decay and death. Of putrefying corpses. Putrescine. Cadaverine. Who names these things? Something to do with hair, I prompted. Lysine, he said. Hair. He held his right hand up and ran his thumb along his other four fingers. The display flicked rapidly through a series of images. What is it we do? You asked that before, I said. Innovations and inventions and brilliant new technological advances. I'm just a lawyer, Nick, I said. You're the innovator. But it's the company, isn't it? The company's business. These technological advances to make the world a better place. I suppose I assumed that this was another oblique dig at Kate. So I was crosser in response than I should have been. So they do, I said. Don't fucking tell me they don't. He looked back, eyes wide, as if I had genuinely startled him. Of course they do, he said in a surprised tone. Man, don't misunderstand. But think it through. That's what I'd say. This is me you're talking with. Technological advance and new developments and all the exciting novelties of our science fiction present. It's great. You get no argument on that from me. I've just flown from Denver to Mumbai in an hour, I said. You'd prefer it took me three months sailing to get here? You have grasped the wrong stick end, chum he said. Really, you have. But only listen. 
technological advance is marvelous, but it is always ineluctably a function of wealth. Poverty is immiscible with it. People are rich today in myriad exotic and futuristic ways. But people are poor today as people have always been. They starve and they sicken and they die young. Poverty is the great constraint of human existence. Things aren't so bad as you say, I said. Technology trickles down. Sure, but the technology of the poor always lags behind the technology of the rich. And it's not linear. There are poor people on the globe today who do not use wheels and drag their goods on sleds or on their backs. Some armies have needle guns and gel shells, and some armies have antique AK-47 guns, and some people fight with hoes and spades. This is how you got the government of Marathi to give you this little castle and armed guard? The hairstyle stuff, he said. And that? And that is? There is a particular variety of silence I always associate with the insides of high-tech conference rooms. An insulated and plasticated silence. It's a clever thing, he said to me shortly. Of course it is. It is a clever thing. That's just objectively what it is. Works with lysine in the hair and runs nanotubes the length of each strand. There's some more complicated biointerface stuff to do with the blood vessels in the scalp. When I said that none of this utilized company IP, I was, possibly, bending the truth a little. There's some company stuff in there, at the blood exchange. But the core technology, the hair strand stuff, is all mine. It's all me. It's all new. And I'm going to be giving it away. Pretty soon, billions will have taken the starter pills. Billions! That's a big... He looked about him at the empty seats. Number, he concluded, lamely. Hair, I prompted. I'm genetically eradicating poverty, he said. And then a gust of boyish enthusiasm filled his sails. All the stuff we do and make, it's all for the rich and the poor carrying on, starving and dying. But this... Hair. Food is the key. Food is the pinch point if you're poor. Hunger is the pinch point, and it's daily. And everything else in your life is oriented around scraping together food so as not to starve. The poor get sick because their water is contaminated, or because their food is inadequate and undernourishment harasses their immune system. The future cannot properly arrive until this latter fact is changed. So what does the hair, I asked. What does, does it, like, photosynthesize? Something like that, he said. His avatar, frozen with his smiling mouth half open, like a twenty-foot-tall village idiot, lowered over us both. And you, what do you do then? I mean, what does one? You lie in the sun? The energy you previously got from the food you eat, well, you get that from the sun. He did a little twirl. It's a clever thing, he said. Actually, the hair, less so. That's easy enough to engineer. Peptide sculptors generating photoreceptive structures in the hair and spinning conductors down to the roots. The clever stuff is in the way the energy is transferred into the... Look, I don't want to get into the details. That's not important. I looked up at giant 2D Nick's goofy face. I looked at human-sized 3D Nick's earnest expression and fidgeting hands. You don't need to eat? No. But you can? Of course you can, if you want to. But you don't need to. Not once I've fitted the... Fitted the... And I'm giving that away free. I tried to imagine it. All those supine bodies laid like paving stones across Nick's courtyard outside. Lying all day in the sun? Not all day. Not at these latitudes. Three hours a day does most people. And what about, say, Reykjavik? 
The sunlight's pretty weak up there, he said. You'd be better off in the tropics. But that's where most of the world's poor are. But, I said. Vital amines? Water, more to the point. You still need to drink, obviously. Ideally, you'll drink water with trace metals, flavor some water, or gobble a little clean mud from time to time. But vitamins, vitamins, well, the tech can synthesize those. Sugars for the muscles to work. You'd be surprised by how much energy three hours sunbathing with my hair generates. I mean, it's a lot. Phew, I said. The vertiginous ambition of the idea had gone through my soul like a sword. You're not kidding. This was no question. Imagine, in a few years, he said, imagine this. All the world's poor, gifted with a technology that frees them from food. Frees them from the need to devote their lives to shit-eating jobs to scrape together the money to eat. But they still can eat, I repeated. I don't know why this stuck in my head the way it did. Of course they can, if they want to. They still have. Very disdainfully inflected tone of voice. Fucking stomachs. But if they don't eat, they don't starve. Contemplate that sentence and what it means. Don't you see? All the life that has ever lived on this planet has lived until this precariously balanced axe. All its life. Eat or die. I shall take that axe away. No more famines. No more starvation. Jesus, I said. I was going to add, I can see why the Marathi authorities would seize on such an idea as a means of galvanizing political support amongst the mass. I understood the guards, the compound, and from Nick's point of view, too. I could see why he might want this over a position as well-paid company gene monkey. Why am I here, Nick? I asked. I need a lawyer, he said simply. Things are going to change for me in a pretty fucking big way. I will need a team I can trust. I'm going to be moving in some pretty high-powered circles, finding a lawyer I can trust. That's easier said than done. This I had not expected. You're offering me a job? If you like. Put it like that, okay. What? What? To come here? To come and live here? To work in Mumbai? Sure. You're serious? Why not? I didn't say. Because in three weeks' time, the army of the Greater Kashmiri Republic is going to come crashing in here with stormtroopers and military flitters and crab tanks and many, many bullets to seize this extraordinary asset that the Marathi Junta has somehow acquired. I didn't say, what, come and work here and get very literally caught in the crossfire? I didn't say that. Instead, I said, Bring Kate? He assumed a serious expression, rather too obviously, deliberately suppressing a mocking smile. I've always had a soft spot for Kate. The kids? Surely. The ex, too, if you like. I can't bring the kids here. I can't bring Kate here. He caught sight of his on-screen image from the corner of his eye. He turned, flapped a hand as if waving at himself, and the screen went blank. Then he turned back and blinked to see me sitting there. Well, he said vaguely. Think about it. Later, as he escorted me back across that courtyard, so unnervingly full of motionless bodies, he said, It's not about my ego, you know. Oh, but it was. It was always about Nick's ego. Six. It's just being. It is not striving. Striving is the opposite of being. It is not restless fighting and earnest labor and testing and retesting and making. Things moved slowly at first. I flew back to the U.S. and reported. The company did not send me again. Fearful, I dare say, that I would defect. But neither did they fire me. I picked up my new contracts and got back to work. Kate was deliciously pleased to see me. She picked up a new phrase. Long time no see. She had learned the first portion of a Mozart sonata, 
and played it to me. I applauded. Long time no see, she said, hugging me. I missed you, I told her. I tickled her feet. Long see, long time. Things were volatile in Western India. The Federal Assembly broke up in acrimonious disharmony. That was hardly news, but I didn't have much time free for idle speculation. There was a good deal of militia hurly-burly, and then the Southern Indian Alliance launched a proper no-messing invasion. The news full of images of armored troops dodging from doorway to street corner, firing their baton rifles. Old-style tanks, with those conveyor belt wheel arrangements, scootling across scrub and drawing megaphones of dust behind them. Planes spraying Mumbai Harbor, passing and repassing at great danger to themselves from ground fire, so as to lay a gel skin over the water thick enough to allow foot soldiers to advance. Then it was all over, and the old government was gone, and a new one installed. And when things settled, the news was that Nick had managed to absent himself in all the chaos. Footage of people lolling in the sun with their hair fanned and spread behind them. In the first instances, it was a case of reporting a new religious cult. The new ascetics. The followers. Sun eaters. It took a while for the outlets to realize they weren't dealing with a religion at all not least because many of the new hair-wearers adopted spiritual or mystical attitudes when interviewed. The rumor was then that he'd reappeared in the southeast of the subcontinent. His followers went about the whole federation, and went into the further east, and went up into the stands, disseminating his technology. He himself was posted on a million slots, although never very cannily viraled, which meant either he could not afford to hire the best viral seed people, or else he was too forgetful to do so. Or, conceivably, he disdained to do so, because the content of these casts were increasingly clumsily preachy. The authenticity and validity of poverty. Wealth had wrecked the world. Poverty would save it. The rich would retreat to virtual lands, or hide away in materially moated and gated maison kingdoms. The poor, freed from the shackles of their hunger, would sweep, peacefully but inevitably as the tide, away the rich, and finally inherit the earth. There was a good deal more in this vein. Sometimes I detected the authentic tang of Nick's rhetoric in this, but more often than not, it was evidently revolutionary boilerplate, projected on a screen for him to read by whichever government or organization was sheltering him. Or, latterly, holding him captive. He was in Africa, or he was in China, or he was far beyond the pale horizon, someplace near the desert sands. God knows I loved him, as a friend loves a true friend. But I could hardly bear to watch any of it. I rationed myself to preserve my sanity. I had him at the top of my feed, and before settling down to my work in the morning, I would take half an hour to catch up on all the stories posted that concerned him. At the end of the day, before I left to go home to Kate, Home again, home again, she sang, splitted a lick. I'd run through anything new that came up. One week, he was one oddball new story amongst many. Here his disciples, the natural ascetic skinnies like a drumskin stretched on a coat rack. Some of his followers were very political, and some were wholly unpolitical, interested only in being able to emulate Jesus' 40-day fast without dying. Then another week went by, and suddenly he was big news. My feed could no longer keep up with it. And another week, and I no longer needed a feed, because he was all over the majors. Everyone was taking notice. His followers, interviewed now, seemed less like the flotsam and jetsam of a cruel world, and more like a core new class of people. Homo superior. The numbers were growing across southern Asia. Nick sang the Superman, and the Superman was going to overcome us. He was in Morocco. North Africa was the most we knew. But then he was seized by an equatorial state strike force in a daring operation that left 40 dead. He was held against his will, but seemed, in interview, perfectly blithe. 
I have a new vision of the world, said his face. The world will change. He said that more and more real people, code for the poor, were taking to his treatment. He said it was becoming an unstoppable force. When word got out that the equatorial states were trying to ransom him back to the USA for a huge sum of money, there were riots. He was broken out of the building in which he was being held. A few minutes of jittery footage of him, his face bloody, being carried bobbing across the sea of humanity, and grinning, and grinning, and disappeared. He later reappeared in Malaysia, an official guest of the Malay Republic. I watched the feed when Foss was flown out and put through all the rigmarole of secrecy to interview him. It really seemed to me the old Nick was trying to break out of what must have been an increasingly rigid carapace of popular proletarian expectation. He cracked jokes. He talked about his plans. This is the future, he said in a twinkly eye voice. I'll tell you. My technology is going to set humanity free from their starvation. I'll tell you what will happen. The poor will migrate. There will be a mass migration to the tropics, to those parts of the world where sunlight is plentiful, but where food is hard to come by. Some governments will be overwhelmed by this new exodus, but governments like the... Eh. And he had to glance down at his thumbback screen to remind himself which radical government's hospitality he was currently enjoying. People's Islamic Democratic Republic of Malaysia will welcome the coming of a new age of popular empowerment. What about the rest of the world? Foss asked. The rich can have the rest of the world. The cold and sunless northern and southern bands. The rich don't need sunlight. They have money for food. The whole global demographic will change. A new pulsing heart will bring life and culture and prosperity to the tropics. Over time, the north and the south will become increasingly irrelevant. The central zone will be everything. A great population of real people sitting in the sun for three hours a day, using the remaining 21, creating greatness for humanity. Seven. But what can I say? It was a fire, and fire, being a combustion, is always in the process of rendering itself inert. I did consider whether I needed to include, in this account, material about my motivation for betraying my friend. But I think that should be clear from what I have written here. The company persuaded me. A message was conveyed that I wanted to meet him again. A meeting was arranged. I flatter myself there were very few human beings on the planet for whom he would have agreed this. I had to pretend I had taken up dot snuff. This involved me actually practicing snorting the stuff, though I hated it. But the dot snuff was a necessary part of the seizure strategy. It identified where I was. And more to the point, it was programmed with Nick's Diener tag. Of course the company had that on file. That would separate us out from all other people in whichever room or space we found ourselves in. Let's say soldiers, guards, captors, terrorists, whomsoever. And in which the snuff would roil about like smoke. When the capture team came crashing in with furious suddenness, their guns would know which people to shoot and which not to shoot. He was back in the Indian Federation now, somewhere near Delhi. I was flown direct to Delhi International, and we landed at noon, and I was fizzing with nerves. From the airport, I took a taxi to an arranged spot, and there met a man who told me to take a taxi to another spot. At that place, I was collected by three other men and put into a large car. It was not a pleasant drive. I was bitter with nerves, my mind rendered frangible by terror. It was insanely hot. Migraine weather, 45, 50, and the car seemed to have no air conditioning. We drove past a succession of orchards, the trunks of the trees blipping past my window like a barcode. Then we turned up a road that stretched straight as a thermometer line, towards the horizon. 
and up we raced until it ended before a huge gate. Men with rifles stood about. I could see four dogs, tongues like untucked shirt tails. And then the gate was opened, and we drove inside. I was shown to a room, and in it I stayed for several hours. My luggage was taken away. I could not sleep. It was too hot to sleep anyway. My luggage was brought back. My tube of dot snuff still inside. I took this and slipped it inside my trouser pocket. I informed my guards of my need to use the restroom. Genuinely, for my bladder was fuller and bothered me more than my conscience. I was taken to a restroom with a dozen urinals at one wall and half a dozen sinks at another. A crossword pattern of gaps marked where humidity had removed some of the tiny blue tiles covering the walls. The shiny floor was not as clean as I might have liked. I emptied my bladder into the white porcelain cowl of a urinal and washed my hands at the sink. Then, like a character in a cheap film, I peered at myself in the mirror. My eyes saw my eyes. I examined my chin, the jowl shimmery with stubble, the velveteen eyebrows, the rather too large ears. This was the face that Kate saw when she leant in, saying either a kiss before bedtime or a bed before kiss time, and touched my lips with her lips. I was horribly conscious of the flippant rapidity of my heart, of blood hurrying with adrenaline. A guard I had not previously encountered, a tall, thin man with a gold-handled pistol tucked into the front of his trousers, came into the lavatory. The Redeemer will see you now, he said. Eight. Had he come straight out with, Why are you here? or what do you want, or anything like that, I might have blurted the truth. I had prepared answers for those questions, of course, but I was, upon seeing him again, miserably nervous. But of course he wasn't puzzled that I wanted to see him again. He took that as his due. Of course I wanted to see him. Who wouldn't? His face cracked wide with a grin, and he embraced me. We were in a wide, low-ceilinged room, and we were surrounded by gun-carrying young men and women, some pale as I, some sherry and acorn-colored, some black as licorice. A screen was switched on, but the sound was down. Through a barred window I could see the sepia plain, and, waverly with heat in the distance, the edge line of the orchards. Redeemer, is it? I said, my dry throat making the words creak. Can you believe it? He rolled his eyes upwards, so that he was looking at the ceiling. The direction, had he only known it, of the company troopers, sweeping in low orbit with a counterspin to hover, twenty miles up on the vertical. I try to fucking discourage it. Sure you do, I said. Then, clutching the tube in my pocket to stop my fingers trembling, I added in a rapid voice, I've taken up snuff, you know. Nick looked very somberly at me. I'm afraid you'll have to go outside if you want to snort that. For a moment, I thought he was being genuine, and my rapid heartbeat accelerated to popping point. My hands shivered. I was sweating. When he laughed and beckoned me towards a low-slung settee, I felt the relief as sharply as terror. I sat and tried, by focusing my resolve, to stop the tremble in my calf muscles. You know what I hate, he said, as if resuming a conversation we've been having just moments before. I hate that phrase, body fascism. You take a fat man or fat woman and criticize them for being fat. That makes you a body fascist. You know what's wrong there? It's the fascism angle. In a fucking world where one third of the population hoards all the fucking food and two thirds starve, in a world where your beloved company makes billions selling anti-obesity technology to people too stupid to understand, they can have anti-obesity for free by fucking eating less. In that world, where the fat ones steal the food from the thin ones so that the thin ones starve to death, 
That's a world where the fascists are the ones who criticize the fatties? Do you see how upside down that is? I fumbled the tube and sniffed up some powder. The little nanograins, keyed to my metabolism, thrummed into my system. Like, I suppose, fire being used to extinguish an oil well blaze. The extra stimulation had a calming effect. The talcum fine cloud in that room. I coughed, theatrically, and waved my hand to dissipate the material. So you're free to go? I'm not in charge of it, he said brightly. Fuck, it's good to see you again. I'm not in charge. I'm being carried along by it as much as anybody. It's a tempest, and it's blowing the whole of humanity like leaves in autumn. Some of it was company, I said. The ADP to ATP protocols weren't, legally speaking, yours to give away, you know. The hair stuff was mine, he said. I'm only saying. Sure, but the hair stuff. I thought of the troops falling through the sky directly above us their boot soles coming closer and closer to the tops of our heads. The photovoltaic stuff and the nanotube lysine fabrication of the conductive channels along the individual strands of hair. That was you. But that's of no use without the interface to do the ATP. He shrugged. You think like a lawyer. I mean, you think science like a lawyer. It's not that at all. You don't think there's a moral imperative? When the famine in the Southern African republics is killing, how many thousands a week is it? Then he brightened. Fuck, it's good to see you, though. If I'd let the company have this, they'd have squeezed every last euro of profit out of it, and millions would have died. But his heart wasn't really in this old exchange. Wait till I've shown you round, he said, as excited as a child, and swept his right hand in an arc, lord of the manor-wise. Somewhere outside the room, a siren was sounding, muffled by distance, a warbling meow. Nick ignored it, although several of his guards perked their heads up. One went out to see what the pother was. I felt the agitation building in my viscera. Betrayal is not something I have any natural tolerance for, I think. It is an uncomfortable thing. I fidgeted. The sweat kept running into my eyes. All the old rhythms of life change, Nick said. Everything is different now. I felt the urge to scream. I clenched my teeth. The urge passed. Of course, power is scared, Nick was saying. Of course, power wants to stop what we're doing, wants to stop us liberating people from hunger. Keeping people in fear of starvation has always been the main strategy by which power has kept people subordinate. I'll say, I said squeakily, how much I love your sophomore lectures on politics. Hey, he said, either in mock outrage or in real outrage. I was too far gone to be able to tell the difference. The thing is, I started to say, and then lots of things happened. The clattering cough of rifle fire started up outside. There was the realization that the high-pitched noise my brain had been half-hearing for the last minute was a real sound, not just tinnitus. And then almost at once, the sudden crescendo or distillation of precisely that noise. A great thumping crash from above, and the appearance, in a welter of plaster and smoke, of an enormous metal beak through the middle of the ceiling. The roof sagged and the whole room bowed out on its walls. Then the beak snapped open, and two, three, four troopers dropped to the floor, spinning round and firing their weapons. All I remember of the next twenty seconds is the explosive stutter cough and the disco flicker of multiple weapon discharges, and then the stench of gunfire's aftermath. A cosmic finger was running smoothly round and round the lip of a cosmic wine glass. I blinked and blinked, and looked about me. The dust in the air looked like steam. That open metal beak, rammed through the ceiling, had the disconcerting appearance of a weird avant-art metal chandelier. There were half a dozen troopers, standing in various orientations and positions, but with all their guns held like Dalek eyes. There were a number of sprawling bodies on the floor. I didn't want to count them. 
or look too closely at them. And beside me, on the settee, was an astonished-looking Neocles. I moved my mouth to say something to him, and then either I said something that my ears did not register, or else I didn't say anything. He didn't look at me. He jerked forward, and then jerked up. Standing, from a pouch in his pocket strides, he pulled out a small, square-shaped object which, fumbling a little, he fitted into his right hand. The troopers may have been shouting at him, or they may have been standing there perfectly silently. I couldn't tell you. Granular white clouds of plaster were sifting down. Nick leveled his pistol, holding his arm straight out. There was a conjurer's trick with multiple bright red streamers and ribbons being pulled instantly and magically out of his chest. And then he hurtled backwards, over the top of the settee, to land on his spine on the floor. It took a moment for me to understand what had happened. He may have been thinking, either in the moment or else as something long pre-planned, about martyrdom. Perhaps the Redeemer is not able to communicate his message in any other way. It's also possible that, having gone through life protected by the tight-fitting prophylactic of his unassailable ego, that he may have genuinely believed that he could single-handedly shoot down half a dozen troopers and emerge the hero of the day. I honestly do not know. 9. I was forced to leave my home and live in a series of hideouts. Of course, a Judas is as valuable and holy figure as any other in the sacred drama. But religious people, Kate kneeling beside the bed at nighttime, praying to meekling Jesus, gent and mild, can be faulted, I think, for feeling imaginatively to enter into the mindset of their Judases. Nobody loved Nick as deeply as I or knew him so well. But he was rich, and not one motion of his liberal conscience or his egotistical desire to do good in the world changed that fact, or changed his inability to enter, actually, into the life of the poor. The poor don't want the rich to save them. Even the rioters in the Indian Federation, even the starving Australians, even they, if only they knew it, don't want to be carried by a godlike rich man into a new realm. What they want is much simpler. They want not to be poor. It's simultaneously very straightforward and very complicated. Nick's hair was, in fact, only a way of making manifest the essence of class relations. In his utopia, the poor would actually become, would literally become, the vegetation of the earth. The rich would reinforce their position as the zoology to the poor's botany. Nothing could be more damaging, because it would bed in the belief that it is natural and inevitable that the rich graze upon the poor, and that the poor are there to be grazed upon. Without even realizing it, Nick was laboring to make the disenfranchised a global irrelevance, to make them grass for the rich to graze upon. I loved him but he was doing evil. I had no choice. 10. Last night, as we lay in bed together in my new, company-sourced, secure flat in, I can't say where, though I'm the one paying the rent, Kate said to me, I am cut in half like the moon, but like the moon, I grow whole again. I was astonished by this. This really isn't the sort of thing she says. What was that, sweet? I asked her. What did you say, my love? But she was asleep. Her red lips were pursed, and her breath slipping out and slipping in. Before my last breath, Robert Reed. Robert Reed sold his first story in 1986, and quickly established himself as a frequent contributor to the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, Asimov Science Fiction, and many other markets. Reed may be one of the most prolific of today's young writers, 
particularly at short fiction lengths, seriously rivaled for that position only by authors such as Stephen Baxter and Brian Stableford. And, also like Baxter and Stableford, he manages to keep up a very high standard of quality while being prolific, something that is not at all easy to do. Read stories such as Sister Alice, Brother Perfect, Decency, Savior, The Remoras, Chrysalis, Whiptail, The Utility Man, Marrow, Birthday, Blind, The Toad of Heaven, Stride, The Shape of Everything, Guest of Honor, Waging Good, and Killing the Morrow, among at least a half dozen others equally as strong, count among some of the best short works produced by anyone in the 1980s and 1990s. Many of his best stories have been assembled in the collections The Dragons of Spring Place and The Cuckoo's Boys. Nor is he non-prolific as a novelist, having turned out 11 novels since the end of the 1980s, including The Lee Shore, The Hormone Jungle, Black Milk, The Remarkables, Down the Bright Way, Beyond the Veil of Stars, An Exaltation of Larks, Beneath the Gated Sky, Marrow, Sister Alice, and The Well of Stars, as well as two chapbook novellas, Mere and Flavors of My Genius. His most recent book is a new novel, Eater of Bone. Reed lives with his family in Lincoln, Nebraska. Here, he unravels a fascinating archaeological mystery with roots that stretch back for millions of years. Thomas The afternoon was clear and exceptionally cold. An off-duty company geologist was driving across the floor of the mine when a flash of reflected light caught his gaze. He didn't particularly want to go home, and 31 years in the coal industry hadn't quite killed the curious boy inside him. Backing up, he saw the flash repeated, and it seemed peculiar enough that he pulled on his stocking cap and mittens and climbed slowly up over the lignite coal, taking a close, careful look at something that made no sense whatsoever. His fingers were numb and nose frostbitten when he reached the field office, but he didn't tremble until he began to the maps showing his superiors what patch of ground shouldn't be touched until more qualified experts could come in and kick around. What did you find? they asked. An unknown species, seemed like an honest, worthy answer. Sixty million years ago, plant material had gathered inside a basin sandwiched between young mountain ranges. Then the peat was covered over with eroded debris and slowly cooked into the low-sulfur treasure that today fed power plants across half of the country. Fossils were common in Powder River country. The coal often looked like rotted leaves and sticks, but there was no way to systematically investigate what the gigantic machines wrested from the ground. Tons of profit came up with every scoop, and only one person in the room wanted the discovery preserved, no matter how unique it might be. The geologist listened to the group's decision. Then he lifted the stakes, showing the photographs that he had taken with his cell phone camera. This resembles nothing I've ever seen before, he added. Then mostly to himself, he muttered. It's like nothing else in the world. I've seen these before, one supervisor barked. It's nothing, Tom. Normally an agreeable sort, the geologist nodded calmly but then his voice showed bite when he asked, Why can't we damn well be sure? Just to be safe. No, another boss growled. Now forget about it. Thirty-one years of loyal service to the company brought one undeniable lesson. This argument would never be won here. So he retreated, driving into Gillette and his tiny house. His wife was sitting in the front of the television, half asleep. He poured the last of her whiskey down the sink, and she stood and cursed him for some vague reason, and swung hard at his face, and he caught her and wrestled her to bed, saying all of the usual words until she finally closed her eyes. Then he collected several dozen important names and agencies, sending out a trim but explicit email that included his phone numbers and the best of his inadequate pictures. 
Thomas showered quickly, and he waited. Nobody called. Then he dressed and ate dinner before carrying two shotguns, unloaded, and a tall thermos of coffee out the truck, and after a few minutes of consideration, he drove back to the mine, parking as close to the fossil as possible. Tom's plan, such as it was, involved shooing away the excavators as long as possible, first with words, and, if necessary, empty threats. But these were temporary measures. And worse, he discovered that his phone didn't work down here in the pit's deepest corner. That's why he stepped out into the cold again, navigating by the stars and carrying a small hammer. He intended to break off a few pieces of the fossil, as a precaution, in case this treasure was dug up and rolled east, doomed to be incinerated with the rest of the anonymous coal. Matty Few took notice of the peculiar email. Three colleagues called its author, two leaving messages on his voicemail. CNN science reporter ordered her intern to contact the corporation's main office for reaction. The PR person on duty knew nothing about the incident, sharply questioned its validity, and after restating his employer's sterling environmental record, hung up. In frustration, the intern contacted a random astronomer living in Colorado. The astronomer knew nothing about the matter. She glanced at the forwarded email, in particular the downloaded images, and then said, Interesting, to the uninterested voice. It wasn't until later, staring at the twisted body with its odd limbs and very peculiar skull, that her heart began to race. She called the geologist's phones. Nobody answered. Leaving warning of her imminent arrival, she dressed for the Arctic and grabbed the department's sat phone, buying two tall coffees when she gassed up on her way out of Boulder. Better than most, Maddie understood the temporary nature of life. This woman, who had never before been stopped by the police, earned three speeding tickets on the journey north. Approaching the mine, she slipped in behind an empty dump truck, driving almost beneath the rear axle, and because the only security guard happened to be relieving himself, she managed to slip undetected out onto the gouged, unearthly landscape. GPS coordinates took her to a pickup truck parked beside a blackish-brown cliff. The engine was running, a stranger sleeping behind the wheel. Beside him on the seat was what looked like huge, misshapen hands, cradling a large golden ring. Two shotguns were perched against the far door. For a brief moment, she hesitated. But Mattie shoved her natural caution aside. With a tap on the glass, she woke the stranger, and startled, he stared out at what must have looked like a ghost. This young woman with almost no hair and a gaunt, wasted face. He nervously rolled down the window. Are you Thomas Green? I'm Matty Chong. Stupid with fatigue, Tom asked. What are you doing here? I came to see your alien, she reported. He accepted that. What bothered him more was the stranger's appearance. Ma'am, if you don't mind my asking, what's wrong with you? Cancer, Matty reported amiably, throwing her flashlight's beam against the deep seam of late night. And if I'm alive in four months, I'll beat all of my doctor's predictions. The President It was rare not to be the most important man in the room, and today brought one of those exceptional occasions. A trailer crowded with scientists and Secret Service agents, mining representatives and select reporters, plus the three-person congressional delegation from Wyoming. But the hero of the moment, was Dr. Green, and everybody wanted to stand beside the renowned geologist. Of course, Dr. Chung should have shared this limelight, but she was flown to Utah this morning, her illness taking its expected, presumably fatal turn. The president was merely another visitor, and as the lesser celebrity, it was his duty to shake hands and ask about the poor woman's health. Every researcher, had to be congratulated on the historic, world-shattering work, and he insisted on smiles all around. Bully joviality was the president's great skill, 
and he was at his best when he was feeling less than happy. Today was especially miserable. The bitter wind and low leaden skies only underscored a mood that had crumbled at dawn. That's when word arrived that his former chief of staff, a slippery political worm on his noblest day, planned to give the special investigator everything, including the damned briefcase filled with cash and ten hours of exceptionally embarrassing recordings. The president's administration was wounded, and by tomorrow, it might well be dead. Cautious voices wanted the Wyoming visit canceled, but that would have required an artful excuse. And what would have changed? Nothing. Besides, he understood that if enough people were fascinated with these old bones and odd artifacts, the coming nastiness might not be as awful as it promised to be. Dr. Irving Case was the project administrator, and he had been on duty for less than a week. But with a bureaucrat's instincts for what counted, he used a large, empty smile and a big voice. Mr. President, sir, would you like to go see the discovery now, sir? If it's no problem, let's have a peek at old George. Back into the winter miseries they went. A tent-like shelter had been erected around the burial site to block the wind and blowing coal dust. As they strolled across the barren scene, a dozen experts spoke in a competitive chorus, agreeing that the fossil was unique and remarkable, and, of course, immeasurably precious. The first priority was to disturb nothing, every clue precious and no one certain what constituted a clue. The president kept hearing how little was known, Yet in the next moment, a dozen different hypotheses were offered to explain the creature's origins and how it might have looked in life and why it was where it was and why this wasn't where it had lived. It didn't live here, the president interrupted. Aiming for humor, he said, this splendid desolation, this is exactly where every movie alien roams. Laughter blossomed, the bright fleeting giddiness that attaches itself to men of power. Then they reached the shelter, and reverent silence took hold. Dr. Case mentioned rules. Politely but firmly, he reminded everybody to wear the proper masks and gloves, and nothing could be touched. And then he warned the press to stand back so that all might enjoy the best possible view. Photographs and video had already shown the mysterious fossil to the world. The enormous stratum of coal in which he or she was entombed was long ago dubbed Big George, hence the fossil's popular name. Lights had been strung near the tent ceiling. The coal slag was cleared away, the flat floor littered with scientific instruments and brightly colored cables. What rose before the president was both immediately recognizable and immeasurably strange. Sixty million years ago, alien hands had dug a hole deep into the watery peat, and then George was lowered in, or climbed in, feet first. Shovels had been used in the excavation. Two archaeologists pointed at nearly invisible details, describing with confidence how the metal blades must have looked and what kinds of limbs employed them. And even while they were talking, a third voice reminded everyone that conjectures were fine, but nothing was proved, and might never be. George was a big fellow. And even to the uninformed eye, he looked like something from another world. The weight of the rock had compressed him, but not as badly as the president expected. Two bent legs helped carry the long horizontal body, and two more legs were presumably buried out of sight. A fifth limb rose from behind what looked like the angular and watchful face of a praying mantis, and the arm was jointed and complicated and partially destroyed. Dr. Green had removed the matching hands and now famous gold ring. The corpse was majestic, wasn't it? But in the next moment, in the president's eyes, George looked preposterous. Pieces stolen from unrelated creatures had been thrown together, a wily hoaxer having his laugh at all this foolish, misplaced fascination. Turning to world's most famous geologist, the president asked, 
How were we so lucky? This poor fellow exposed this way. The call's weak around the edges of the grave, Dr. Green explained. His celebrity was wearing on him, puffy eyes half closed, a day's deep fatigue visible in his features and slope shouldered posture. If the blade had cut anywhere else, I wouldn't have noticed anything. It was the ring you saw? Yes, sir. The president nodded. I haven't seen that artifact yet, he mentioned. Dr. K stepped forward. The hands and ring have been sent to the Sandia, sir, for analysis and closer study. The president nodded, looking up again. So well preserved. Dr. Case enjoyed his little stage. The corpse shows very little sign of decomposition, he explained, and we don't know why. Maybe the acidic peat and lack of oxygen preserved it, although it's possible that the flesh was simply too alien, and our microbes couldn't find anything to chew on. The president nodded, pretending to appreciate the vagaries of alien biology. Then he returned to one statement that had puzzled him earlier. And why do we think George lived elsewhere? Somebody said, the feet. Each leg ended with a narrow three-toed foot. They're not built for bogs, another voice volunteered. George would have sunk into his knees, or deeper. Against the rules, the president stepped closer. Nobody dared correct him, but the scene grew noticeably quieter. A Clydesdale horse would have been larger, but not by much. He knelt and stared at the lead foot, moving his head back and forth to avoid his own shadow. Sixty million years in the ground, yet the corpse retained its flesh and what seemed to be its natural color, which was tan. The crushing weight had twisted the dead foot, every toe visible. But what was perhaps more remarkable lay beneath the foot, the remnants of what might be animal skin, cut and stitched to create a simple shoe. Is this really a moccasin? he asked. Dr. Case joined him, kneeling and pushing his own mask closer to his mouth, making absolutely certain not to contaminate the treasure. We have at least 15 features that are probably remnants of clothing, Mr. President, and six metallic objects that looked like knives and such, all carried on the body. Anything special? the president inquired. The administrator blinked, unsure what to make of the question. You know, like a laser gun or portable reactor. Nothing like that, sir. That surprises me, the president admitted. Dr. Case stood, offering his hand. From what we can tell, sir, the technology is early Iron Age, if that. The president rose without anyone's help. Another few minutes of inexpert study ended when someone mentioned lunch. A fine idea, the president agreed. Let the scientists back to work. Then everyone filed outside and pulled off the choking masks. The distraction was over. The show finished. The president found his previous depression waiting for him, like a black mountain bearing down on his aging frame. He wiped his mouth with a sleeve, accepted the vacuous thanks of several people, and then he dredged up another one of his patented smiles, wondering why it was that no president had killed himself in office. Considering the pressures of the job, that seemed remarkable. Almost an oversight, really. The idea was so intriguing that he spent the next several moments dancing with a lurid fantasy. He would kill himself today. People around the world would weep, and with that, he would give himself a lasting, however inglorious, place in history. Irving He was asked to say a few words at the funeral, honoring the heroic figure that had been lost. It was a fine speech and a very pleasant day in late September. The press in full attendance and millions watching only Irving. But how does one dispose of the body of a great person, someone composed of digital images and countless memories as well as flesh and bone? That was the question he had asked himself, preparing for this moment. 
this opportunity. Of course, he wouldn't say anything so blatant or borderline crass, but that was the crux of the situation. Most of the world's citizens were anonymous bodies with a few possessions soon to be misplaced. But one can never bury or burn the modern celebrity. Their lives were so vast, so persistent and sturdy, that it was impossible to make a suitable grave. Indeed, death could free the largest celebrities into a greater, more enduring realm where they would never age, and with luck, would only grow even more impressive with the passage of years. What Irving did address was his great admiration for a colleague who quickly became his good friend. A sad, tragic death, he said, and as unexpected as the discovery inside the coal. And we are all the lesser because of it. He didn't mention the deep irony that hadn't escaped anyone's attention. Thomas Green was killed in a minor traffic accident while George's co-discoverer was on the rebound, her withered body responding to an experimental regime of stem cells and tailored phages. The audience smiled as Irving left the podium. Of course, Mattie deserved the final word, and she used her public moment to beg for full funding of the ongoing graveyard project. It was a clumsy display of politics, and only she could get away with it. Irving was the project's administrator, far too exposed to act in such obvious ways. But he was grateful for her waving the hat, and he told her so afterwards. There was a reception back in Gillette, and another one of the endless news conferences, and the two sat close together behind a long table, fielding the same questions again and again. Ten months after its discovery, nobody knew for sure how large the burial ground was, but evidence hinted at an enormous field of bodies, most of them deeper than George, buried over a period of many thousands of years. That was why the entire mine had been closed and made into a national monument. Power plants were sitting idle back east, but that's how important the graveyard was. Every reporter wanted to know why the aliens had used this location. Maddie and Irving confessed that they were just as curious and as frustrated by their ignorance. To date, 38 Georges had been recovered from within the gigantic coal seam. As a rule, the deeper bodies wore better clothes and carried fancier tools, though nothing worthy of a star traveler had been uncovered yet. Without giving details, Irving allowed that a final census might be coming, and that's when Maddie mentioned the new seismic scans, an elaborate experiment to make the lignite transparent as water. Don't put too much stock in success, Irving warned the reporters and cameras. This technology is new and fickle, and we might not get results for months, if ever. It seemed odd, a man in his position staunching excitement. But if these scans failed... He might be blamed. And what good would that do? This job was a dream, and Irving intended to remain inside the dream as long as possible. He was successful and couldn't imagine being happier, wielding power over hundreds of lives and a billion-dollar budget. Emperor to an empire that had already revolutionized how humanity looked at itself and the universe. Irving was exhilarated by the news conference. Maddie was exhausted. He made a point of walking this still frail woman to her car, even when she claimed she could manage on her own, thank you. I insist, he told her, and they shook hands and parted. And as he walked back into the reception hall, an associate approached quickly and whispered, Sir, you have to see this, sir. See what? Then in the next instant he muttered, Results? Yes, sir. The laptop was set up in the little kitchen linked to base camp's computers, and the news was astonishing enough that this man, who never failed to find the right words, was mute, knees bending as he stared at data that made his fondest dreams look like weak fantasies. The screen was jammed with white marks and long numbers, each grave given a precise designation, tied to estimated size and metal content and other crucial information. The graveyard covered more than five square kilometers, and the dead were thick, 
particularly in the deepest layers. How many? he muttered. At least thirty thousand, sir. Again, Irving's voice failed him. The assistant misread his silence, assuming disappointment. But that's not the final number, she added. There are so many bodies, particularly near the bottom, sir. The final number is sure to be quite a bit larger than this. Badger. Why he loved the girl was a complicated business. There were so many reasons he couldn't count them. Moments of bliss and the intense looks that she gave him and little touches in the dark and touches offered but then taken away. Teasing. She was an expert at the tease. She was funny and quick with her tongue. And she was beautiful, of course. Yet she carried her beauty in ways most girls couldn't. Slender and built like a boy, she had the smallest tits he'd ever felt up, a fact that he foolishly admitted once. But her face had this wonderful full mouth and a perfect nose, and impossibly big eyes full of an earthly blue that watched him whenever he talked, and paid even closer attention when he wasn't saying anything. She was observant in ways he never would be, and she was smart about people. And even though she rarely left Wyoming, she seemed to know more about the world than did her much older boyfriend, who had already traveled across the globe three or four times. Badger had little memory for the places that he had been, but Hannah knew that if she kept asking questions, he might remember what the Sahara looked like at midnight, and what he saw on a certain street in Phnom Penh, and what it felt like to tunnel his way into an Incan burial chamber seven hundred years after it was sealed off from the world. Why Badger, was her first question, asked moments after they met. He sipped his beer and looked around the bar, wondering who this youngster was. Because that's my name, he said with a shrug. You dig tunnels, right? Who are you, he asked. Hannah. She'd already settled on the stool beside his. Without another word, she pulled his glass over and took a sip, grinning as she licked the Budweiser off her upper lip. Reading his mind, she said, I'm twenty-two. You aren't, he replied. She laughed and gave back his remaining beer. Word is, Badger, you're working at the graveyard, digging down to the most interesting Georges. Which high school do you go to? I attend the university in Laramie, she replied. Then she put an elbow on the bar and set her delicate chin on the edge of her palm, fingers curled up beneath that big, wonderful, smiling mouth. Without a trace of doubt, she told him. You aren't all that comfortable with women, are you, Badger? How do you know my name? I've seen you, and I've asked about you, I guess. Then she laughed at him, adding, Or maybe I heard there was this guy named Badger digging holes for Dr. Chong, and you came tromping in here, and I figured, just by looking at you, that you had to be that guy. What would you think of that? He didn't know what the girl was telling him, or if he should care one way or another. I know Maddie pretty well, she reported. Your boss has come to school to talk. I don't know, maybe ten times? She's a neat, neat lady, I think. He nodded agreeably. How long has she been in charge? Three months, he answered. Dr. Case got pushed up to Washington. I bet she drives you nuts, she interrupted. Why is that? A feeling. Hannah shrugged and suddenly changed topics. Does it ever make you crazy, thinking what you're working on? Why would it? The graveyard, she shouted. Down came her hand, and she sat up straight on the stool, looking around the quiet bar as if to hunt down a witness to this foolishness. One hundred thousand dead aliens in the ground, and you're part of the team that's working their way to the bottom of the dead. Isn't that an astonishing thing? Don't you wake up every morning and think, God, how incredibly lucky can one burrowing weasel be? My build, he allowed. She fell silent, watching him. I got the name as a kid, he reported. My given name is Stuart, but I got the nickname because I've got short legs and a little bit of strength, I guess. You guess? I'm strong, he said. I can tell. 
Yeah? I like strong, she confessed, leaning in close. Or maybe it wasn't that complicated, why he loved Hannah. She seemed to truly love him, and how could he not return the emotion? Beautiful and smart and sharp, and he was powerless to ignore her overtures. He gave her the rest of his beer and answered her questions as far as he could, admitting that the scope and importance of the graveyard was beyond him. He was a professional digger, using equipment designed by others. He was adept at carving his way through complicated strata, avoiding other graves and other treasures on his way to realms that hadn't seen sun since a few million years after the dinosaurs died away. Later, Hannah asked, What do you think of them? They were sitting in his truck in the open countryside, at night. So far, they hadn't even kissed but it felt as if they'd been sitting there for years. It was that natural, that inevitable. Think about who, he said. She gave him a look. He understood, but the honest answer was another shrug and the embarrassing admission. I don't think much. I don't know much at all. I've seen hundreds of them, but the aliens still look nothing but strange to me. What they were like when they were alive, I don't have any idea. You don't call them Georges, she pointed out. That's a silly name, he growled, and it doesn't suit them. She accepted the logic. This was the moment when Badger caught himself wondering when he would ask the girl to marry him. Not if, but when. Everybody else has a story, Hannah told him. I haven't met the person who doesn't think these creatures were part of some lost colony or prisoners in an alien work camp. Or maybe they were wanderers living in orbit, but burying themselves in the peat so we'd find them millions of years later, just to prove to us that they'd been here. I don't know the answer, he said. And do you know why, she asked. Because you understand what's important. Then she lifted her face to his and they kissed for a long while. And it was all that he could do. Big, strong, unimaginative badger. Not to ask that girl to marry him right then. Hannah. He called to ask, How you doing, hun? Good, she lied. Feel like walking around? Why? Dr. Chung says it's all right. I explained how the doctor wants you in bed, but for the next couple weeks, you can still move. Will I get to see the new one? You want to? I'm getting dressed now, she lied, crawling off the couch. Are you coming to get me, Badge? Pulling into the driveway right now, he reported happily. So she got caught. Not only wasn't she close to ready, Hannah looked awful and it took more promises and a few growls before Badger decided she was up to this adventure. Babies. Such a bother. Laying eggs would be so much easier. Drop them somewhere safe and walk away. Living your own life until the kids were big enough to be fun. That's how mothering should be. She mentioned her idea to Badger. He was driving and laughing. I wonder where you got that from. George's had laid eggs. The younger females always had a few in some incomplete stage of development. Nobody knew if they put their basketball-sized eggs inside nests or incubators or what. Two years of research, yet the alien's life remained mysterious, open to guesswork and wishful thinking. But somewhere in those vanished mountains, up high where the air was deliciously thin, the species had struggled mightily to replace the several friends and family being buried every year in that deep black peat. Maddie was waiting for them at the surface. She smiled warmly and asked Hannah how she was feeling, and Hannah tried to sound like a woman in robust good health. Everybody dressed in clean gowns and masks, and then they took the long walk below ground, following one of the worm-like tunnels that Badger had cut into the deep sea. Seven other times Hannah had gotten a tour, but this visit was unique because of the age of the corpse being unearthed. One of the first-generation Georges, it was guessed, 
and because this was a privilege that not even the most connected members of the media had known. This body lay at the graveyard's edge. To help the studies, Badger had carved an enormous room beside the fossil. The room was filled with machinery and lights, coolers full of food and drink, a portable restroom, plus several researchers busy investigating the tiniest features, making ready for the slow, cautious removal of the dead alien female. Compared to the first George, she was a giant. Hannah expected as much, but seeing the body made her breath quicken. A once powerful creature, larger than most rhinoceroses, she now lay crumpled down by death and suffocation and the weight of the world that had been peeled away above her. She was dead, yet she was entirely whole, too. The acidic peat was a perfect preservative for flesh born outside this world, and presumably the aliens understood that salient fact. Great! Hannah gushed. Wonderful! Thank you! Step closer. Maddie offered. Just not past the yellow line. A pair of researchers, sexless in their gowns and masks, were perched on a short scaffold, carefully working with the alien's hands. The burial ring? Hannah asked. Maddie nodded. An aluminum alloy. Very sophisticated. Very obvious in the scans. How different. The older the corpse, the more elaborate the ring. Maddie explained. This one's more like a cylinder than a ring, and it's covered with details we don't find in any of the later burials. The clothing was more elaborate, Hannah noticed. Legs covered with trousers held up by elaborate belts. The feet enjoying what looked like elegant boots sewn from an ancient mammal's leathery hide. A nylon satchel rode the long back, worn by heavy use every pocket stripped of anything that would have been difficult to replace. Will we ever find the prize? Hannah asked. That amazing widget that transforms life on Earth? Maddie shrugged, admitting, I keep promising that. Every trip to Congress, I say it's going to happen soon. But I seriously wonder. From what I've seen... These creatures never went into the ground carrying anything fancy or difficult to make. Those words sank home. Hannah nodded and glanced at Badger's eyes, asking, What else did I want to ask, hon? You remember? Religion, he mentioned. Oh, yeah. Standing on the yellow line, she asked, So why did they go into the ground, Matty? I don't know. Hannah glanced at the woman and then she stared up at the alien's cupped hands, imagining that important ring of metal. I know the story I like best. Which one? A starship reached our solar system, but something went wrong. Maybe the ship was supposed to refuel and set out for a different star, and it malfunctioned. Maybe its sister ships were supposed to meet here, but nobody showed. Hannah liked Maddie and respected her, and she wanted to sound informed on this extraordinary topic. Mars or the moon would have made better homes. Their plan could have been to terraform another world. I know they would have appreciated the lighter gravity. And we think, because of the evidence we can surmise, that their bodies didn't need or want as much free oxygen as we require. So whatever the reason, Earth isn't where they wanted to be. A lot of people think that, Maddie said. Hannah continued. They didn't want to stay here long, and we don't have any evidence that their starship landed nearby. But they came here. The aliens sat down in the nearby mountains, and they managed to find food and build shelter, and survive. But after ten or fifty or maybe two hundred years, whatever felt like a long time for that first generation... No one had come to rescue them. And that's why they started digging holes and climbing inside. You believe they were hibernating? Maddie guessed. No, Hannah admitted. Or I mean, maybe they slept when they were buried. But they weren't planning to wake up like normal either. Their brains weren't like ours, I know. Crystalline and tough, and all the evidence points to a low-oxygen metabolism. 
What I think happened, each of the creatures reached a point in life when they felt past their prime, or particularly sad, or whatever. And that's why a lady like this would climb into the cold peat. She believes, or at least she needs to believe, that in another few hundred years, another ring-shaped starship is going to fall toward our sun. Dig her up and bring her back to life. Maddie contemplated the argument and nodded. I've heard that story a few times, in one fashion or another. That's how their tradition started, Hannah continued. Every generation of Georges buried itself in the peat, and after a few centuries or a few thousand years, nobody would remember why. All they knew that it was important to do, and that by holding a metal ring in your hands, you were making yourself a little easier to find inside your sleeping place. Badger sighed, disapproving of the rampant speculation. That might well be true, said Maddie, which explains why the rings got simpler as time passed. Nobody remembered what the starship looked like, or maybe they forgot about the ship entirely, and the ring's purpose changed. It was a symbol, an offering, something that would allow their god to catch their soul and take them back to heaven again. Just then, the two workers on the scaffold slipped the burial ring out from between the dead fingers. Maddie approached them and took the prize in both of her gloved hands. Hannah and then Badger stared at what everyone in the world would see in another few hours. A model of a great starship that had once crossed the vacant, unloving blackness of space, ending up where it shouldn't have been and its crew and their descendants dying slowly over the next 20,000 years. Once last time, Hannah thanked Maddie for the tour. Walking to the surface again, she took her husband's big hand and held it tightly and said, We're lucky people. Why's that? Badger asked. Because we're exactly where we belong, she replied, as if it couldn't be more obvious. Then they were in the open again walking on a ravaged landscape dwarfed by the boundless Wyoming sky. And between one step and the next, Tana felt something change inside her body, a slight sensation that held no pain and would normally mean nothing. But she stopped walking. She stopped, but Badger kept marching forward. With both hands, she tenderly touched herself, and she forgot all about the aliens and their epic, long-extinct problems. Bleeding harder by the moment, she looked up to see her husband far ahead of her now, and to herself, with the smallest of whispers, she muttered, Oh, no, not today. George Despite night and the season, the thick air burned with its heat and choking oxygen, and the smallest task brought misery, and even standing was work too, and the strongest of the all stood on the broad planks and dug, and he dug with them at the soft, wet rot of the ground. Everyone but him said those good, proper words saved for occasions such as this. Ancient chants about better worlds and difficult journeys that ended with survival and giant caring hands that were approaching even now, soon to reach down from the stars to rescue the worthy dead. Silence was expected of the dead, and that was why he said nothing. Silence was the grand tradition born because another, some woman buried far beneath them, said nothing at her death and the all were so impressed by her reserve and dignity that a taboo was born on that night. How long ago was that time? It was a topic of some conjecture, and no good answers, and he used to care about abstract matters like that, but discovered now that he couldn't care any more. His life had been full of idle ideas that had wasted his time, and he was sorry for his misspent passion and all else that went wrong for him. Grief took hold, so dangerous and so massive that he had to set his shovel on the plank and say nothing in a new fashion, gaining the attention of his last surviving daughter. She was a small and pretty and very smart example of the all, and she was more perceptive than most, 
guessing what was wrong, and looking at him compassionately when she said, with clicks and warbles, that she was proud of her father, and proud to belong to his honorable lineage, and that he should empty his mind of poisonous thoughts, that he should think of the dead under them, and how good it would feel to pass into a realm where thousands of enduring souls waited. But the dead were merely dead. Promised hands had never arrived, not in their lives or in his. That buoyant faith of youth, once his most cherished possession, was a tattered hope. And perhaps the next dawn would erase even that. That was why it was sensible to accept the smothering sleep now. Now, while the mind believed, however weakly, in its own salvation. Because no matter how long the odds, every other ending was even more terrible. He could become a sack of skin filled with anonymous bones and odd organs that would never again know life, that would be thrown into the communal garden to serve as compost, that the all might recall for another three generations, or maybe four, before the future erased his entire existence. Once again, to the joy of his daughter and the others, the dead man picked up the long shovel and dug. The front feet threw his weight into the blade, and the blade cut into the cold, watery muck, and up came another gout of peat that had to be set carefully behind him. Still, the right words were spoken, the right blessings offered, and the right motions made. No one daring complain about the heat, or the slow progress, or the obvious sorry fact that the strongest and largest of the all were barely able to manage what their ancestors had done easily. At least so the old stories claimed. Then came the moment when the fresh, wet, rectangular hole was finished, and one of them had to climb inside. Odd as it seemed, he forgot his duty here. He found himself looking at the others, even at his exhausted daughter, wondering who was to receive this well-deserved honor. Oh, yes, me, he recalled. And then he clicked a loud laugh, and he almost spoke, thinking maybe they would appreciate the grim humor. But no, this was a joke best enjoyed by the doomed, and these souls were nothing but alive. Leaving the moment unspoiled, the ceremony whole and sacred, he set his shovel aside and proved to each that he was stealing nothing precious. Hands empty, pockets opened, he showed them just a few cheap knives that he wanted for sentimental reasons. Then he stepped into the chilly, stinking mess of water and rot, and with his feet sinking, but his head exposed, he reached up with his long arm. Hands opened until that good daughter placed the golden ring into his ready grip. True to the custom, he said nothing more. In the east, above the high, snow-laced mountains, the winter sun was beginning to rise. Soon the killing heat would return to the lowlands, this brutal ground rendered unlivable. They all worked together to finish what had taken too long. Shovels and muddy hands flinging the cold peat at the water, and then at him. Ceremony balanced on growing desperation, and he carefully said nothing, and worked hard to think nothing but good thoughts. But then a favorite son returned to him, killed in a rock slide and lost. And he thought of his best mate, whose central heart burst without warning, and because promises cost so little. He swore to both of them that he would carry their memories into this other realm, whatever shape it took. When he discovered that he could not breathe, he struggled, but his mouth was already beneath the water, his head fixed in place. With the job nearly finished, most of the all kept working. But others were standing away from the grave, those too weak to help, or too spent, or too indifferent and they decided that the dead could not hear them. With private little voices, they spoke about the coming day and the coming year. Gentle but intense words dwelling on relationships forming and relationships lost, and who looked best in their funeral garb, and whose children were the prettiest and wisest. 
and who would die next. And oh, by the way, did anyone think to bring a little snack for the journey home? One of our bastards is missing. Paul Cornell Here's a fast-paced study of the great game played between nations that reads like a Ruritanian romance written by Charles Strauss. British author Paul Cornell is a writer of novels, comics, and television. He's written Doctor Who episodes, as well as episodes of Robin Hood and Primeval for the BBC, and Captain Britain for Marvel Comics. In addition to Doctor Who novelizations and many other comic works, his Doctor Who episodes have twice been nominated for the Hugo Award, and he shares a Writers Guild Award. Of late, he's taken to writing short science fiction, with sales to Fast Forward 2, Eclipse 2, and the Solaris Book of New Science Fiction, Volume 3. To get to Earth from the edge of the solar system, Depending on the time of year and the position of the planets, you need to pass through at least Poland, Prussia, and Turkey. And you'd probably get stamps in your passport from a few of the other great powers. Then as you get closer to the world, you arrive at a point in the continually shifting carriage space over the countries, where this complexity has to give way or fail. And so you arrive in the blissful lubrication of neutral orbital territory. From there, it's especially clear that no country is whole unto itself. There are yearning gaps between parts of each state as they stretch across the solar system. There is no congruent territory. The countries continue in balance with each other like a fine but eccentric mechanism, pent up, all that political energy dealt with through eternal circular motion. The maps that represent this can be displayed on a screen, but they're much more suited to mental contemplation. They're beautiful. They're made to be beautiful, doing their own small part to see that their beauty never ends. If you look down on that world of countries, onto the pink of glorious old Greater Britain, that land of green squares and dark forest and carriage contrails, and then you naturally avoided looking directly at the golden splendor of London, your gaze might fall on the Thames Valley on the country houses and mansions and hunting estates that letter the river banks with the names of the great. On one particular estate, an enormous winged square of a house with its own grouse-shooting horizons and mazes and herb gardens and markers that indicate it also sprawls into folded interior expanses. Today, that estate, seen from such a height, would be adorned with informational banners that could be seen from orbit, and tall pleasure cruisers could be observed, docked beside military boats on the river, and carriages of all kinds would be cluttering the gravel of its circular drives and swarming in the sky overhead. A detachment of horse guards could be spotted, stood it ready at the perimeter. Today, you'd need much more than a passport to get inside that maze of information and privilege, because today was a royal wedding. That vision from the point of view of someone looking down upon him was what was at the back of Hamilton's mind. But now he was watching the princess. Her chestnut hair had been knotted high on her head, bearing her neck, a fashion which Hamilton appreciated for its defiance of the French, and at an official function, too, though that gesture wouldn't have been Liz's alone, but would have been calculated in the Warrens of Whitehall. She wore white which had made a smile come to Hamilton's lips when he'd first seen it in the cathedral this morning. In this gigantic function room with its high arched ceiling, in which massed dignitaries and ambassadors and dress uniforms orbited from table to table, she was the sun about which everything turned. Even the king, in the far distance, at a table on a rise with old men from the rest of Europe, was no competition for his daughter this afternoon. This was the reception, where Elizabeth, escorted by members of the Corps of Heralds, would carelessly and entirely precisely move from group to group, giving exactly the right amount of charm to every one of the great powers. 
brief to keep the balance going as everyone like she and Hamilton did, every day. Everyone liked the two of them. That was a useless thought, and he cuffed it aside. Her gaze had settled on Hamilton's table precisely once. A little smile, and then away again. As not approved by Whitehall. He tried to stop watching her after that, but his carefully random table, with diplomatic corps functionaries to his left and right, had left him cold. Hamilton had grown tired of pretending to be charming. It's a marriage of convenience, said a voice beside him. It was Lord Carney. He was wearing open cuffs that bloomed from his silk sleeves, a big collar and no tie. His long hair was unfastened. He had retained his rings. Hamilton considered his reply for a moment, then opted for silence. He met Carney's gaze with a suggestion in his heart that surely his lordship might find some other table to perch at. Perhaps one where he had friends? What do you reckon? Hamilton stood, with the intention of walking away. But Carney stood too and stopped him just as they got out of earshot of the table. The man smelled like a Turkish sweet shop. He affected a mode of speech beneath his standing. This is what I do. I probe, I provoke, I poke. And when I'm in the room, it's all too obvious when people are looking at someone else. The broad grin stayed on his face. Hamilton found a deserted table and sat down again, furious at himself. Carney settled beside him and gestured away from Princess Elizabeth towards her new husband, with his neat beard and his row of medals on the breast of his Fenska Adelsfanen uniform. He was talking with the papal ambassador, doubtless discussing getting Liz to Rome as soon as possible, for a great show to be made of this match between the Protestant and the papist. If Prince Bertel was also pretending to be charming, Hamilton admitted that he was making a better job of it. Yeah, jammy fucker. My thoughts exactly. Still, I'm on a promise with a couple of members of his staff, so it swings and roundabouts. Carney clicked his tongue and wagged his finger as a Swedish serving maid ran past, and she curtsied a quick smile at him. I do understand, you know. All our relationships are informed by the balance. And the horror of it is that we all can conceive of a world where this isn't so. Hamilton pursed his lips and chose his next words carefully. Is that why you are how you are, your lordship? Of course it is. Maids, lady companions, youngest sisters. It's a catalogue of incompleteness. I'm allowed to love only in ways which don't disrupt the balance. For me to commit myself, or, heaven forbid, to marry, would require such deep thought at the highest levels that by the time the heralds had worked it through, well, I'd have tired of the lady. Story of us all, eh? Nowhere for the pressure to go. If only I could see an alternative. Hamilton had decided that, having shown the corner of his cards. The man had taken care to move back to the fringes of treason once more. It was part of his role as an agent provocateur, and Hamilton knew it. But that didn't mean he had to take this. Do you have any further point, your lordship? Oh, I'm just getting. The room gasped. Hamilton was up out of his seat and had taken a step towards Elizabeth. His gun hand had grabbed into the air to his right, where his 66-millimeter Webley Corsair sat in a knot of space, and had swung it ready to fire. At nothing. There stood the princess, looking about herself in shock. Dress uniforms, bearded men all around her. Left, right, up, down. Hamilton couldn't see anything for her to be shocked at. And nothing near her. Nothing around her. She was already stepping back, her hands in the air, gesturing at a gap. What had been there? Everyone was looking there. What? He looked to the others like him. Almost all of them were in the same sort of posture he was, balked at picking a target. 
the papal envoy stepped forward and cried out, A man was standing there, and he has vanished. Havoc. Everybody was shouting. A weapon. A weapon. But there was no weapon that Hamilton knew of that could have done that. Made a man, whoever it had been, blink out of existence. Groups of bodyguards in dress uniforms or diplomatic black tie leapt up, encircling their charges. Ladies started screaming, a nightmare of the balance collapsing all around them. That hysteria when everyone was in the same place and things didn't go exactly as all these vast powers expected. A Bavarian princeling bellowed he needed no such protection and made to rush to the princess side. Hamilton stepped into his way and accidentally shouldered him to the floor as he put himself right up beside Elizabeth and her husband. We're walking to that door, he said. Now. Bertel and Elizabeth nodded and marched with fixed smiles on their faces, Bertel turning and holding back with a gesture the Swedish forces that were moving in from all directions. Hamilton's fellows fell in all around them and swept the party across the hall, through that door, and down a servant's corridor as lifeguards came bundling into the room behind them, causing more noise and more reactions, and damn it, Hamilton hoped he wouldn't suddenly hear the discharge of some hidden... He did not. The door was closed and barred behind them. Another good chap doing the right thing. Hamilton sometimes distantly wished for an organization to guard those who needed it. But for that, the world would have to be different in ways beyond even Carney's artificial speculations. He and his brother officers would have their independence cropped if that was so. And he lived through his independence. It was the root of the duty that meant he would place himself in harm's way for Elizabeth's husband. He had no more thoughts on the subject. I know very little, said Elizabeth as she walked, her voice careful as always, except when it hadn't been. I think the man was with one of the groups of foreign dignitaries. He looked Prussian, said Bertel. We were talking to Prussians. He just vanished into thin air right in front of me. Into a fold, said Bertel. It can't have been, she said. The room will have been mapped and mapped. She looked to Hamilton for confirmation. He nodded. They got to the library. Hamilton marched in and secured it. They put the happy couple at the center of it, locked it up, and called everything into the embroidery. The embroidery chaps were busy, swiftly prioritizing. But no, nothing was happening in the great chamber they'd left. The panic had swelled and then subsided into shouts, exhibitionist faintings, because who these days wore a corset that didn't have hidden depths? Glasses crashing, yell demands. No one else had vanished. No Spanish infantrymen had materialized out of thin air. Bertel walked to the shelves, folded his hands behind his back, and began bravely and ostentatiously browsing. Elizabeth sat down and fanned herself and smiled for all Hamilton's fellows, and finally, quickly, for Hamilton himself. They waited. The embroidery told them they had a visitor coming. A wall of books slid aside, and in walked a figure that made all of them turn and salute. The Queen Mother, still in mourning black, her train racing to catch up with her. She came straight to Hamilton, and the others all turned to listen. And from now on, thanks to this obvious favor, they would regard Hamilton as the ranking officer. He was glad of it. We will continue, she said. We will not regard this as an embarrassment, and therefore it will not be. The ballroom was prepared for the dance. We are moving there early. Elizabeth, Bertel, off you go. You two gentlemen in front of them. The rest of you behind. You will be laughing as you enter the ballroom, as if this were the most enormous joke. A silly and typically English eccentric misunderstanding. Elizabeth nodded, took Bertel by the arm. The Queen Mother intercepted Hamilton as he moved to join them. No, Major Hamilton. You will go and talk to Technical. You will find another explanation for what happened. Another explanation, Your Royal Highness. Indeed, she said. 
It must not be what they are saying it is. Here we are, sir. Lieutenant Matthew Parks was with the technical corps of Hamilton's own regiment, the 4th Dragoons. He and his men were, incongruously, in the dark of the buttery that had been set aside for their equipment, also in their dress uniforms. From here, they were in charge of the sensor net that blanketed the house and grounds down to Newtonian units of space, reaching out for miles in every direction. Park's people had been the first to arrive here, days ago, and would be the last to leave. He was pointing at a screen, on which was frozen the intelligent image of a burly man in black tie. Princess Elizabeth almost entirely obscured behind him. Know who he is? Hamilton had placed the guest list in his mental index and had checked it as each group had entered the hall. He was relieved to recognize the man. He was as down to earth as it was possible to be. He was in the Prussian party, not announced, one of six diplomat placings on their list. Built like his muscles had been grown for security, and that's how he moved round the room. Didn't let anyone chat to him. He nods when his embroidery talks to him, which would mean he's new at this. Only, only the man had a look about him that Hamilton recognized. No, he's just very confident, ostentatious even. So you're sure he didn't walk into some sort of fold? Here's the contour map. Parks flipped up an overlay on the image that showed the tortured underpinnings of space-time in the room. There were little sinks and bundles all over the place, where various Britons had weapons stowed, and various foreigners would have had them stowed had they wished to create a diplomatic incident. The corner where Elizabeth had been standing showed only the force of gravity under her dear feet. We do take care, you know, sir. I'm sure you do, Matty. Let's see it, then. Parks flipped back to the clear screen. He touched it, and the image changed. Hamilton watched as the man vanished. One moment he was there, then he was not, and Elizabeth was reacting, a sudden jerk of her posture. Hamilton often struggled with technical matters. What's the frame rate in this thing? There is none, sir. It's a continual taking of real image, right down to single Newton intervals of time. That's as far as physics goes. Sir, we've been listening in to what everyone's saying, all afternoon. And what are they saying, Matty? That what's happened is gracefully impossible. Gracefully impossible. The first thing that had come into Hamilton's mind when the Queen Mother had mentioned the possibility was the memory of a political cartoon. It was the Prime Minister from a few years ago, standing at the dispatch box, staring in shock at his empty hand, which should presumably have contained some papers. The caption had read, Say what you like about Mr. Patel. He carries himself correct for his title. He's about to present just his graceful apologies for the impossible loss of all his policies. Every child knew that Newton had coined the phrase, gracefully impossible, after he'd spent the day in his garden observing the progress of a very small worm across the surface on an apple. It referred to what, according to the great man's thinking about the very small, could, and presumably did, sometimes happen. Things popping in and out of existence, when God, for some unfathomable reason, started or stopped looking at them. Some Frenchmen had insisted that it was actually about whether people were looking, but that was the French for you. Through the centuries, there had been a few documented cases which seemed to fit the bill. Hamilton had always been distantly entertained to read about such in the inside page of his newspaper plate. He'd always assumed it could happen. But here, now, during a state occasion? Hamilton went back into the Great Hall, now empty of all but a group of lifeguards and those like him, individuals taken from several different regiments, all of whom had responsibilities similar to his, 
and a few of whom he'd worked with in the field. He checked in with them. They had all noted the Prussian, indeed, with the ruthless air the man had had about him, and the bulk of his musculature. He had been at the forefront of many of their internal indices of threat. Hamilton found the place where the vanishing had happened, moved aside a couple of boffins, and against their protestations, went to stand in the exact spot, which felt like anywhere else did, and which set off none of his internal alarms, real or intuitive. He looked to where Liz had been standing, in the corner behind the Prussian. His expression darkened. The man who'd vanished had effectively been shielding the princess from the room, between her and every line of sight. He'd been where a bodyguard would have been if he'd become aware of someone taking a shot. But that was ridiculous. The Prussian hadn't rushed in to save her. He'd been standing there, looking around, and anyone in that hall with some strange new weapon concealed on their person wouldn't have taken the shot then. They'd have waited for him to move. Hamilton shook his head, angry with himself. There was a gap here, something that went beyond the obvious. He let the boffins get back to their work and headed for the ballroom. The band had started the music, and the vast chamber was packed with people, the dance floor a whirl of waltzing figures. They were deliberate in their courses. The only laughter was forced laughter, no matter that some half-miracle might have occurred, dance cards had been circulated amongst the minds of the great powers, so those dances would be danced, and minor royalty matched, and whispers exchanged in precise confidentiality. Because everyone was brave, and everyone was determined, and would be seen to be so. And so the balance went on. But the tension had increased a notch, the weight of the balance could be felt in this room, on the surface now, on every brow. The Queen Mother sat at a high table with courtiers to her left and right, receiving visitors with a grand blessing smile on her face, daring everyone to regard the last hour as anything but a dream. Hamilton walked the room, looking around like he was looking at a battle, like it was happening rather than perhaps waiting to happen, whatever it was. He watched his opposite numbers from all the great powers, waltzing slowly around their own people, and spiraling off from time to time to orbit his own. The ratio of uniform to the sort of embassy thug it was difficult to imagine fitting in the diplomatic bag was about three to one for all the nations, bar two. The French had, of course, sent commissars, who all dressed the same when outsiders were present, but followed a Byzantine internal rank system. And the Vatican's people were all men and women of the cloth and their assistants. As he made his way through that particular party, which was scattering, intercepting and colliding with all the other nationalities, as if in the explosion of a shaped charge, he started to hear it. The conversations were all about what had happened. The Vatican representatives were talking about a sacred presence. The details were already spiraling. There had been a light and a great voice. Had nobody else heard? And people were agreeing. Hamilton wasn't a diplomat, and he knew better than to take on trouble not in his own line. But he didn't like what he was hearing. The Catholics had only come to terms with impossible grace a couple of decades ago, when a papal bull went out announcing that John the Twenty-Sixth thought that the concept had merit, but that further scientific study was required. But now they got behind it, as in all things. They were behind it. So what would this say to them? That the divine had looked down on this wedding, approved of it, and plucked someone away from it? No, not just someone. Prussian military, a Protestant from a nation that had sometimes protested that various Swedish territories would be far better off within their own jurisdiction. Hamilton stopped himself speculating. Guessing at such things would only make him hesitate if his guesses turned out to be untrue. Hamilton had a vague but certain grasp of what his god was like, 
He thought it was possible that he might decide to give the nod to a marriage at court, but in a way which might upset the balance between nations that was divinely ordained. That was the center of all good works? No. Hamilton was certain now. The divine be damned. This wasn't the numinous at play. This was enemy action. He circled the room until he found the Prussians. They were raging. An ambassador poking at a British courtier, demanding something, probably that an investigation be launched immediately. And beside that Prussian stood several more, diplomatic and military, all convincingly frightened and furious, certain this was a British plot. But behind them there, in the social place where Hamilton habitually looked, there were some of the vanished man's fellow big lads, the other five from that diplomatic pouch. The Prussians, uniquely in Europe, kept up an actual organization for the sort of thing Hamilton and his ilk did on the Never Never. The Guard du Corps had begun as a regiment similar to the lifeguards, but these days, it was said, they weren't even issued with uniforms. They wouldn't be on anyone's dance cards. They weren't stalking the room now. And all right, that was understandable. They were hanging back to protect their chaps, but they weren't doing much of that either. They didn't look angry or worried for their comrade or for their own skins. Hamilton took a step back to let pretty noble couples desperately waltz between him and the Prussians, wanting to keep his position as a privileged observer. They looked like they were waiting, on edge. They just wanted to get out of here. Was the guard really that callous? They'd lost a man in mysterious circumstances, and they weren't themselves agitating to get back into that room and yell his name, but were just waiting to move on? He looked for another moment, remembering the faces, then moved on himself. He found another table of Prussians, the good sort, not Order of the Black Eagle, but Hussars. They were in uniform and had been drinking, and were furiously declaring in Hohenzollern German that if they weren't allowed access to the records of what had happened, well, then it must be. They didn't like to say what it must be. Hamilton plucked a glass from a table and wandered over to join them, careful to take a wide and unsteady course around a lady whose train had developed some sort of fault and wasn't moving fast enough to keep pace with her feet. He flopped down in a chair next to one of the Prussians, a captain by his lapels, which were virtual in the way the Prussians liked, to implicitly suggest that they had been in combat more recently than the other great powers, and so had a swift turnover of brevet ranks, decided by merit. Hello, he said. The group fell silent and bristled at him. Hamilton blinked at them. Where's Humph? Humph? Was well, say to good major. The Hazar captain spoke North Sea Pigeon, but with a clear accent. Hamilton would be able to understand him. He didn't want to reveal that he spoke perfect German, albeit with a Bavarian accent. Big chap. Big, big chap. Say go. He carefully swore in Dutch, shaking his head, not understanding. Would you settle him? Settle? They looked amongst each other, and Hamilton could feel the affront. A couple of them even put their good hands to their waists, where the space was folded that no longer contained their pistols and thin swords. But the captain glared at them, and they relented. A burst of Hohenzollern German about this so-called mystery of their mate vanishing, and how being in the guard, he had obviously been abducted for his secrets. Hamilton waved his hands. No swords. Good chap. No name. He won. Three times to me at behind the backshee. He raised his voice a notch. Behind the backshee. Excellent chap. He won. He stuck out his ring finger, offering the winnings in credit to be passed from skin to skin. He mentally retracted the other options of what could be detailed there, and blanked it. He could always make a drunken show of trying to find it. 
seek to settle for such a good chap. They didn't believe him or trust him. Nobody reached out to touch his finger. But he learned a great deal in their German conversation in the ten minutes that followed, while he loudly struggled to communicate with the increasingly annoyed captain, who couldn't bring himself to directly insult a member of the British military by asking him to go away. The vanished man's name was Helmut Sandos. The name suggested Swedish origins to his family. But that was typical continental back and forth. He might have been a good chap now he'd gone, but he hadn't been liked. Sandals had had a look in his eye when he'd walked past stout fellows who'd actually fought battles. He'd spoken up in anger when valiant hussars had expressed the military's traditional views concerning those running the government, the country, and the world. Hamilton found himself sharing the soldiers' expressions of distaste. This had been someone who assumed that loyalty was an opinion. He raised a hand in pox, gave up trying with the captain, and left the table. Walking away, he heard the hussars moving on with their conversation, starting to express some crude opinions about the princess. He didn't break stride. Into his mind, unbidden, came the memories of what had been a small miracle of a kind, but one that only he and she had been witness to. Hamilton had been at home on leave, having been abroad for a few weeks, serving out of uniform. As always, at times like that, when he should have been at rest, he'd been fired up for no good reason, unable to sleep, miserable, prone to tears in secret when a favorite song had come on the theatricals in his muse flat. It always took three days for him, once he was home, to find out what direction he was meant to be pointing. Then he would set off that way and pop back to barracks one night for half a pint, and then he'd be fine. He could enjoy day four and onwards, and was known to be something approximating human from there on in. Three-day leaves were hell. He tried not to use them as leaves, but would find himself some task, hopefully an official one, if one of the handful of officers who brokered his services could be so entreated. Those officers were sensitive to such requests now. But that leave, three years ago, had been two weeks off. He'd come home a day before, so he was no use to anyone. He'd taken a broom and was pushing accumulated gray goo out of the carriage park alongside his apartment and into the drains. She'd appeared in a sound of crashing and collapse as her horse staggered sideways and hit the wall of the mews, then fell. Her two friends were galloping after her, their horses healthy and someone built like Hamilton was running to help. But none of them were going to be in time to catch her. And he was. It had turned out that the horse had missed an inoculation against minuscule poisoning. Its body was a terrible mess, random mechanisms developing out of its flanks and dying. With that terrifying smell, in the moments when Hamilton had held her in his arms, and had had to round on the man running in, and had imposed his authority with a look, and had not been thrown down and away. Instead, she'd raised her hands and called that she was all right, and had insisted on looking to and at the horse, pulling off her glove and putting her hand to its neck and trying to fight the bloody things directly. But even with her command of information, it had been too late, and the horse had died in a mess. She'd been bloody angry, and then at the emergency scene that had started to develop around Hamilton's front door, with police carriages swooping in and the sound of running boots, until she'd waved it all away and declared that it had been her favorite horse, a wonderful horse, her great friend since childhood. But it was just a bloody horse, and all she needed was a sit-down, and if this kind military gentleman would oblige. And he had. He'd obliged her again when they'd met in Denmark, and they'd danced at a ball held on an ice floe, a carpet of mechanism wood reacting every moment to the weight of their feet and the forces underlying them, and the aurora had shone in the sky. It was all right in Denmark for Elizabeth to have one dance with a commoner. Hamilton had got back to the table where his regiment were dining, and had silenced the laughter and the calls 
and thus save them for barracks. He had drunk too much. His batman at the time had prevented him from going to see Elizabeth as she was escorted from the floor at the end of her dance card by a boy who was somewhere in line for the Danish throne. But she had seen Hamilton the next night, in private, a privacy that would have taken great effort on her part. And after they had talked for several hours and shared some more wine, she had shown him great favor. So, is God in the details? Someone was walking beside Hamilton. It was a Jesuit, mid-thirties, dark hair kept over her collar. She had a scar down one side of her face, and a nod eye as a result. Minuscule blade, by the look. A member of the Society of Jesus would never allow her face to be restructured. That would be vanity. But she was beautiful. Hamilton straightened up giving this woman's musculature and bearing and all the history those things suggested, the respect they deserved. Or the devil. Yes, interesting the saying goes both ways, isn't it? My name is Mother Valentine. I'm part of the Society's campaign for effective love. Well, Hamilton raised an eyebrow. I'm in favor of love being. Don't waste our time. You know what I am. Yes, I do. And you know I'm the same. And I was waiting until we were out of earshot. Which we now are. To have this conversation. They stopped together. Valentine moved her mouth close to Hamilton's ear. I've just been told that the Holy Father is eager to declare what happened here to be a potential miracle. Certain parties are sure that our Black Eagle man will be found magically transplanted to distant parts, perhaps Berlin, as a sign against Prussian meddling. If he is, the Kaiser will have him gently shot, and will never hear. You're probably right. What do you think happened? I don't think miracles happen near our kind. Hamilton realized he was looking absurdly hurt at her, and that she could see it and was quietly absorbing that information for use in a couple of decades, if ever. He was glad when a message came over the embroidery, asking him to attend the Queen Mother in the buttery, and to bring his new friend. The Queen Mother stood in the buttery, her not taking a chair, having obviously made Parks and his people even more nervous than they would have been. She nodded to Valentine. Monsignor, I must inform you we've had an official approach from the Holy See. They regard the whole here as a possible site of miraculous apparition. Then my opinion on the subject is irrelevant. You should be addressing the ambassador. Indeed. But here you are. You are aware of what was asked of us. I suspect the cardinals will have sought a complete record of the moment of the apparition. Or in this case, the vanishing. That would only be the work of a moment in the case of such an... observed... chamber. It would. But it's what happens next that concerns me. The procedure is that the chamber must then be sealed and left unobserved until the cardinals can see for themselves to minimize any effect human observers may have on the process of divine revelation. Hamilton frowned. Are we likely to? God is communicating using a physical method, so we may, said Valentine, depending on one's credulity concerning minuscule physics. Or one's credulity concerning international politics, said the Queen Mother. Monsignor... It is always our first and most powerful inclination, when another nation asks us for something, to say no. All nations feel that way. All nations know the others do. But now here is a request, one that concerns matters right at the heart of the balance, that is, in the end, about deactivating security. It could be said to come not from another nation. But from God, it is therefore difficult to deny this request. 
we find ourselves distrusting that difficulty. It makes us want to deny it all the more. You speak for his royal highness. The queen mother gave a cough that might have been a laugh. Just as you speak for our lord. Valentine smiled and inclined her head. I would have thought, your royal highness, that it would be obvious to any of the great powers that, given the celebrations, it would take you a long time to gather the prime minister and those many other courtiers with whom you would want to consult on such a difficult matter. Correct. Good. It will take three hours. You may go. Valentine walked out with Hamilton. I'm going to go and mix with my own for a while, she said. Listen to who's saying what. I'm surprised you wear your hair long. She looked sharply at him. Why? You enjoy putting your head on the block. She giggled, which surprised Hamilton, and for just a moment made him wish he was Lord Carney. But then there was a certain small darkness about another priest he knew. I'm just betting, she said in a whisper, that by the end of the day this will all be over, and someone will be dead. Hamilton went back into the ballroom. He found he had a picture in his head now. Something had swum up from somewhere inside him, from a place he had learned to trust and never interrogate as to its reasons. That jerking motion Elizabeth had made at the moment Sandals had vanished. He had an emotional feeling about that image. What was it? It had been like seeing her shot. A motion that looked like it had come from beyond her muscles, Something Elizabeth had not been in control of. It wasn't like her to not be in control. It felt dangerous. Would anyone else see it that way? He doubted it. So was he about to do the sudden terrible thing that his body was taking him in the direction of doing? He killed the thought and just did it. He went to the herald who carried the tablet with dance cards on it, and leaned on him with the Queen Mother's favor, which had popped up on his ring finger the moment he'd thought of it. The herald considered the sensation of the fingertip on the back of his hand for a moment, then handed Hamilton the tablet. Hamilton realized that he had no clue of the havoc he was about to cause, so he glanced at the list of Elizabeth's forthcoming dances and struck off a random Frenchman. He scrawled his own signature with a touch and handed the plate back. The herald looked at him like the breath of death had passed under his nose. Hamilton had to wait three dances before his name came up, a balaclava, an entree grave. That choice must have taken a while, unless some herald had been waiting all his life for a chance at the French. A hornpipe for the sailors, including Bertel, too much applause, and then, thank the deus, a straightforward waltz. Elizabeth had been waiting out those last three, so he met her at her table. Maidservants kept their expressions stoic. A couple of Liz's companions looked positively scared. Hamilton knew how they felt. He could feel every important eye looking in his direction. Elizabeth took his arm and gave it a little squeeze. What's Grandma up to, Johnny? It's what I'm up to. She looked alarmed. They formed up with the other dancers. Hamilton was very aware of her gloves. The mechanism fabric that covered her left hand held off the urgent demand of his hand, his own need to touch her. But no, that wouldn't tell him anything. That was just his certainty that to know her had been to know her. That was not where he would find the truth here. The band started up. The dance began. Hamilton didn't access any guidelines in his mind. He let his feet move where they would. He was outside orders, acting on a hunch. He was like a man dancing around the edge of a volcano. Do you remember the day we met? He asked when he was certain they couldn't be heard, at least not be the other dancers. Of course I do. My poor San Andreas, your flat in Hood Mews. Do you remember what I said to you that day, when nobody else was with us? 
what you agreed to. Those passionate words that could bring this whole charade crashing down. He kept his expression light, his tone so gentle and wry that Liz would always play along and fling a little stone back at him, knowing he meant nothing more than he could mean. That he was letting off steam through a joke. All they had been was based on the certainty expressed in that. It was an entirely British way to do things. It was, as Carney had said, about lives shaped entirely by the balance. But this woman, with the room revolving around the two of them, was suddenly appalled, insulted, her face a picture of what she was absolutely certain she should feel. I don't know what you mean, or even if I did, I don't think— Hamilton's nostrils flared. He was lost now, if he was wrong. He had one tiny ledge for Liz to grasp if he was. But he would fall. For duty, then. He took his hand from Princess Elizabeth's waist and grabbed her chin, his fingers digging up into flesh. The whole room cried out in horror. He had a moment before they would shoot him. Yes, he felt it. Or he thought he did. He thought he did enough. He grabbed the floor and ripped with all his might. Princess Elizabeth's face burst off and landed on the floor. Blood flew. He drew his gun and pumped two shots into the mass of flesh and mechanism as it twitched and blew a stream of defensive acid that discolored the marble. He spun back to find the woman without a face lunging at him, her eyes white in the mass of red muscle, mechanism pus billowing into the gaps. She was aiming a hair knife at his throat doubtless with enough mechanism to bring instant death or something worse. Hamilton thought of Liz as he broke her arm. He enjoyed the scream. He wanted to bellow for where the real Liz was as he slammed the imposter down onto the floor, and he was dragged from her in one motion as a dozen men grabbed them. He caught a glimpse of Bertel, horrified, but not at Hamilton. It was a terror they shared for her safety. Hamilton suddenly felt like a traitor again. He yelled out the words he'd had in mind since he put his name down for the dance. They replaced her years ago. Years ago. At the Muse. There were screams. Cries that we were all undone. There came the sound of two shots from the direction of the Vatican group. And Hamilton looked over to see Valentine standing over the corpse of a junior official. Their gaze met. She understood why he'd shouted that. Another man leapt up at a Vatican table behind her and turned to run, and she turned and shot him twice in the chest, his body spinning backwards over a table. Hamilton ran with the rout. He used the crowds of dignitaries and their retinues, all roaring and competing and stampeding for safety, to hide himself. He made himself look like a man lost, agony on his face, his eyes closed. He was ignoring all the urgent cries from the embroidery. He covertly acknowledged something directly from the Queen Mother. He stumbled through the door of the buttery. Parks looked round. Thank God you're here. We've been trying to call. The Queen Mother's office are urgently asking you to come in. Never mind that now. Come with me, on Her Royal Highness orders. Parks grabbed the pods from his ears and got up. What on earth? Hamilton shot him through the right knee. Parks screamed and fell. Every technician in the room leapt up. Hamilton bellowed at them to sit down or they'd get the same. He shoved his foot into the back of Parks' injured leg. Listen here, Matty. You know how hard it's going to get. You're not the sort to think your duty's worth it. How much did they pay you? For how long? He was still yelling at the man on the ground as the lifeguards burst in and put a gun to everyone's head, his own included. The Queen Mother entered a minute later, and changed that situation to the extent of letting Hamilton go free. She looked carefully at Parks, who was still screaming for pity, and aimed a precise little kick into his disintegrated kneecap. Then she turned to the technicians. Your minds will be stripped down and rebuilt, if you're lucky, to see who was in on it. She looked back to Hamilton as they started to be led from the room. What you said in the ballroom obviously isn't the case. No. When you take him apart, Hamilton nodded at Parks. You'll find he tampered with the contour map. 
They used sandals as the cover for substituting Her Royal Highness. They knew she was going to move around the room in a predetermined way. With Park's help, they set up an open-ended fold in that corner. The expense is staggering. The energy required. There'll be no Christmas tree for the Kaiser this year. Sandals deliberately stepped into the fold and vanished, in a very public way. And at that moment, they made the switch. Took Her Royal Highness into the fold, too. Covered by the visual disturbance of Sandal's progress, and by old-fashioned sleight of hand, propped up by the Prussians' people in the Vatican, instead of a British bride influencing the Swedish court, there'd be a cuckoo from Berlin. Well played, Wilhelm. Worth that Christmas tree. I'll wager the unit are still in the fold, not knowing anything about the outside world waiting for the room to be sealed off with pious care, so they can climb out and extract themselves. They probably have supplies for several days. Do you think my granddaughter is still alive? Hamilton pursed his lips. There are Prussian yachts on the river. They're staying on for the season. I think they'd want the bonus of taking the princess back for interrogation. That's the plan! Parks yelled. Please! Get him some anesthetic, said the Queen Mother. Then she turned back to Hamilton. The balance will be kept. To give him his due, Cousin Wilhelm was acting within it. There will be no diplomatic incident. The Prussians will be able to write off Sandals and any others as rogues. We will, of course, cooperate. The Black Eagle traditionally carry only that knowledge they need for their mission and will order themselves to die before giving us orders of battle or any other strategic information. But the intelligence from Parks and any others will give us some small power of potential shame over the Prussians in future months. The Vatican will be bending over backwards for us for some time to come. She took his hand, and he felt the favor on his ring finger impressed with some notes that probably flattered him. He'd read them later. Major, we will have the fold opened. You will enter it. Save Elizabeth. Kill them all. They got him a squad of fellow officers, four of them. They met in a trophy room and sorted out how they'd go and what the rules of engagement would be once they got there. Substitutes for Parks and his crew had been found from the few sappers present. Parks had told them that those inside the fold had left a minuscule aerial trailing, but that messages were only to be passed down it in emergencies. No such communications had been sent. They were not aware of the world outside their bolt hole. Hamilton felt nothing but disgust for a bought man, but he knew that such men told the truth under pressure, especially when they knew the fine detail of what could be done to them. The false Liz had begun to be picked apart. Her real name would take a long time to discover. She had a maze of intersecting selves inside her head. She must have been as big an investment as the fold. The court physicians who had examined her had been as horrified by what had been done to her as by what she was. That baffled Hamilton. People like the duplicate had power, to be who they liked but that power was bought at the cost of damage to the balance of their own souls. What were nations, after all, but a lot of souls who knew who they were and how they liked to live? To be as uncertain as the substitute Liz was to be lost and to endanger others. It went beyond treachery. It was living mixed metaphor. It was as if she had insinuated herself into the cogs of the balance, her puppet strings wrapping around the arteries which supplied hearts and minds. They gathered in the empty dining room in their dress uniforms. The dinner things had not been cleared away. Nothing had been done. The party had been well and truly crashed. The representatives of the great powers would have vanished back to their embassies and yachts. Mother Valentine would be rooting out the details of who had been paid what inside her party. Excommunications post-mortem would be issued, and those traitors would burn in hell. He thought of Liz, and took his gun from the air beside him. 
One of the sappers put a device in the floor and set a timer, saluted, and withdrew. Up the green jackets, said one of the men behind him, and a couple of the others mentioned their own regiments. Hamilton felt a swell of fear and emotion. The counter clicked to zero, and the hole in the world opened in front of them, and they ran into it. There was nobody immediately inside. A floor and curved ceiling of universal boundary material. It wrapped light around it in rainbows that always gave tunnels like this, a slightly pantomime feel. It was like the entrance to St. Nicholas Cave. Or, of course, the vortex sighted upon death, the ladder to the hereafter. Hamilton got that familiar taste in his mouth, a pure adrenal jolt of fear, not the restlessness of combat deferred, but that sensation one got in other universes, of being too far from home, cut off from the godhead. There was gravity. The Prussians certainly had spent some money. The party made their way forward. They stepped gently on the edge of the universe. From around the corner of the short tunnel, there were sounds. The other four looked to Hamilton. He took a couple of gentle steps forward, grateful for the softness of his dress uniform shoes. He could hear Elizabeth's voice, not her words, not from here. She was angry, but engaged, not defiant in the face of torture, reasoning with them. A smile passed his lips for a moment. They'd have had a lot of that. It told him there was no alert, not yet. It was almost impossible to set sensors close to the edge of a fold. This lot must have stood on guard for a couple of hours, heard no alarm from their friends outside, and then had relaxed. They'd have been on the clock, waiting for the time when they would poke their heads out. Hamilton bet there was a man meant to be on guard, but that Liz had pulled him into the conversation, too. He could imagine her face, just round that corner, one eye always toward the exit, maybe a couple of buttons undone, claiming it was the heat and excitement. She had a hair knife, too, but it would do her no good to use it on just one of them. He estimated the distance. He counted the other voices. Three, four. There was a deeper tone. In German, not the pigeon the other three had been speaking. That would be him. Sandals. He didn't sound like he was part of that conversation. He was angry, ordering, perhaps just back from sleep, wondering what the hell. Hamilton stopped all thoughts of Liz. He looked to the others, and they understood they were going to go, and go now, trip the alarms and use the emergency against the enemy. He nodded. They leapt around the corner, ready for targets. They expected the blaring horn. They rode it, finding their targets surprised, bodies reacting, reaching for weapons that were in a couple of cases a reach away amongst a kitchen, crates, tinned foods. Hamilton had made himself know he was going to see Liz, so he didn't react to her. He looked past her. He ducked, cried out, as an automatic set off by the alarm chopped up the man who had been running beside him. The green jacket, gone in a burst of red. Meat all over the cave. Hamilton reeled, stayed up, tried to pin a target. To left and right ahead, men were falling, flying, two shots in each body, and he was moving too slowly, stumbling, vulnerable. One man got off a shot, into the ceiling, and then fell, pinned twice, exploding. Every one of the Prussians gone, but... He found his target. Sandals, with Elizabeth right in front of him, covering every bit of his body. He had a gun pushed into her neck. He wasn't looking at his three dead comrades. The three men who were with Hamilton moved forward, slowly their gun hands visible, their weapons pointing down. They were looking to Hamilton again. He hadn't lowered his gun. He had his target. He was aiming right at Sandals and the princess. There was silence. Liz made eye contact. She had indeed undone those two buttons. She was calm. Well, she began, this is very... Sandals muttered something, and she was quiet again. Silence. Sandals laughed, not unpleasantly. 
Soulful eyes were looking at them from that square face of his, a smile turning the corner of his mouth. He shared the irony that Hamilton had often found in people of their profession. This was not the awkward absurdity that the soldiers had described. Hamilton realized that he was looking at an alternative. This man was a professional at the same things Hamilton did in the margins of his life. It was the strangeness of the alternative that had alienated the military men. Hamilton was fascinated by him. I don't know why I did this, said Sandals, indicating Elizabeth with a sway of the head. Reflex. Hamilton nodded to him. They each knew all the other did. Perhaps you needed a moment. She's a very pretty girl to be wasted on a Swede. Hamilton could feel Liz not looking at him. It's not a waste, he said gently. And you'll refer to her royal highness by her title. No offense, men. And none taken. But we're in the presence, not in barracks. I wish we were. I think we all agree there. I won't lay down my weapon. Hamilton didn't do his fellows the disservice of looking to them for confirmation. This isn't an execution. Sandals looked satisfied. Seal this tunnel afterwards. That should be all we require for passage. Not to Berlin, I presume. No, said Sandals. To entirely the opposite. Hamilton nodded. Well, then. Sandals stepped aside from Elizabeth. Hamilton lowered his weapon, and the others readied theirs. It wouldn't be done to aim straight at Sandals. He had his own weapon at hip height. He would bring it up, and they would cut him down as he moved. But Elizabeth hadn't moved. She was pushing back her hair as if wanting to say something to him before leaving. But lost for the right words. Hamilton, suddenly aware of how unlikely that was, started to say something. But Liz had put a hand to Sandal's cheek. Hamilton saw the fine silver between her fingers. Sandals fell to the ground, thrashing, hoarsely yelling as he deliberately and precisely, as his nervous system was ordering him to, bit off his own tongue. Then the mechanism from the hair knife let him die. The princess looked at Hamilton. It's not a waste, she said. They sealed the fold as Sandals had asked them to, after the sappers had made an inspection. Hamilton left them to it. He regarded his duty as done, and no message came to him to say otherwise. Recklessly, he tried to find Mother Valentine, but she was gone with the rest of the Vatican party, and there weren't even bloodstains left to mark where her feet had trod this evening. He sat at a table and tried to pour himself some champagne. He found that the bottle was empty. His glass was filled by Lord Carney, who sat down next to him. Together they watched as Elizabeth was joyfully reunited with Bertel. They swung each other round and round, oblivious to all around them. Elizabeth's grandmother smiled at them and looked nowhere else. We are watching, said Carney. The balance incarnate. Or perhaps they'll incarnate it tonight, as I said. If only there were an alternative. Hamilton drained his glass. If only, he said. There weren't. And he left before Carney could say anything more. 